Monday, 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 Saturday.
एक वहां पर This meeting is being recorded. चलने में थोड़ा ध्यान रखेंगे Okay. 
इस समय ये फॉरवर्ड है ये बैकवर्ड है ये पॉइंट पॉइंट होल्ड को आप प्रेस कीजिए और होल्ड कीजिए जस्ट ओके सर ये कर्सर से ही हो सकता है ये थोड़ा टाइम डिले है इसमें बस आपको फॉरवर्ड बैकवर्ड और सिर्फ ये होल्ड बस होल्ड कर लीजिएगा उसके बाद फिर ठीक टाइम Good morning, everyone. I welcome you all for the third day of the camp. We are starting. We are going to start this session with a very special invited lecture by Professor Patrick Das Gupta. Many of you might already know him. So, Professor Patrick Das Gupta is a professor at Department of Physics and Astrophysics at University of Delhi. So, he started uh, uh, his career in this field uh, from when he got the National Science Talent Award scholarship. Then he did his uh, integrated MSc from Vetskilani. Then he joined theoretical astrophysics group at PIFR to obtain his PhD. Then he he was a postdoc at IUCA and he also visited University of Wales and observatories at Paris to learn about the gravitational wave data analysis. He has a very va vast range of research interests. So his current research interests include studies of Hawking area theorem and studying the gravitational wave data analysis to propose a unified model for gamma ray burst and fast radio burst, generation of supermassive black hole, and like many more things. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Raj Kishore. First of all, I thank Raj Kishore, Vivek, and Dimple for inviting me for YAM 2022. And it's always quite exciting and thrilling to meet youngsters who are bubbling with enthusiasm and intelligence and inquisitiveness. So uh, this talk, which is essentially the zoo of black holes, uh, don't hesitate to stop me at any point of time and ask me questions because after all, science progresses only by not believing and asking questions. Of course, the whole field of black holes wouldn't be there if Einstein had not created a relativistic theory of gravitation, namely general theory of relativity in which he showed that gravity is just manifestation of the curvature of the space-time uh, geometry and uh, really speaking, a satellite is not falling freely due to Earth's gravitational field. Rather, Earth has, itself has distorted the geometry of the space-time and a satellite is merely following the geodesic in it. And what causes the curvature in the space-time geometry? It is the energy and momentum uh, associated with matter and radiation that curves the geometry of the space-time. And uh, normally, in our day-to-day -day physics, we use either Cartesian coordinate system or spherical polar coordinate system, etc. But general relativity show that coordinates are just labels. You can label them in any way. Rather, it is the coordinate invariant quantities like proper distance square, the Riemann curvature tensor. Those are, they have real physical significance. Ah, I can also change from here. To here. Uh, the early uh, people who actually talked about black holes date to 18th century. Uh, it is uh, Michel and independently Laplace who using Newtonian gravitation, they argued that if an object shrinks to a radius less than 2 gm by c squared, even light cannot escape. But then of course, with general relativity, Carl Schwarzschild, just before he passed away, having severely injured in the First World War, he got the first exact solution of Einstein's equation that really predicted the Schwarzschild black holes. And next exact black hole solution uh, came uh, from uh, Roy Kerr um, for a rotating black hole. Uh, most people might not know that there is an Indian Majumdar Papa Petro solution of static 
black holes carrying electromagnetic charges. It's an exact solution, except they are static black holes. The gravitational pull is counteracted by the electrostatic uh, repulsion. Uh, right, but note that although black hole solution is a mathematical solution that followed from Carl Schrodschild exact uh, metric around a spherical symmetric body, uh, most people during that time thought that they were just purely mathematical solution. Physically, you might not have black holes in nature, but it was due to uh, Subramaniam Chandrasekhar who showed that there is a critical mass to white dwarf. After that critical mass is exceeded, the white dwarf has to collapse, first to neutron star, later on as foreseen by Landau, and then if it exceeds 2.5 to 3 times sun's mass, even neutron star will not be stable under neutron degeneracy pressure and it has to collapse uh, and form black holes. And in particular, uh, uh, Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking, they use powerful mathematical arguments based on Raichaudhuri equation and showed that normal matter, namely in which the energy and momentum satisfy certain strong energy condition, they have to form singularities. And uh, uh, we know that a spherically symmetric body, if it shrinks below a radius 2 gm by c square, uh, it forms the shrinkage cannot be halted. Entire matter collapses to a single point, that means mass density becomes infinity, the geometrical curvature tensor becomes infinity. And infinity is the hallmark of singularities. That means physics break down because all physical laws are based on differential equation. And to solve differential equation, you need initial condition. If the initial conditions or final conditions become infinity, you don't have solutions. And that's the reason infinities in physical theory is hallmark, is the hallmark of breakdown of the theory. And of course, it is believed that quantum gravity can cure uh, such singularities. That's why probably the artists, they did not put the singularity as a point, but a fuzz, maybe Planck scale fuzz would be there, but we still don't know which is the correct quantum theory of gravity, whether it's string theory or loop space quantum gravity, which is inspired from Abhaya Stikers model, etc. Right, and uh, Penrose, of course, uh, was awarded the half of Nobel Prize in 2020 because the, of the powerful singularity theorems that he started, of course, but Hawking also uh, did many of the work. But unfortunately, Hawking was no more alive in 2020. And of course, um, Genzel and uh, Andrea Gaze, they um, did pioneering work uh, before I come to Andrea Gaze and um, Genzel's work, let me, this is actually a picture drawn or uh, taken from Penrose's first 1965 paper on uh, the singularity theorem, where he argued that any kind of matter which satisfies strong energy condition, uh, it will collapse and give rise to singularity. And he, uh, for the first time, gave a fully definable uh, definition of a singularity. See, infinities, normally you would say that if the curvature tensor becomes infinity at a point, it's singular. But infinity is something which most people uh, would, uh, with, you know, uh, wryness would talk about infinity. What Penrose instead uh, defined as singularity is that if you have a geodesic, which is either null-like or time-like. Null-like geodesics are for which ds square, that is square of the proper interval is zero, while time-like is for which ds square is greater than zero. I'm using the signature plus, minus, minus, minus. So ds square greater than zero is time-like and ds square equal to zero is null-like. So Penrose defined that if you have a space-time where a geodesic, a geodesic abruptly terminates, that means geodesic doesn't run from minus infinity to infinity, 
but there is a termination, then there is a singularity in the space time. That is a more uh, practical definition of a singularity. And Penrose, uh, I am told also Carter contributed to it. So, strictly speaking, according to Hawking, this diagram, which is called normally Penrose diagram, is according to Hawking in one of his lectures, he pointed to Penrose that truly speaking, this diagram should be called Carter Penrose diagram. So, I don't know. Hawking must have been right, of course. Um, so, this Carter Penrose diagram, where Penrose introduced conformal transformation to shrink infinity to finite distances. It's a very uh, neat way of, in a uh, bounded space, characterize the space-time geometry. So a black hole, this is, of course, a, a two-dimensional plus three-dimensional way of looking at three plus one-dimensional space-time, uh, where matter collapses. And when a uh, horizon is formed, here, the light cone gets tilted and therefore future directed light cone. You can see the future directed light cone. The light rays can only hit the singularity. They can't come out. This is one way of representing. While in the Penrose diagram, those who are mathematically minded, this is also very nicely portrayed that in the Penrose diagram, uh, the speed of light C is taken to be unity so that light cone trajectories move in 45 degrees lines. And using the conformal uh, transformation, the singular point is this saw-like uh, fashion. It, this is the singularity, while the horizon, event horizon is this. And every from this point, if light is emitted, they will make 45 degree angle. So this light ray, if it enters the horizon, it goes in. Because even in inside the light cone, if you take a future light cone, all light will end up at the singularity. Okay, So this also summarizes what is happening. Why is the horizon so special that within the horizon, future directed light ray, they can't come out of the horizon and go to spatial infinity because future directed light rays, they will be going this, this, they will eventually hit the singularity. Anyway, those this is for those who are mathematically minded. Uh, but then uh, in real world, mathematics is all fine. It's beautiful, aesthetic, logical, precise, but it has to make connection with the real world. So do that uh, black holes exist? And that's what Andre Gaze and Genzel, they uh, did by studying the center of our Milky Way galaxy. This is an artist's conception of our Milky Way galaxy from the side view. We are over here, about 8 kiloparsec from the Sagittarius A star, which is the center of the galaxy. And what, uh, from 1994-95 onwards, uh, painstaking observations were done independently by Andrea Gaze in US and uh, Genzel uh, in Germany. And uh, the trajectories of the stars around the Sagittarius A star, this asterisk, is the Sagittarius A star, which is the central region of the Milky Way galaxy. Is my pointer? Yeah, here it is visible. Yeah. So, therefore, uh, when in real time they followed the stars moving around, they could find that uh, from the ex such eccentric elliptical orbits, they could find that the closest distance of approach can go very close to the Sagittarius A star. and you can also estimate what is the mass within this because for a circular orbit, V square by R equal to even Newtonian physics, V square by R is equal to GM by R square will give you V square by V square equal to GM by R. So V can be measured by real time monitoring. R can be measured because angular separation and the distance to Sagittarius A star is known and therefore mass can be estimated. So, okay. Uh, I, was, uh, I should, yeah, probably I should, yeah. So therefore, uh, there's again a artist's viewpoint of how the Sagittarius A star being a supermassive black hole weighing about 4 million solar mass was inferred. So you can see that for a highly eccentric stellar orbit, the uh, nearest distance approach is 
very, very short. It's about 20 billion kilometers. Okay. And mass has been estimated from, you can do it using Kepler's law because the distance is so large that you don't need really general relativity. So using Kepler's law itself, you can uh, estimate what is the central mass that is causing this highly eccentrical bound orbit. And the mass turns out to be about 4 into 10 to the power 6 solar mass, while 20 billion kilometer being the nearest distance, the only astrophysical object you can think of is a black because you can't have uh, a such a massive object of radius 20 billion kilometers and yet be stable. So both observation and a little bit of theory, the stability of stars from general astrophysical consideration tells us that this object necessarily has to be a black hole. But there are, of course, even before all this, there were evidences of black holes. In fact, first evidence of black hole came from the X-ray source Cygnus X1 way back in 1970s. And very flu high fluctuation in the X-ray emission from the Cygnus X1 showed pure causality argument that if your light curve, X-ray light curve is fluctuating over delta T time and the fluctuation is going twice, thrice the uh, normal level, then the entire region must be participating in the fluctuation. There must be motion within this entire region that is causing sudden enhancement of uh, X-ray luminosity. And pure causality argument that Delta T is the fluctuation, and if the entire length scale L is participating, motion is participating in the fluctuation, L must be less than C into delta T. So nothing can move faster than the speed of light. So C into delta T forms the upper limit to the size. From there, they estimated the scale associated with the central mass, and they inferred it can only be a black hole. So Cygnus X1 was the first evidence. Of course, these are all indirect evidences for black holes. And uh, then um, we have the first quasar was detected by Martin Schmidt in 1964. And uh, the then whole, you know, uh, galaxies, I mean, it's a pun, galaxies of active galactic nuclei uh, were discovered, whether it is quasars, radio galaxies, Seaford galaxies, starburst galaxies, and so on. And uh, most of these could be only explained by accretion uh, around black hole. The idea germinated, uh, I think, first by Saul Peter and by Linden Bill. Linden Bill talked about disks, although he didn't give the full mathematical solution of a disk, which came from Sakura and Shunayev and then later Pringle. But the instead of Bondi's kind of spherical accretion, Linden Bell had argued about a disk accretion and to explain quasar emission. So a cartoon uh, representing it is that if you have differentially rotating, um, swirling plasma going around a black hole, then the differential rotation would cause rubbing between elements and cause heating and release of copious number of X-ray photons. But of course, there are many unsolved questions as to what is the cause of the viscosity? Is it magnetic viscosity? It, it is a combination of turbulence and magnetic viscosity. So this is a, a field which is uh, still very exciting and people like um, Raj Kishore and in the nature of Adhyas group or Shantabhu Prakash's group like Shomit and all, they have been doing a lot of work in this uh, area. And uh, so active galactic nuclei like quasars, blazars, radio galaxies, they were uh, also evidence for black holes because uh, when quasars were discovered, there was a whole lot of uncertainty as to what is the central in engine. But then with the pioneering work followed following Saul Peter, Linden Bell, people like Martin Rees, Begelman, uh, Blanford, 
slowly, it turned out that the best way to describe all these are uh, if you have a black hole and uh, plasma going around the black hole and essentially it is the gravitational uh, in new, from Newtonian point of view is the gravitational potential energy but those who know general relativity will uh, also uh, vouch by this formula that if you have a short shell black hole if you have a particle static uh, at radius r its energy is 1 minus uh, rs by r square root into rest mass energy of the particle. So if you go very close to the short shell radius, its energy actually goes towards zero. So where is the original energy? So that energy can be released through accretion process and you can go very close to the event horizon and closer you go, again the causality argument, c into delta t. If you go, if the emission is taking place over small size, then time uh, scale of variability can be uh, very, very tiny. So essentially general relativity, uh, essentially explaining the high time variability that is seen in blazars and uh, quasars and also great efficiency because remember black hole accretion is the most efficient other than matter, antimatter, and hylation, uh, except for that black hole Central engine is the most efficient engine, much more efficient than nuclear fusion. Okay, you can estimate the nuclear fusion efficiency by uh, four proton rest energy minus helium rest energy divided by four proton energy. That efficiency, I think, is close to 0 0.01. While black hole efficiency is close to 0 0.3 or 0 0.1, something like that. So, but of course, matter antimatter annihilation is 100%. You will get 100% energy. But where is the antimatter? I'll talk about this in a little while. Someone should keep the time. I must, what is more important is questions and discussion. <laughs> and then came the unified model of the active galactic nuclei, where you have a central supermassive black hole and there is a accretion disk. Accretion disk can be barely visible here. Okay. It's just the tiny portion. And there's a dust chlorus because you have to explain the infrared emission also. So scattering um, of normal uh, optical photons by the dust will cause infrared and the jet by the warped up helical magnetic field, etc. And uh, the helical magnetic field would collimate the jets and so on. So by viewing, so this is for the unified model, if your, if your line of sight <coughs> is along the jet, then you will see it as a blazar. While if your line of sight is perpendicular uh, to the jet axis, then you will see it as a radio galaxy and so on. But the unified model, one there are certain caveats because uh, one of the features which unified model doesn't quite uh, explain, again, uh, you know, I'm talking 20 years back, what the situation is, those who are currently working like Raj Kishore or Shomik, they'll be able to uh, point out more. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, most classical radio galaxies where you have two lobes, jets, have I got a picture of classical uh, radio galaxy? Yeah, there's a, this is a classical radio galaxy. You have an elliptical galaxy and false color, of course, the rigid radiates are false color. These are all in radio emission. So you have double jet ending up at radial lobes. And the central region of the elliptical galaxies has been ha, has been resolved by uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Probably the central dot is the Christian disk. But again, you can't resolve it really. And there's a dust torus and all that stuff. Um, and uh, uh, the key point is most of the classical radio galaxies, they're all elliptical. While Seifert's and QSOs, not the quasars, quasars are the radio loud QSOs, while QSOs which are not radio loud are called, in, in my PSD time, this is the classification, QSOs, QSOs. So most 
radio sources, powerful radio sources are associated with the elliptical galaxies. Well, Seifert's are spiral galaxies. So the question is that this dichotomy exists. I don't know whether unified model these days, they explain why is it that very few, there are few spiral galaxies which are dominant radio emitters. One of the theories which was there is, it is a rotating black hole, curved black hole. Curved black hole causes a easier way of developing jets. And elliptical galaxies, again, not properly explained. Elliptical galaxies, because of merger hypothesis and all that, elliptical galaxies will have highly rotating supermassive black holes. But the final word has not been said. So a lot of work still needs to be done. Uh, I've already discussed this. Uh, the other uh, indirect evidence came uh, about the real existence of black holes are the direct gravitational wave detection from uh, binary black holes. So here is an example of the gravitational wave source 190521, where, of course, a lot of modeling goes into it. So data analysis and modeling. And uh, from the data analysis, it turns out that the gravitational wave amplitude that was seen by the two LIGO detectors uh, corresponds to two black holes, one 85 solar mass, the other 66 solar mass, and they coalescing to produce finally a black hole of 142 solar mass. And in most of the black hole binary uh, source leading to gravitational wave, the final object, there's a ringing, and this ringing is a hallmark of the quasi-normal modes of a black hole, which was first predicted uh, that time by a PhD student, uh, uh, C. V. Vishweshwara, who was doing his PhD in Maryland uh, in 1972. He wrote a nature paper saying that if you perturb a black hole, short shell black hole, by sending a gravitational wave, the event horizon rings like a bell and you have a decaying gravitational wave signature. Then later on, many people uh, contributed to the work, and this whole area is now called quasi-normal modes of black holes. And in many of the gravitational wave detection, the final, of course, the statistical confidence level is not so high. The final, you can see actually a decaying gravitational wave signature. And so if one later on, if the gravitational wave detectors see a proper quasi-normal mode signature, that will be the direct confirmation of a black hole. All other results, Mark, and here in this very hall, during the RETCO, I had given a talk, and I said that all uh, except quasi-normal mode is indirect. Someone, this was way back in 2015, I think. Huh? So that time, Event Horizon Telescope had not come. Some people pointed out, oh, we didn't, Event Horizon Telescope will directly detect. I said, no, they can't, because horizon by itself is the locus of points from which even radiation can't come. So how do you know that it's a black hole? So, uh, so to the best of my understanding, the only two direct signature of Black hole is the quasi-normal mode when you disturb a black hole and see the ringing phase and the Hawking radiation. These are the only two direct uh, signatures of black hole. So, of course, the Event Horizon Telescope first made its uh, claim about M87. But do you really see a black hole here? The real the answer is no. You don't see the black hole. You only see that there is a dark region and there is radiation from around it. Of course, this is hinting black hole, but how do you know it's not a uh, object whose gravitational pull is so strong that photons here have got redshifted? You don't see the photons. How do you know it's the event horizon? The event horizon meaning it is a uh, one-way membrane. So that's why now they will not claim that is event horizon, but it's really the photon sphere. But of course, it is consistent with our understanding of black hole. It's consistent. But it doesn't mean that you have actually shown that 
there is a mathematical surface called event horizon in which if you have anything that goes inside the event horizon, it cannot trace back its path. It can't come out. That signature is not yet uh, there. Anyway, uh, this I can skip. These are something uh, you know, I should go ahead with something more. Uh, yeah. So now I'll talk about primordial black holes. Uh, so primordial black holes are black holes which were which are not produced by the normal astrophysical uh, evolution of the collapse of matter. So, so therefore, primordial black holes are produced during the cosmic voyage of our universe. And we know that the standard model, which tells, tells us that the universe at large scale, where at large scale, the average density of matter is homogeneous and isotropic, and therefore, you can ex uh, describe it by a Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker uh, metric. And this model has been quite successful. Of course, there are many problems and very many interesting problems. This uh, got a boost when Hubble in 1929 showed that uh, galaxies are expanding away from each other. And now we have a standard model where, of course, there's an initial singularity which happens at the Planck time tends to a minus 43 seconds. And then to solve certain fine tuning problem like horizon problem, flatness problem, monopole problem, etc., you have to invoke inflation. So suddenly the scale factor exponentially expands. And then of course inflation has to end and there is reheating and all kinds of exciting particle physics processes take place where there is grand unified theory that causes these are all models, by the way. Grand unified theory causing inflation. And then comes the electroweak era when uh, after the electroweak phase transition, neutrinos decouple from uh, electrons, positrons, muons, tau lepton, etc. And uh, then there's a QCD phase transition where the quark gluons, they no longer are free. They form bound structure. Hadrons are formed and so on. Uh, and then there's a phase when the universe cools down to less than about a uh, few thousand degree Kelvin so that protons and electrons can combine to form hydrogen atoms. And then photons no longer uh, interact because now you have neutral particles. Photons interact only with charged particles. So photons freely stream. And those freely streaming photons is what we today see as cosmic micro background radiation. And there's a period of dark phase, again, another mysterious area where the primordial stars, namely population three stars, were formed here. James Webb Space Telescope will be able to shed more light on this. And then, of course, another key problem, when, are the, when were the supermassive black holes formed? This is one of my current areas of research, because you, have, you see quasars uh, which are high redshift quasars having some quasars have 66 billion solar mass supermassive black holes at the center. Uh, right. So when the universe was very hot, first it was Zeldovich and uh, Zeldovich and Novikov who uh, argued that when the universe was very hot and dense, you could form small primordial black holes. But then uh, they did not make rigorous argument, and uh, I will come to that. Anyway, this has skipped this slide, I'll skip. So, uh, yeah, let me, I'm jumping ahead. Uh, I should go slow. Yeah. So, wh why do you think that uh, when the universe was dense and hot, uh, you should form primordial black holes? Normally, black holes form at the end of stellar evolution. The argument is very uh, strong, actually. Because you have dense region and there are regions of causally connected region, I'll make it more <laughs> precise, but this is something not known. So I want to make simple back of the envelope calculation to convince you that primordial black holes are to be formed. So if you have causally connected region and the universe is very hot and dense, so there can be thermodynamic fluctuation because 
a hot thing, dense thing, there can be always statistical fluctuation. So purely due to statistical fluctuation, a causally connected region, if the mass becomes slightly more so that the region size, if it is L, and the mass becomes so small that G2 GM by C square is greater than this size, then it collapses into a black hole because 2 GM by C square is the short shell radius. And uh, so let me make it more by uh, convincing by uh, simple estimate. Ah, before I go to that, one of the thing I told you about cosmology, one of the big thing is a Hubble tension, uh, namely the cosmic microwave background radiation precision test tell us that the Hubble uh, parameter must be 67.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec, while even Rise, the Nobel laureate who talked about dark energy for the first time, his recent observation for Hubble constant measured from galaxies is 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So this is a tension. You can't have two different values of Hubble parameter. Say parameter. So, so there's some problem. Either there is measurement problem, errors, but then it's not exciting. A real exciting thing would be if there are no measurement errors at, and you get two different values. That means there is a lack of theoretical understanding in either CMBR or in the field of galaxies, okay. uh, expansion of space between galaxies. Okay. Yeah. Ten minutes. Oh, 10 minutes. Okay. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll go quickly. So, so what I was saying was that if you have an expanding universe, then you can show that at any given time, you have the Hubble parameter, which is a dot by a, where a is the scale factor and a dot is time derivative of the scale factor. So causally connected region, that means the region where gravitation is causally connected. So relativistic theory, nothing can move faster than speed of light, is given by the Hubble radius C divided by HT. And it turns out to be of the order of C into T, where T is the age of the universe. And from the FLRW dynamics, you know that A dot square by A square is related to the density. And in the early universe, when the temperature was so high that rest mass of particles were negligible, then essentially the universe evolves, the scale factor evolves like square root of the age of the universe. And you can show, therefore, Hubble parameter, time-dependent Hubble parameter, A dot by A equals 1 over. From this equation, therefore, you know that the density of the universe goes as 1 over T square. So as age is increasing, of course, density is falling. Now, you ask, what is the mass within the Hubble radius? Namely, Hubble radius is how much C divided by HT is of the order of C into T. Then the mass within a Hubble radius turns out to be this point, CQ by T, two, T by 2G. This is about, if you take the age of the universe to be 10 to minus 35 second, then mass within the Hubble radius is about 2 kilogram. Okay. Now, the gravitational radius 2gm by c square, if you estimate from this, the gravitational radius is ct, which is the same as the Hubble radius. That means a little extra mass, the Hubble radius becomes less than the short shell radius. That means it will collapse into a black hole. So this is the origin of formation of primordial black holes in the early universe. And as I said, Zeldovich and uh, Novikov, they had made early inroad, but they said there'll be problem and they went away. But then Hawking in 1971 and followed by his student those days, Bernard Carr, Carr and Hawking, then later on Carr, 1975. So uh, they gave detailed theories as to how primordial black holes will be formed in the early universe. Uh, now, can we use the primordial black hole? And one of the ways I was involved in the work is how to produce uh, matter, antimatter asymmetry. We know that on large scales, we don't see antimatter. From gamma ray background, we know that large scale, the universe is totally dominated by matter. But the question is that when the Big Bang happened, you'd expect pure symmetry argument. You'd expect equal amount of matter, equal amount of antimatter. Otherwise, it's fine tuning. 
no one wants fine tuning and you should have i mean if it's super force like god created universe you should have created universe with perfect symmetry same amount of matter same amount of antimatter but we see today matter where have, have the antimatter gone the only antimatter we see are from the cosmic rays now it turns out the number of baryons effective number of protons is 10 to the minus 9 times the number of photons the so called baryon to photon ratio how do you know about the number of photons from cosmic microbatter radiation how do you know about baryons the density you measure because the dominant uh, baryonic matter lies in hydrogen and helium hydrogen is 75% by weight helium is 24% by weight less than 1% is heavy element and the baryon to photon ratio is 10 to the power minus 9 so a bright idea probably the first to suggest was andrei sakharov of former ussr uh, he said that that means if you have matter almost equal to antimatter antimatter but just one extra in every billion in every billion antimatter particle there is billion matter plus one extra then if they annihilate you you can explain 10 is from baryon to antimatter baryon to photon ratio which is 10 is from minus 9 but how do you uh, let me skip i don't have much time how do you have this extra one per billion if you start with same equal so this is a sakharov condition for baryogenesis how to create extra baryon if you start with same amount of baryon and uh, anti baryons that you need to have baryon number violation you need to have charge conjugation charge conjugation parity violation and the process must be out of thermodynamic equilibrium why out of thermodynamic equilibrium because if thermodynamic equilibrium for every net baryon produced you can have net anti baryon produced so they'll cancel out so you need to have out of thermodynamic dynamic equilibrium so uh, so it turns out that if you have a theory which violate baryon number charge conjugation and charge conjugation parity the cp violation you can have baryon non conservation in grand unified theories and if you propose cp violation and hawking radiation as in hawking in 1974 showed that a black hole if you take quantum effects near the event horizon the black hole also shines the event horizon of a black hole shines like a black body and the temperature of the black hole is given by this expression in numerical terms the temperature of a short shell black hole is 10 to the power 26 degree kelvin divided by the mass of the black hole in grams so you can estimate the sun like black hole will have only a temperature of 10 to the power minus 7 degree kelvin so there are ways of virtual pair creation one partner falls into the event horizon another escape the simple ways of explaining uh, black the hawking evaporation but the real calculation is more complex and Uh, so if you have a black hole it can create particles because of this hawking evaporation and uh, hawking evaporation therefore can produce cut scale x bosons which will violate baryon number and is out of uh, this by definition out of thermodynamic condition and if you have cp violation you can produce excess matter over antimatter so uh, we did some work on that and uh, so for example if you have a primordial black hole mass of 10 to minus 3 g the hawking temperature would be 10 to 16 gv which is the grand the gut scale and it, it will produce x bosons and uh, so there are ways of producing uh, excess matter uh, and but but there are some caveats uh, is first thing is in order to produce the observed excess matter over antimatter the cp violation parameter must be 10 to the power minus 4 the other caveat is that we have to produce the right number of primordial black holes of that 1 kilo to begin with but 
no theory exists as to which will tell you that how much, how many such black holes will you produce. Barring those uncertainties, uh, black holes can uh, estimate uh, lead to uh, matter and matter. The other, uh, I have to go fast. The other canonical black holes are due to stellar evolution, as you know, that uh, average star like Sun or low mass stars will not produce black hole. At the most, they can produce white bar. But massive star, eventually, when there's a supernova explosion, uh, and if the core, iron core, if it exceeds the critical mass, maybe 2.5 or 3 solar mass, it'll form black hole. These are, of course, the canonical black holes that astrophysicists have been talking about. Primordial black holes are pure cosmological black holes. Uh, let me skip all these really interesting stuff, area theorem, but let me go to the final thing. Is this there? Or the other slide? Yeah. So the other thing is the su supermassive black hole. Yeah, supermassive black holes. We know supermassive black holes. Um, yeah. So, uh, so in the case of black hole physics, the supermassive black holes, they have strange behavior. The black hole mass is correlated with mass of the central bulge. So bulge of a spiral galaxy is well known. And it turns out that all spiral galaxies which have been studied, all elliptical galaxies which have been studied closely, they have supermassive black hole. And the bulge and mass is well correlated. This is the real data and all that. Let me go fast. And what is more important is that if you plot the luminosity of a quasar uh, and the inferred black hole mass, there's a correlation. This correlation can be explained using Eddington. If there's a question, I can explain. In my astrophysics course, I have talked about Eddington limit and all that. And uh, so that's why there's a correlation. But you can see in this um, this quasar, which is which used to be a very <coughs> luminous quasar, it has a black hole, which is 12 billion solar mass. How do you <coughs> produce such 12 billion solar mass black hole when the universe was only 0 0.9, 0 0.9 billion years old? So how do you produce black holes so fast? This is where uh, I have been doing some work, uh, and that is invoking if the dark matter particles are completely uh, ultralight bosons, pseudo-scalar bosons, then they can undergo the Bose-Einstein condensation and using gross pitasky equation, we uh, use analytical evolution to show that indeed you could produce supermassive black, black holes when the age of the universe is about 10 to 4, 8 years, 10 to 4, 9 years. And now we have been seeing supermassive black holes as massive as 66 billion solar mass when the universe was only 10 to 4, 8 years old. So it's a really a big challenge to produce such supermassive black holes when the universe was uh, so young. And uh, this model can explain, of course, here also there's a caveat. The ca what is the caveat? The caveat is that the hot matter particles must be ultra light scalars. How light? The rest mass of the particles in our theory, their rest mass has to be less than 10 to the minus 20 electron volt. So no such particles have been discovered so far. So is the standard CDM, the cold dark matter particle, all detectors which have, like xenon detectors, which have sort of probed uh, the dark matter particles, the constraints are very, very uh, discouraging. They say that if the dark matter particle are indeed uh, WIMP-like particles, their mass has to be greater than 100 to 1000 GeV, and, uh, which is not a good sign for high energy physics uh, theories. I think I should, uh, there are a lot of things to talk about black holes, but I'll stop. It's more important that you ask questions and you be skeptic. Don't believe whatever I have said, because only when you ask questions and that will make me think. And I'll also learn something. So, yeah. Thank you, sir, for a very nice and informative. Now we are open for questions. Questions? 
Merging, merging yeah. hypothesis. Yeah. So, uh, let's say the two black holes, two different mass black holes, and they have some sort of accretion disk around it. When they are merging, what sorts of effect on the accretion disk you will have? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, obviously, when the two merging black holes with their respective accretion disk, they are very far apart, then the accretion disk around them are stable. But as they come closer, when the tidal forces become comparable with the gravity of one black hole on the accretion disk, then the disk will be disturbed. But of course, matter is going around. There's angular momentum. And we all know that if you have angular momentum, if there's an extra torque, the angular momentum will persist. But that's very interesting. You have elements which will persist and different elements will have different precession. So there's, a, there's already a differential rotation in the disk and there is a differential precession that can cause even more viscosity and more fluctuation in the uh, radiation. So uh, these are questions which are very important that when you have two supermassive black holes, when they are merging, one would expect because of the initial tidal forces and the effect on the accretion disk, you should see several, several, not just one, quasi-periodic oscillations. That is one thing. But when they come very close, accretion disk will no, no longer be stable. They will be tidally pulled apart. It depends upon how close you uh, bring to supermassive black holes. Uh, and of course, observationally, the problem is that when they are very close, the surrounding matter is so dense the optical depth is very high. You can't even see what's going on. But perhaps radio, radio goes unscathed. So probably radio observation of two supermassive black holes, which are <coughs> going very close. I think one or two, uh, I, I had one example, one or two pairs of supermassive black holes have been actually detected, confirmed pairs. Have I answered your question, Shamil? Yeah. But, but that's an interesting point. Uh, uh, probably Indronil uh, would have more knowledge on the uh, literature as to effect of tidal forces on the stability of the accretion disk. Yeah. Uh, I need this, but anyway. Uh, the, the gravity wave people are uh, saying that there is not much effect. But that's probably is when they are very far apart. No, I mean, basically, the accretion disk is assumed at least. After it is stabilized, it assumes that this accretion uh, disk don't have self gravity. No, no, that's all right. But the gravity of the on the accretion disk by another black hole, which is yeah, approaching, it is unstable, completely yeah. unstable, and it will sort of uh, probably blow apart and, uh, and all sorts of time dependent phenomena will come up. But in the uh, in the merging event, it has no effect because these are oh. all. Uh, basically, take yeah. this case. merging of their own dynamics hardly any effect. But accretion disk mm -hmm. is the mass wise is very low compared to the actual black hole mass. But the effect on the accretion disk, yes, yes, yes. that Absolutely. will be. In fact, I mean, if you look at, I mean, we don't, if we haven't seen the uh, uh, image the accretion disk as yet, even for image itself. But uh, if you look at at least the galactic disks, when they interact, the kind of I mean, structures they leave at the way, that might be a pointer on what will happen to this accretion disk. Okay. Okay. But it would be an interesting theoretical problem oh. to, uh, because you guys are doing a lot of magnetohydrodynamics. So if you now switch on a external gravitational force, yeah. So switch on a gravitational field, make it simple parameter, make it stronger and stronger, and see what impact it has. So the black hole it grows, it becomes stronger as well. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Black hole and accretion disk is there. Switch on an extra okay. gravitational force from outside, and keep on increasing the parameter, and see when when the parameter goes beyond a particular thing. Is there a phase transition on the disk or something like that? It should be interesting.
Sir, associated with the accretion disk, there are jets coming out from the, uh, yeah. uh, there are radio jets coming out. So what will happen when this merging is happening to the jets? Yeah, so as we were discussing, when they are very far away, then when the respective accretion disks are not seeing the gravity of the opposite black hole, then you have hunky-dory uh, condition. The jets are coming out. But when they come closer, then the accretion disk, they'll start processing. You might have, but these are very common. I'm only giving physical intuition, the actual detailed calculation may belie my whatever I am saying. So simple physical intuition says that if the accretion disk processes the helical magnetic field due to warping of the, they will also process and the jet will also process. This is a simple intuitive idea. Actual calculations, <laughs> even magnetohydrodynamic simulation, I'm sure is pure horror. Okay. So, so you would see Oscillations. I was just talking to Alok because I had known about some work. They have seen uh, a blazer whose jets shows up sometimes just before the outburst and after the outburst. 13 hour period. Is it? Nature. Huh? Nature, yes. So fortunately, the when I came in the bus, <coughs> Alok was there, so I got to discuss with him. So I asked him, I knew about the work. I asked him some details. So he said, 13 hour period. It's a long period. So is it a precession of the jet? Who knows? Because astronomers and astrophysicists, we can't go in situ and do experiment. We can only interpret whatever data uh, we get here. And because of that, it Theoretical guys can have a field day with their imagination. You can, that's why I, ast I mean, I, astrophysics is an interesting thing that you can imagine any scenario you wish. So this is one of the imagination. Could it be gravitational perturbation and the jets processing? But when they come close, you would expect the jets to get extinguished because the accretion disk must might get completely disrupted. Again, these are all physical intuitions. The detail calculation may reveal something else and something more interesting. So one last question. Just one. So how is this working realized when we say that no information can come out of a black hole? Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, so uh yeah, so. This is still the bottom line has not been written. So the idea is very simple that if you have a, this is the information loss paradox uh, picture. So you have a black hole which form and Hawking showed that if you have a black hole, then the event horizon acts like a black body and it's constantly emitting thermal particles. So eventually, if you continue this whole argument, Eventually, the whole black hole will disappear. And therefore, whatever caused the formation of a black hole is all now converted into thermal photons. That means what? If you have created a black hole purely using a pure quantum state, you take a huge Bose-Einstein condensed state. By very definition, a Bose-Einstein condensed at t equal to zero is described by a pure wave function macroscopic wave function if it's a t equal to the temperature zero both instant condition so you have a pure wave function and if you shrink the wave function that's what we have done for supermassive black hole production this whole thing can become a black hole so a pure state has become a black hole pure state according to schrodinger evolution because quantum mechanics is true but schrodinger evolution says a pure state undergoes unitary transformation, pure state will always remain a pure state. It can never become a thermal state. Thermal state is not a single wave function. It's a probability distribution of many, many different wave functions. So that means a pure wave function 
becomes a collection of thermally distributed wave function. It's not allowed by Schrodinger evolution. That's the information loss paradox. So people like Samir Mathur, uh, he says that things should be uh, done using string theory. And in his string theory, a black hole is actually a gigantic, um, long string, super string. And his theory is called fuzzy black hole. So it's a horizon is not a mathematical two-dimensional surface, but it's fuzzy. And every time the string is, excited string is emitting a particle, and that's what is Hawking radiation. And there's no violation of uh, unitarity. It's like a hot coal. You have taken a piece of coal. This analogy was given by Saskain. Based on that, Samir Mathur, Gautam Mandal, they worked out the theory. So Saskain's argument was if you ever take, take a coal and shine a laser, laser is described by a pure photon state. So pure quantum mechanics, the laser is absorbed by a coal, but the coal gets hot and starts emitting photons. Is the unitarity violated? Then Saskain argued the answer is no, because this, if you look at, trace all the hot radiation their state, you'll find that actual state is pure state. It's not, it looks like a thermal state, but it's a pure state. No information loss. Same is true about the black hole evaporation, according to certain school uh, like Samir Mathur or Malda Sena. And... Thank you, sir. Now I would like to invite Jerem Chair and coordinator to present us for environmental day. Okay. Thank you very much. The act. Okay, you don't want to have loss of information. <laughs> so maybe you can do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I feel like the photo ops of you know who. <laughs> you know who. This has to be removed, right? Yes. Okay, so let us thank the speakers once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, what's um, so. yeah. okay. yeah. So, so I'll invite next next speaker, Tulsi Dare Murthy, for for a talk. You have twelve minutes. I will give you a reminder at ten. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, my name is Lisa Ramrati, and today I'll be talking about my type of talk will be role of stellar astrophysics in testing general relativity near the galactic center black hole CG star. So this work is based on our work published in MNRS by uh, me and my supervisor. Here, this is a theoretical framework, so I will try to generalize, generalize it as much as possible. 
here we are estimating the percentage shift of S stars near the galactic center. We, in addition to tidal distortion. So, what we are, our main probe are galactic center, black hole, and S stars. So, the galactic center lies at a distance of 26,000 light years away from Earth. So it was first discovered as a radio source by Carl Jansky working at, at, at the Bell Laboratory. Then ever since then, there are many theories to ask what may be, what may lie at the galactic center. So in the year 1971, Lyndon Bell and Rees proposed that, oh, like all other galaxies are expected to host a supermassive black hole, our galaxy, our galactic center may indeed hold a, a supermassive black hole. So the, the first, in direct evidence that the galactic center is a supermassive black hole was put forth by two groups, one from one group led by Andrea Guest from UCLA and the other by Reinhard Kensel from uh, MP group, where they have observed about four S stars near the galactic center for 16 years. Then the best estimate mass of the galactic center black hole is approximately 4 million solar mass. It was reported by Gravity Collaboration 2020. Then we have our first direct evidence and image of the galactic center black hole, which was put forth by the Event Horizon Telescope as on May 12, 2022. So the question is, why are we interested in studying gravitational physics near the galactic center? The main, these are the prospects. The first thing is that this is the nearest supermassive black hole. And in such a strong environment of gravity, we seek to understand the most fundamental questions concerning gravitation, astrophysics, and cosmology. And the next point is that our current description of gravity, which is general relativity, is ex being a classical theory is expected to undergo modification at very strong field of gravity. Here, when I mention strong field of gravity, it's measured by G, which is gravitational constant Gm by C square A, the A being the radius. So in the solar system, this is about 10 to the power minus five, and in the environment of neutron star, it found to be 0 0.1. So it will be extreme near the galactic center black hole. So understanding this gravity in a strong environment will also give us insight into the problem of star formation in the presence of supermassive black hole as well. Here are the existing astronomical tests near Sagittarius A star, which includes both theoretical simulation and observational work. And here in the first, here, here on 2018, near in the environment of galactic center through S2 star, we have first evidence of, I mean, the get here near the galactic center black hole through S2 star, GR again has successfully passed its test. So the big question is, why do we still insist on testing general relativity near CG star? The main reason is that this S2 star lies at about a, a 1000 AU from the galactic center. And we want to, and in order to test this here in, and for testing this general relativity, we want to go as, as near as possible near the singularity. However, in this work we have, started working with the semi-major exists from 30 AU till 500 AU, 30 AU being the inner, inner most stable circular orbit near the black hole. So here are other main probe, these S stars. These S stars lies within 0 0.01 per sec of the galactic center black hole, having a centricity E equals to 0 0.9 in inclination, I equals to 90 degree. The centricity is two then, as uh, by Hill's mechanism and resonant relaxation method. And this inclination I close to 90 degree is such that we want to have the maximum rate of percentage shift. And this considered a star fall under the category of young type B stars. And these S stars, if I, as I have mentioned before, have been continuously monitored by two groups over the past 16 years for testing gravity near CG star. So in this work, we'll be estimating I, we have estimated percentage shift through S stars from general relativistic effect and tidal distortion effect. So here are the main contributions from general, general relativistic effect, which includes 
squashial precision of the third post-Newtonian effect, uh, spin of frame dragging effect, and quadruple moment effect. This frame dragging effect happens when uh, a rotating object drags along its space time and force it to co rotate with it. And this both frame dragging effect and quadruple moment are consequence of spin induced effect. So here, this is uh, here my main percentage shift. This is not the rate, the main percentage shift uh, for arising from general relativistic effect. MBH is nothing but the mass of the galactic center black hole here. RP rather indicates the percenter distance. A is a semi major exists, and E arises from the eccentricity. And chi, this chi is rather the spin parameter of the black hole. So, in addition to the general relativistic effect, we have considered tidal distortion effects. What happens is that when a star orbit the CG star, so it depend, depending upon the tidal radius, it will either be completely broken down or will co-rotate with the black hole. And this equation number two, equation number two determines the tidal radius and depends upon the mass of the black hole and the mass radius of the, uh, the stars rotating around the black hole. And equation three represents the tidal distortion effect arising which we have included in percentage shift. And K2 here is the log number of a star. This K, okay, I will later discuss it again. And M, M and R are the mass and radius of the star. This K2 depends upon, K2 determines the shape of the star. So K, uh, this K2 depends upon the polytropic index of a star. Here we consider, since the considered S stars are main sequence stars. So here we consider polytropic indices of one and three, which are, which are for main sequence star. And here are the mass radius relations which have been used. At the time of our work, the, the low mass stars relation, uh, the mass relation for low mass stars near the galactic center was recorded by Eker 2018. However, till date, there were no mass relations for high mass stars. So with the help of Professor Eker from Turkey, uh, we analyzed about 509 main sequence stars, uh, considering Considering that the S stars are having the same metallicity as the sun, we came up with this mass radius relation. Uh, so this was one of the highlights of our work as well. So uh, question is, yes, sir. If M yeah. is sufficiently uh, big, uh, then you because the negative factor it can be very less, right? Yes. So it depends. Yeah, the negative factors comes into play. So coming to the results, these are the possibilities of extraction of effects through upcoming facil observing facilities. Here we consider Keck, here in this work are estimated along with the upcoming observation by Keck, a uh, gravity detector in very large telescope VLT and the extreme European extremely large telescope. So here are the effects indicating square shell, spin frame dragging, quadruple. Here, the percenter distance R0.3 AU, which is basically 30 semi major exists of 30 AU. So, from here, we can see that for at a very compact of orbit near the galactic center, square shell spin, uh, spin or frame dragging effect and quadruple moment, as well as this tidal effect, will be prominent. However, as we move away from as we increase the orbit, Again, squash shell precision will dominate out above all these effects. So this tidal distortion effect is taken from polytrops n equals to one and n equals to three. This is for n equals to three. And we can see that uh, the possibility of detecting this, extracting particular effects will be more prominent for uh, n equals to polytrops n equals to one for tidal distortion effect. And here is the estimated percentage shift rate. Here we can see for measuring this estimated percentage shift rate, we consider all possible distance that is even the distance to the galactic center and the inclination of the stars. So here, this is a compact uh, measurement for polytrops n equals to one and equals to three with, with the total percentage shift. So we can see that uh, if we are to measure the percentage shift near the galactic center uh, using 
polytropes uh, starts with polytropes and equals to one would be more prominent. And here is a percentership rate due to percent uh, pure general realistic effect plotted for against percentership for black hole spin. Actually, the black hole spin have not been accurately measured. So 0 0.1 and 0 0.9 are taken to be the, up, the lower and upper bound. And 0 0.44 is reported by Keto et al. Uh, where he measured the quad Z period oscillation of black hole. And this is consistent with our, the mass of the galactic center black hole. So we have used it. And we can see that beyond the present distance of 50 AU, around 40 AU, no matter what spin we have used, it, the percentage shift is independent of uh, the spin of the black hole. And figure two and figure three are here. Figure two is for polytropes n equals to one and and n equals to three for low mass stars. And figure three will be for high mass stars, where from both we can see that the again for general relativistic effect uh, will dominate over large distances. And this is a ratio of percentage shift with tidal contribution to that with tidal contribution coming from stellar mass. And it's plotted against percentage distance uh, for all low mass stars and high mass stars. And we can see that for polytropes n equals to one, beyond two AU, it, uh, the percentage shift will be independent of mass. That means whatever mass of the stars that we use, it doesn't matter. It won't affect the final percentage shift. And that is quite different for polytropes n equals to three, which is where the mass independency will fall out after one AU. So here are the main which I have discussed, the thing is that for larger orbits, percentage shift is dominated by pure general relativistic effect. And for both high ma low mass stars and high mass stars, percentage shift due to tidal distortion becomes large only for very compact orbits. And it is also observed that percentage shift caused by tidal distortion of high mass stars is larger than low mass stars. And, and here it is seen that special effect will be measurable through astrometric categories. 10 micro second corresponds to the Keck telescope, which was used for observing these S2 stars. And 30 micro second corresponds to the gravity detector in VLT. And 50 micro arc second is for the upcoming 30 meter telescope. And for polytropes n equals to 3, uh, the sensitivity is barely visible for beyond percentage distance of 1 AU. And for polytropes n equals to 1, uh, the sensitivity will decrease after 2 AU. So here are the difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone? Other participants? No. Other question. Okay. Uh, so, uh, first of all, a very good word. Thank you, uh, but now I have two points here. Okay. One is that the, uh, the good thing that is you are trying to uh, verify your find. I mean, whatever results you're getting through take telescope and yeah. uh, upcoming ELT. That's fine. But there are two issues here. First of all, the S star, the closest that the S star comes to is around 100 Schwarzschild radius, right? Yeah. Around, I mean, it's, I yes. don't exactly know the uh, remember the number, but it's 200 Schwarzschild radius. There at 100 Schwarzschild radius, the effects of uh, uh, whether it's a curved black hole, whether it's a uh, Schwarzschild black hole, it will be marginal. I mean, it will be very difficult for anyone to figure out, okay, whether it's that. That's number one. Number two is that. Uh, you have taken one of the cases as n equals to three, right? Polytropic yeah, polytropic. Well, at n equals to three means gamma four third, right? Yeah. Okay, so that means it's highly relativistic. At those temperatures, uh, stars are not stable. Okay, so you can just put whatever polytropic index you, you have, right? Yeah. But the stars are not stable on those. So. Uh, uh, I, I have two comments uh, on, on that. So you should go for a more realistic polytropic index. Okay. And okay, I can have another third point. Yeah. Is that the with the QPO that you have talked about? Yeah. Okay, that is uh, that is actually assumed to be that QPO comes because of the cyclic motion of the orbits. Yeah. But we know from extra binaries 
that the QPOs come only in the hard radiation, okay? High energy radiation. Okay. Those are not produced by matter or by Sir, uh, this catalog L, when he reported this sky equals to 0 0.4 QPO, he's measuring this uh, seismology through the equation. So he made an assumption that it's consistent with the uh, the mass of the galactic center black hole. No, that is a different matter. Yeah. That is a different matter. You take a mass and then how do you produce the QPO? That is okay. So that the perturbation they are talking about is actually the perturbation of orbits. Okay, but QPOs in general has been seen from a not from the thermal uh, uh, radiation, but on in the power law emission. Power law emission does not come from orbits. I mean matter or by Yeah. Okay. And so regarding that polytropes, that's why we are just representing n equals to three. Here, from a result also n equals to one was more prominent for detection. But this n equals to three, the detection is quite low. And since it's the exact solution of lane and then equation, and we are generalizing as much as possible, so we are just taking into consideration. And regarding a we'll, we'll find that yeah. there is something called Ritter's theorem that shows okay. that for n equals to three, the star will be unstable. Let's check that. Okay. And regarding the detection, we are running out of time. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just love it. Yes. So the, co the first comment was uh, already elaborated by Indrin. My second comment is that probably you should uh, also address the following question: that if you take a star which has not been discovered so far, yeah. If you happen to discover a star which is much closer than the S2 star to the supermassive black hole, then tidal effects will be stronger. Yes. And you can do a theoretical calculation predicting that in future, if someone observes, let's say, S2 prime star, which is very close, much closer to the black hole than S2 star, then the tidal deformation as well as tidal oscillation, because it's an eccentric orbit, it will set up a tidal oscillation whereby the orbital kinetic energy will go into the oscillated mode of energy, then there will be more observable effects. Yes, sir. There is one star S55, which is much nearer to the black hole. So in our recent work, we have done that. But did you take into account no, oscillation? No, we have not considered the oscillation. With eccentricity okay. would drive oscillation where orbital energy will feed into the internal energy. Next talk is by Amit Kumar. He will talk about environmental effects in galaxy clusters. Amit, um, have 12 minutes, so we will give you a reminder right there. Hi everyone, I'm Amit, working with Professor Surun More in the field of weak gravitational lensing at Ayuka. Here I'm supposed to present our earlier work, of, which was on environmental effects in galaxy clusters. So, talking about galaxy clusters. Uh, we think them as a collection of hundreds of galaxies. How does they look like? This is how do they look if you see them in only presence of barium component only. If you add dark matter on top of it, this is how cool the things look like. Now, at, a at the center of a typical galaxy cluster, you find a bright big galaxy, which we call the central galaxy of the cluster. And the rest of the galaxies in the clusters are known as the satellite galaxies. Now the thing is that there are various processes going on in the galaxy cluster, which can affect the evolution of these satellite galaxies. Why? Because these satellite galaxies are residing there and uh, orbiting there and evolving there. Okay. So what kind of effects which can uh, uh, which kind of effects are there which can 
affect the evolution of these satellite galaxies. Like there are effects like tidal slipping, which is very obvious, which can remove the mass mainly from the outskirts in, at first. And then there are effects, there are other effects like uh, galaxy harassment. Uh, what happens in galaxy harassment is like uh, if there is a spiral galaxy, uh, it uh, may go through multiple collisions with the other galaxies and uh, may turn out uh, into a elliptical galaxy. There is another effect which is called ram pressure slipping. What happens in that effect is like uh, the gas from the satellite galaxy is uh, removed and uh, which affects its star formation. Okay, so there are various effects which can uh, going on in this galaxy cluster, which can affect the evolution of this satellite galaxy. The question we are asking is that what is the effect of these environmental effect, environmental uh, scenario on effect on dark matter distribution around the satellite galaxy? Okay. So okay, the technique we use to answer this question is weak gravitational lensing. What weak gravitational lensing is? So everybody knows what is gravitational lensing. In gravitational lensing, there is a source, lens, and the observer. The light emitted from the source is deflected by the lens, which is present between the source and the observer. Okay, so there is a possibility of uh, seeing the multiple images of the same source. This regime is called strong gravitational lensing. There is another another regime of uh, lensing which is called weak gravitational lensing. Here you don't observe multiple images of the same source. Instead of that, you what you observe is the distorted image of the source. What I mean by the distorted image of the source is that if imagine there is a circular source, it will be amplified. That means it will be bigger circle and its shape will be distorted means it will be like ellipse. Okay. So here I'm showing you for demonstration, there is a figure. Uh, on the left, you are seeing there are multiple sources uh, which are shown in circular at first. So now you are putting a lens in front of them in the right figure and you are seeing that images of these sources uh, are getting distorted and these distortions are more if the these sources are close to it in the projective space close to the lens in the projective space and if you go far from the lens then these distortions die down okay so you can understand that uh, what you okay let me just go okay first thing is that before going to another thing uh, these okay this weak lensing is done statistically why you do you why do you do it in statistically is because see uh, i said that these sources are circular but in general galaxies need not to be circular they may they are elliptical so uh, what ha happens is then so okay just say that uh, okay uh, the galaxies are elliptical but they are randomly oriented because there is no preferential direction in the universe so if you average out the ellipticities of all the galaxies it should go to zero but now you are putting a lens in front of them. So what does the lens do is these distort all the galaxies in a coherent fashion. So if you average out the earlier case, it was going to zero, but now this will be non zero. That, that's what we see, what we measure in the big gravitational lensing. What, uh, what I'm again emphasizing, what we are measuring is the ellipticity. This is our signal, M means we measure the shapes in the sky. That's simple, okay. In order to, okay, before going the, uh, further, I'm showing you uh, here equation, which is uh, on the left hand side, there is some quantity on the right hand side, there is some quantity. On the right hand side, there is a quantity gamma t average, which is known as the tangential component of the sphere, which is related to the shape of these uh, shape of these galaxies. Okay. Another quantity, which is sigma grid, it is related to the distance between the source lens and the observer. Okay. On the right hand side, there is a quantity which is purely observable. On the left hand side, there is a quantity which is purely method, uh, purely, purely analytical. You can calculate the expression of delta sigma assuming some lens profile. Okay. Now, okay. And what I said in the earlier was that we want to understand what is the effect of cluster environment on dark matter distribution around satellite galaxies. When I say that what is the effect of dark matter distribution? So, okay. Uh, I said that uh, the mass more okay i might have not said that the ma more the mass of these lens more is the distortion in the shapes of these galaxies okay more is this distortion now we as we want to understand what is the effect on mass distribution we will be measuring the mass distribution that means the shapes around the satellites we want to compare it with something we will be comparing it with the galaxies which don't reside in galaxy cluster okay so the, we construct a catalog Okay, 
before going there, let me tell you. Okay, so I, we are doing weak radius lensing, and I said that in lensing you need source, lens, and the observer. And I said that we need to measure the shapes of the source galaxies. So you for the very good same measurements, we use a survey called hyper supreme time survey, which give you very good measurement of shapes of these background source galaxies. Okay, now there is source. You need the uh, lens around which you are uh, trying to see the uh, the distortion. The lenses we are using the satellite galaxy from one of the cluster finding algorithm, which is go, which is named as red mapper cluster finding algorithm. What this algorithm gives you is the the the, uh, the uh, catalog of satellite galaxies. We took the we take the satellite galaxies from this cluster and we see what this satellite uh, what is the distortion in the shape of these sources around these uh, satellite galaxies. Okay. Now the thing is that what I said is that we want to compare this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, distortion in background sources uh, around uh, so uh, this distortion in background sources. If you compare around the satellite with another kind of galaxies uh, which don't reside in the cluster environment, what do I mean by that is that so uh, so comparing the distortion around satellite and with another kind of galaxy will give you the difference between uh, difference or what is the uh, effect this cluster environment is causing uh, to own satellite galaxies. So we construct a catalog uh, which is no uh, of galaxies which uh, are not residing in cluster, but residing in a field environment. And we choose these galaxies from SGSS, but we make sure that these galaxies which are choosing from field are exactly matching to the properties of our satellite galaxy. By that, what I mean is that, See, we are matching these galaxies in the field and uh, corresponding to our satellite in UGRI Z band uh, the, uh, magnitude. That means we are matching them in photometry. Uh, means we are matching their stellar properties. Now we also match them in color. Matching in them color and magnitude makes sure that our uh, baryonic properties of our satellite galaxies and our field galaxies are same. Okay. Now anything which is caused will be uh, will be due to the, uh, the environment of the galaxy cluster and will be only on the dark matter because we have matched in the uh, baryonic component okay okay for the sake of time do i have time oh, for, so for, i will skip the uh, theoretical part means the modeling part uh, so that i can discuss the result so just remember that i am trying to prove the mass distribution effect so mass distribution effect around a satellite galaxy. Okay, mass around a satellite galaxy is composed of three components. Like uh, it is the baryonic mass of the galaxy, uh, satellite galaxy. It's the dark mass of the satellite galaxy, and there is some mass present due to the BCG. I said. So there is a central galaxy here, and you are looking at the mass distribution around this satellite galaxy. So there is some mass due to this galaxy around here. We are calculating the signal, I mean the, the those distortion as a function of distance from the satellite galaxy. Okay. Uh, as you are seeing that uh, if you are talking about these reasons, then the effect on the uh, the mass will be mainly due to the satellite galaxy only. Uh, if you are going close to this uh, uh, main galaxy, since the mass of the main galaxy is very higher than in comparison to the satellite galaxy. So this effect will be also there because of the main galaxy, the main galaxy which I'm calling the BCG. Okay, let me, okay. This is how qualitatively the signal around the satellite galaxy should look like. Now I'm showing you this signal for one parent satellite galaxy, means one, one satellite galaxy which is separated from the parent at with some separation, okay. Uh, and the characteristic of this separation is uh, something so, seen in this signal. Now there are many, many such galaxies. It's not like that we are looking at any one galaxy. We are said that we do it in statistical manner. So there are many, many such galaxies. So and they are at with different separation from the cluster center, uh, from the galaxy uh, cluster center. So now what will happen? This uh, this peak will be at uh, this kink will be at different distances from that. That's why you will uh, what you will see is that you uh, the the kink will uh, pass out and. Uh, uh, with only this and this hump which was being shown in the positive side will get broader because it is a combination, it is a stacking of multiple signals. Okay. So this is how qualitatively the signal, or this is actually the observed signal, uh, what the signal we observe. Uh, what I'm saying here is the in green dots, green stars is the, the signal around our satellite galaxies, which are having a separation of 
पॉइंट वन टू पॉइंट थ्री डिस्टेंस फ्रॉम अवर मेन सेंट्रल गैलेक्सी ओके फ्रॉम ट्वेल्व टू टेन सो ओके सो so what we see is that our measured signal is looking something like what we expected in the in our theory okay now the thing is that uh, okay so i skip the modeling so what i am telling you is that now we make a physical intuitive model for the satellite galaxy for mass distribution around the satellite galaxy taking into account various physical scenarios like uh, how much far this parent galaxy is uh, and what is the mass of the parent galaxy what is the mass of satellite galaxy what is the stellar baryonic mass of the satellite galaxy so we take all these into account and we model our signal we have a model we have the data so we use some ncmc uh, parameter estimation uh, posterior estimation and we fit the data so now you see that uh, the model our model is uh, uh, fitting the data quite well now the thing is that you need to consider three reasons so this reason is significant okay so the if i talk about this reason this reason here it is at very much closer to the center of the satellite galaxy so remember this axis is what from the center of the satellite galaxy so this reason is very very close Uh, to the satellite galaxy so here only the baryonic component of the satellite uh, matters now if you move forward it's the halo mass of the satellite and this is something which is the characteristic of the uh, the mass of the bcg which we are saying okay now we wanted to compare this distribution around this field galaxy let's see around the signal around those galaxy okay now the question was like uh, is the mass of four satellite galaxies same for the field galaxies or not Uh, we see the signal around the field galaxy you see that the signal around field galaxy is consistently about than the signal of the uh, the satellite galaxy and i said that the, this signal means this distortions are related to the mass of the lens okay so means if the signal is higher that means the mass of the field galaxy is higher than the satellite galaxy okay okay now the thing was that so uh, uh, so obvious thing is that the effects of the bcg on satellite should die down if the separation between the satellite and the bcg increases okay so we what we do is we beam our satellite galaxies in this radial beams means the radial separation beams means we are choosing once in the first thing i am choosing the satellite galaxy which are at a separation of 0.1 to 0.3 h inverse mega parsec from the cluster center in the right in, on in the second panel i am showing you 4.3 to 0.5 and uh, as you are going forward so what you see is that as you are going forward uh, in the uh, more in the separation of the uh, the uh, from the cluster center you are seeing the signal around the field and the signal around the satellite starts looking similar so you see this reason it was attributed to the signal mass of the satellite so this start looking similar so what do we mean by that so the obvious question is that so uh, we had matched them in baryonic mass now the, we are seeing that say, their uh, halo mass is coming different so that means is there some different stellar to halo mass relation for satellite galaxies and field galaxy and there is some another scenario also which i also talk about in briefly well uh, so okay so the, okay for the first case i said that the mass of the field galaxy is different than the mass of the satellite galaxy field i am saying the control center okay so you are seeing i am showing you the posterior of the mass distribution you are clearly seeing that the mass distribution for the field and satellite is different and as you are going far from the center this this is this effect is decreasing okay now uh, i uh, okay i will skip this Uh, one more thing i want to point out quickly is there is a very typical uh, very particular kind of the satellite galaxies which are which have lost all of their dark matter mass okay so we try to put a upper bound on the kind of these galaxies so uh, i said that there are kind of galaxies which have lost all of their mass which we call we call them the open galaxies so we said that there was a mass difference between field and the satellite now we say that our satellite has only two kind of sample only one is ejectively light field one is like which has all lost all the dark matter mass so now in this way if i transport that mass difference to this uh, equivalent i can put a upper limit on or the galaxy the galaxies which are lost all of their mass this is uh, the, that means we put a upper limit on fraction of upper galaxies so what are these open galaxies lose lose their dark matter mass because of multiple pericentric passes 
around the, around the BCG. So now expect that if the distance between the satellite and BCG is less, it is a larger probability that it will become open. If you go far, then there is less probability, which also we see in the trend that the uh, fraction of these galaxies are decreasing. This is our first our direct uh, limit on this kind of galaxies. I am overshooting, so I am I will skip. I will end here. Thank you. The speaker. Yeah, question. Anyone? Anyone from the participants? Just a quick uh, small question. Uh, in the uh, results that you have shown uh, near the galaxy center, there were two uh, observations that were very far away from your fit. Uh, what was the uh, what was your take on those two observations? Mm, sorry, I could not understand probably. So, could you repeat it again? Uh, if you go back to any one of your uh, mm -hmm. yeah, here uh, in the uh, first the top left mm -hmm. slot, uh, those two green mm -hmm. uh, observations are quite significantly uh, away from your field. So, what must be the reason? Okay, so some points you are saying uh, are so. What do we do is like so we we don't consider only a few points because there are certain uh, statistical errors. So see, you are saying that errors in, in points are quite large. So if you see as a whole, uh, like uh, 20 points for this uh, first bin, 20 for second, third, fourth, third, you see how many points are away from your border. The, you see it in the whole sense, uh, not like that. You don't go for individual point. You will see individual point might be even lower. See, the, this point is even lower than the uh, satellite. So you'd go is what is systematic, what is consistently, is it consistently higher or lower, not invisible because of parents. Thank you. So we'll take a break for tea. We can meet at 11.45 and then we will have just a little Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm a very bad speaker, so I don't know. I'm, I was able to... Say and make you understand what I was trying to say or not. now
नहीं खत्म नहीं हुआ अभी दो टॉप है बाद में आपके पास इसका रिमोट कंट्रोल है ना अभी सिस्टम का मैं वो गूगल लिंक भेज रहा हूँ आपको व्हाट्सएप कर रहा हूँ गूगल स्लाइड का आप उसको ओपन कर देना ठीक ठीक पॉइंटर आह यू विल बी द नेक्स्ट पॉइंटर इस देर सर्विस या नहीं नहीं दूसरा ओ 
Oh, this was so oh. <laughs> shit. <laughs> I don't want to be here. Can I? You can. Uh, okay, so when is your talk? Mine is last. Oh, no, no. Registration. Okay, so when you log in through Zoom, mm -hmm. I will ask. Um, yeah, I will ask Javed to allow you to share screen. Uh -huh. Just turn off your mic and join that. Okay. So, yeah. अरे जैसे वो मूव करा थी ना वो वो अच्छी पानी करा थी हाँ हाँ अच्छी मैंने क्या एक्सपोर्ट किया माय सपोज तो भी द सेकंड वन तो आफ्टर शाम सेकंड इस नॉट हियर he gave his talk. Last night. Why did he do that? I don't know. Just one day. Just one day. Just one day. हाँ मैंने भी इसी लेके हाँ मेरी स्वर्ग का पोर्टिया हो एक्सेस मार के जाते हैं हाँ हाँ आप ये वाला Okay, okay. 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 Uh, keep your mobile away because you are very angry. Yes, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was interfering with this one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hello. 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 Hello.
Yeah, that will try. Whether I have to be here or I will रिकॉर्डिंग अभी ऑफ कर दीजिए जब भी स्टार्ट नहीं करना कॉल करूंगा आपको स्टार्ट करने के लिए तो वहां पर Okay, so welcome back. Now we have a talk by Seven Javier. He will talk about an exact model for evaluating back black holes in cosmological space time. You have 12 minutes. So I will give you a reminder at 10. Can I start? Yeah, you can start. Uh, okay. Basically, it's a theoretical one. So, listen me up to this for 10 minutes. Then it will be fine. <laughs> okay. Already giving warning. So, I'm going to present an analytical model for black hole evaporation in a cosmology space time. Basically, this is the curve, the uh, figure, basically. Don't consider about this experiments, whatever the people are doing. No worry. Only we are considering the range for the for primordial black hole. We will be considering range from 10 to the power 15 grams to 10 to the power 50 grams. Basically, that means actually basic assumption behind this one is less than 10 to the power 15 grams would have been evaporated out for the current epoch. And the black holes, whatever be the black holes we are considering, are asymptotically flat space time, in asymptotically flat space time. That physically means that the black hole is isolated black hole. So, for evaporating black holes, as Patrick has been pointed out, then we can find Hawking temperature and entropy. Then Hawking temperature is universally proportional to mass, and this entropy is proportional to the area formed by event horizon. So, naively, a Hawking radiation metric, which
which is uh, represented by Vaidya metric. And the decay rate of corresponding metric is inversely proportional to mass square, which is equation number three. Okay, you can see that the decay rate is inversely proportional to mass square. So, for physical much more understanding, let's plot that one. So, just see this y axis is in the magnitude is increasing to the down direction. So, when we see the when the mass of the black hole is decreasing, the decay rate is larger. Physically means that when the black hole is smaller mass, it has higher evaporation rate. That means for the, it will be evaporate so fastly. This is the physical reason behind we are considering the less than 10 to the power 15 grams would have been evaporated for the current deposit. And we assume that the black hole is isolated black. Hole. So, but physically, we know actually we have seen so many the slides and all the black hole won't be isolated. It will be distributed by some mass. So we want to see how these rates will change for a black hole which is surrounded by some mass distribution. So for that, I am assuming this is the assumption we are considering. There is an action which contains Vicky scalar and the fluid, which in our case we are considering null dust and massive dust. Physically means that they won't exert any pressure, and null dust means it's like a photon field, the massless field. And we are considering metric of the form. Here theta is a conformal factor or scaling factor. Theta is conformal time and mass. This mass is a different upon time. And it is a basically which is the example for a cosmology. Basically, we can see this metric is in the expanding universe. So using those two assumptions, the previous assumptions, we will get two exact solutions. This is exact solution for dust surrounded black hole. So where this m of eta takes a particular form, eta decay by eta minus one, where eta decay is a constant. Then we will analyze its properties for the time being. Okay, we see that when eta turns to eta decay, the mass will be vanishing one. Hence, it will be Einstein Visitor Universe mass. It's a mass dominated one. Physically, means we we measure that time energy density. It will be proportional to t to the power four. And obviously, it has a singularity. And we are considering physically, this is the mass of the black hole. This is the mass of the black hole. It should not be negative. We are considering that is a positive. That is a one constraint. That is the constraint we will. That's a constraint we consider for eta. Eta should be less, uh, less than eta decay. So, the, uh, that's the physical properties of the metric. And apart from that, apart from that, we can study well, we can study the mission of Shabdhan and everything and Ricky tensor, the invariance we can construct from Ricky tensor and Riemannian tensor. But we are actually not interested in that one. Actually, we are interested in the decay rate, how that will change for our black hole. So, as the previous case I have pointed out, the short tail like black hole, it is this one, and we can integrate out how the mass decay with the time is in represented. But in the case of our black hole, in the equation number eight, the mass decays with the time, it uh, assume that uh, we did actually like that everything is a dimensional responding. That is, we rescaled everything. So the decay rate, the interesting thing is, the decay rate is proportional to uh, mass to the 10, 10 by seven, which is equation number nine. So this is equation for much better is we plot them together. So, this the blue one is a swash tail black hole. So as I have pointed, this y-axis, just keep in mind that part. Uh, keep in that part. Then we can see that in the swash tail, in the swash tail one, the mass decreases, the decay rate is large. However, in this case, we can see that when the mass is increasing, ma higher mass is higher decay rate. Why? This one, the lower mass is less decay rate. That's the from the right hand side, we, uh, left hand side we'll get. So the right hand side will give it how the mass decay with the time. Let's assume that initially our black plus larger masses. That time the cosmology black holes decay fast. This is the same thing the right hand side we'll get. When as Hawking radiation progresses, mass decreases, then we can see that at this point, as time progresses, 
the decay of mass decay of Schwarzschild is larger while the cosmological one is smaller. This is the basic thing we will get okay with. from this one. We understood actually if the mass if the black hole is surrounded by some mass distribution, the decay rate we have analyzed for throughout the observation will vary. And this we have pointed out those things the larger mass has a larger decay in the case of cosmological one, but Schwarzschild is the smaller one. There is a much difference, and we can see that this is actually first I'll read first. There is this puts a different constraint to consider the mass range for PVH. And we can see that hence it might leave a different constraint for primordial black hole to consider it as a dark matter. But this is a statement, but compared to that one, I can explain from, from the first figure so that you guys will understood it at the same is much more clearly. So our experiment, our analysis showed that this range should vary when we consider the black hole is in a cosmological space time. Particularly, we analyze this desk like one so that it should vary. And basically, many analysis states this range around 10 to the power 15 to 10 to the power 23, the PBS is a dark matter candidate. So that also will vary because this, this range we can extend. So that means actually those constraints also should vary when we consider black hole in a cosmology space. That's why. Is there anything? We are open for questions now. Okay. Slide number 10. Yes. And not in the area of the function. Ah. But at the point of uh, the search uh, mm -hmm. hole and the cosmological data frame, mm -hmm. the point, the coincide point, mm -hmm. are you equating the those two? Uh, no, we are the mass and, uh, and time and equating the uh, equations that way and finding out what it is. Equating means basically uh, this one is we are only we are focusing on the decay rate. Decay rate. Decay rate. Decay rate only. We are not considering considering particularly we are just assuming okay, let's have initially both have higher masses. Then how the decay changes. That's only because particular things is observational field. And particularly this is my matter dominated because the black hole is surrounded by some dust. And uh, so we can change that one because if we go for observational primordial black hole, we have to get the radiation dominated. Still, that is we have to find. Hey, is there any experimental evidence that uh, PVH no. exists? No, no, sorry. Anybody goes with the observation of one, then it will be good. It is surrounded black hole, obviously, physically, it is surrounded by the mass distribution. Right? So, if we get, then it will be good. It's on assumption one. Assumption in the sense of physical assumption. Physical assumption is stable. The observation only we have to see. Basically, okay. it's more concise, I can say. There is a constant, theta naught. We can assume that is our current time. This is the time which started. Okay, what will be the method that this time? Current time. So everything is there. Every data is there in the method. Observationally, we have to constrain it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So probably ask my last one. So the metric you are assuming is is for the current time, right? No, oh. it's uh, that you can observationally you can constrain. Okay, it's uh, just with the constants we okay. have not assumed any it's a constant then general general okay. you can go to the observationally you can construct and uh, another question was like any uh particular reason to take uh the pressure left uh, less cold or the dust that's there will there won't be any pressure okay. yeah there will be any no pressure because the dust particle will not yeah. interact with each other yeah. but like any particular reason not to uh not to take uh interacting fluid uh no no not we consider dust that includes all the fluid. When it's a fluid thing, I don't think so. We can we can't get it. Like uh, why I ask this because at the moment, whatever understanding is like whatever the matter we have around the black hole, uh, it exhibits a fluid phenomena. So like we can that we have to go because then the fluid means we have to get a pressure. Yeah, yeah, so that yeah. And uh, if we go, uh, 
that we have done. We are not able to do the process. Okay. Can you like that? We'll get the next part. Of next part. Okay. If the prime of PBS, they are built on the earlier epochs of the universe ah. when the universe of the radius and dominated one. Yes. Then, so then where there is no dust. Uh, radiation dominated regions. It's a thick thing. Okay. And energy density will be. I mean, I will say the red tip of 10 to power 7, 8. Okay. We have to see. If, so, analytical solution, if I am able to obtain, that is purely matter. Purely matter Just There is the, those two assumptions only will give this analytical solution. This is particular solution. We won't get any other solution. And it is not related to any. Formation mechanism, it is valid for uh, like whichever formation mechanism is valid for people. I am not sure. We obtained that for Einstein skill equation. We are not worried about any other. That's it. This is, let us thank the speaker again. Okay, so next talk is by Yashi Tiwari. We will talk about understanding large scale CMB anomalies with the generalized non, non minimal derivative coupling during inflation. Hello, I'm Similar to my previous speaker, I will also say that my work is a little bit theoretical, rather logical driven. So I would like to request you to bear with me <laughs> till the end. Oh, yeah. So, hi, I'm Yashi Tiwari. I'm a PhD student at IIT Bangalore. Oh, yeah. So, I'm a PhD student at IIT Bangalore, and today I'll be talking about my recent work, which is on understanding the large scale CMB anomalies using generalized non minimal derivative coupling, a big name, GNMDC, I will call, during inflation. And this work is done in collaboration with Nilanjan Dev Bhavik in the supervision of Dr. Rajiv Kumar Jain at IIC Bangalore. So the contents of my talk is as follows. First, I will talk about what is CMB and then what the CMB tells us about the model of the universe. And then what are these large scale anomalies that I want to address and how this JMDC model helps to address them. What are the distinguishable features of this model and what observational constraints we have on this model. And with this, I'll conclude. So cosmic microwave background, as everyone knows, is the fossil light from the Big Bang. And it is nearly homogeneous and isotropic and with a mean temperature of like 2.7 Kelvin. But there are some anisotropies in CMB, which are of the order of micro Kelvin. So the left hand side is the image of a blank sky. Um, so you can see the blue and the red dots indicates the deviations in the temperature from the mean temperature. And these deviations are in the order of micro Kelvin. And blue means cold and the red is the color coding red is the uh, indicates the hot temperature so and now the important observable quantity from these anisotropies is the cmb power spectrum which looks something like on the um, right hand side i hope that you might have uh, seen this somewhere in the course on cosmology so this this is a measure of the size of, uh, this is the measure of the two point correlation of these fluctuations as a function of the angular scale so on the y-axis, you have uh, temperature fluctuations, correlation, so it's in micro Kelvin square, and the x-axis is the angular scale, or they can be also uh, called in terms of the multipoles. So these anisotropies contain very crucial information about the evolution history of the universe, like what phases universe has been uh, till present. And it has been very precisely measured by the observations from Planck. First was OBE, and then followed by WMAP, and most recent by Planck. So now what present understanding of the universe we have from the CMB power spectrum. So as Patrick sir has already gone through this whole evolution phase of the universe, I will just wrap it up fast. So presently the cosmologists assume that the, uh, have well accepted this that lambda serum model. This is a six parameter model where lambda stands for the cosmological constant and serum for the cold dark matter is the well accepted model of the universe because it gives a very good fit to the CMB power spectrum uh, data points. So this model assumes that our universe is starts with the phase of accelerated ex expansion, which is known as inflation. And this phase plays an important role. It's because the, the seeds to these anisotropies in CMB were first laid during this inflationary work excel. And then 
there were set standard radiation dominated and matter dominated of works, and then the recombination from where the CMB starts to travel towards freely after being decoupled from the baryons. And then there was there was a phase of dark matter, uh, dark ages, and then followed by the birth of the first stars and the formation of structure. And presently, we are living in a phase of accelerated expansion, which is dark energy. And the simplest model to explain is the uh, cosmological constant. And this is the lambda serial model. So it's a six parameter model. Now, uh, then what are the CMB anomalies? So there are some issues uh, with the fitting that the lambda serial model provides to these data points. For example, this is the power spectrum, the temperature and isotopy power spectrum from the blank. And you see that the red points of the data points from the observations, and this blue line is a fit, which is given by the six parameters standard lambda serial model. So the model gives a very good fit. It's well, well accepted. But there are some anomalous features, some outliers in the data points, which are always being present there. And these are not explained by lambda serial till present. So to focus upon, uh, these are some points corresponding to this multiples. This multiples are uh, around 20 to 30. OK. I cannot position the pointer. OK. It's between 20 to 30. So these are some data points which are not explained well by the lambda serial. And these points, especially these points I would refer to, are always present in the observations. And these correspond to some really large scales of the order of the size of the present horizon. and and it's, it has been interest for the cosmologists to see that if what, what non-trivial physics, something or modification to some standard picture can help us to understand the presence of these outliers in the lambda uh, in the power spectrum. Along with that, there are some other anomalies in the CMB power spectrum, which corresponds to very small scales. So there are, so here you see the residual power spectrum, which is the lambda serum subtracted out of the data points. So here there are some oscillatory features starting around uh, multiple of 750, which are also uh, taken as a consideration that well, there could be some non-trivial physics uh, in the very early universe, which can explain these features. So yeah, uh, given that these are the CMB anomalies, so I will be focusing on understanding uh, some uh, these CMB anomalies around 20 to 30. So how people address these anomalies? So there are two approaches, because these correspond to some large scales, so first approach is through the dark energy models, but due to the lack of time, I will not go into that. So you can go to the references mentioned here. What I am focusing on is uh, modifying the dynamics of the early inflationary phase. Why inflationary phase? Because the anisotropies in the CMB was first seeded during the inflationary epoch. So if there is some non-trivial dynamics during the inflation, which can be imprinted in the primordial power spectrum, and hence can also explain the presence of these anomalies in the CMB power spectrum. So there are some uh, standard approaches that people have adopted, like modifying the potential of the inflaton field. So this inflation is a period of accelerated expansion. The simplest model could be a single uh, field, uh, single scalar field uh, inflation, and uh, which has a potential. And by modifying the dynamics of the potential, one can obtain some non-trivial features in the same power spectrum. Uh, so uh, not going into details, I will just go what is my method of addressing the CMB anomaly. So we are working on introducing an extra coupling as an extension to the single field inflation model. So this coupling is, uh, interact this is a coupling between the scalar field derivative and the Einstein tensor through a generalized coupling function, which is the theta phi function, which is the function of the scalar field. The scalar field is the inflaton because we are modifying the inflation, the dynamics during inflation. And I call this coupling as GNMDC, generalized non-minimal derivative coupling, just GNMDC because of the big name. So yeah. So motivation, why we are thinking of such coupling. So as first motivation is already clear, we want some non-trivial dynamics during inflation. So we want to explore it that if we have such type of coupling, what uh, new physics biologically we can do in the context of inflation. And these couplings are well uh, <laughs> explored in context of inflationary models. For example, formation of primordial black holes and all. So I have mentioned some references where such type of couplings have been well explored. And these couplings can be well realized uh, as some special case in the more general class of scalar tensor theory like Hondesky theory. And we are looking at the first time to uh, address the large scale CMB anomalies using such type of coupling. So um, I don't want to go into much of the equations, but for uh, 
for a comparison just to so that you can look at what changes come when we include such a coupling i draw a comparison between the canonical single spin model which is the simplest inflation model and what happens when we have inflation in the presence of this coupling so the equations for example the action itself has a uh, as a new interaction term this gnmdc term and because of which this uh, this thing is also imprinted in the friedman equation and the equation for the evolution of the scalar field so now all the equations also depend on the choice of the theta function, the coupling function we choose. And this makes these class of models phenologically attractive that if you decide upon, if you choose the theta function accordingly, you can have some non-trivial features in the dynamics during inflation. So this is what we will be doing. We will be focusing on choosing a theta function in such a way that we obtain some non-trivial features in the primordial power spectrum so that they can also explain the presence of the anomalies that are discussed in the CMB power spectrum. So our working model, so one thing is that because of the complicated dynamics, sometimes the th such theories where this GNMDC coupling is present can run into some inconsistencies, like some unphysical solutions or something. So to have physical solutions, we boil down to a condition that our coupling function should always be positive during the regime. I would request you to that those who are interested to know what are these inconsistencies and all, Please refer to my work because it is a detailed work and it would be very difficult to sum it, sum it up in a short time. So, in conclusion, just in the uh, final point is that the theta function should always be positive. And to ensure the theta function to be positive throughout, we make it up as a sum of two terms a global term and a local term. The global term to ensure that theta is positive throughout, even when the other local term gets negative. And this global term should also is also chosen in such a way that the strength of this coupling is decaying by the end of inflation because we do not want to disturb the standard reheating scenarios or whatever is happening after inflation. We wanted a local effect during the inflation itself. And the other term is the local term which will give rise to some non-trivial features in the primordial power spectrum. Uh, two moments. Yeah, I'll just conclude. So this term is like this. So it is a dip-like feature with a negative amplitude and where A1 controls the amplitude, phi naught controls the position where this feature will appear and it should correspond to some large scales. And sigma is the width of the feature. We want a local feature. So how this feature brings up in terms of the primordial power spectrum, again, not going into details here, the black dash line is the prediction from the standard lambda cerium, which assumes that the primordial power spectrum is a nearly scale invariant power spectrum. Now, in the presence of this GNMDC coupling during inflation, you have some non-trivial features, which are like a suppression at some large scales, with some decaying oscillations. And later on, these oscillations nearly superimpose with the prediction from the lambda series. Okay, so this is a small modification. And this type of profiles is also similar to the box, which have also tried to look the same CMB anomalies. But of course, this the dynamics from which the power spectrum, power spectrum is arising is complicated. So as there are some features in the power spectrum, so they will also be there in the C the residual CMB power spectrum. And the, you can see that the data points around 20 to 30 that I was showing as the CMB anomalies in my first plots are now well addressed by these green plots. So green are the GNMDC model for two, para, uh, two data sets. And these models are able to address these large scale anomalies uh, well. And there is also some improvement in the fit to the data at some small scales also. So to conclude first, uh, this is again when you have a model, you bring a model, you have some model parameters, then you want to find that whether these, what are the best fit para parameter constraints that you get from the observational data. For that, you do all the MCMC analysis. This is what we have done. We have some model parameters. We provide some priors, obtain some, uh, choose some data sets, and obtain the best fit parameter constraints on those models, along with the posterior distributions. So for details of the method data analysis methodology we have adopted, I would again request you to visit to our work. And with this, I'll just conclude that if we have some GNMDC type of interaction in the presence of, a, in, as an extension to the single field inflation model, it can bring interesting implication. And this is one of the implications, this is one of the toy model that we have worked out to focus upon understanding the presence of large scale anomalies in the CMB. And it has worked out well that we are able to get an improvement in the fit in comparison to the base model. And it would, in future, it would be even interesting to explore that uh, what other functional forms could be that could bring interesting implications in the inflationary context as well as in the dark energy context. Because in the dark energy phase could also be driven by a scale of field, and we could have some non-trivial dynamics during the dark energy, which could address 
some other issues like extra tension or sigma tension uh, of the universe. So thank you so much. Are these anomalies same energy to is it only in Planck or is it in ACT consistent with ACT and SPT data? Okay. So this is the Planck. So this only, is the same Planck. Only in the yes. Planck. They are not in the CMB measurements of the ACT and SPT. Uh, I am not sure, but I think they are in the Planck. Okay. And other thing is that it is related to the high L, right? So the met, uh, constraints on the metal density comes from a high L. Okay. So in your model, uh -huh. the constraints are same as the on the metal density I'm talking. So you uh, so you're talking about the effect of this feature on the matter power yeah. spectrum. No, only the metal density. How how are the constraints on the metal density? So like, are they part from the metal density? No, no. You metal mean those uh, omega the constraints on observation from the omega m and all? Yeah. Those parameters are nearly same as that of the lambda okay. I'm I don't have quoted here. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just quoting the best fit values for this uh, our model parameters, but of course these are also similar to what the plan suggests. So we are not disturbing anything in that context. Nice talk. Uh, I have a very nice question actually. So in the beginning of your slide, you have showed the temperature fluctuation but what is for the CMB anomaly. Um, right, yeah. So for around angular scale of one degree, there is a peak, right? Temperature fluctuation. So is there any physical reason behind that? So these this this whole thing is this indicates so all the peaks indicates some different uh, uh, about the different parameters of the lambda C model. So the first peak indicates that the universe is flat, and these peaks correspond to this baryonic ac the acoustic peaks. So yeah, so these are detailed things that we this this is what this uh, CMB power spectrum tells us about the different parameters of the lambda C model. I have a question here. So in your uh, model, you have two metric. One is small G major, and there is capital G major. Capital G major is the Einstein tensor. So this is the interaction that I am introducing. So the in terms of the so this is the interaction which is added in in as an extension to the canonical single field model, where the derivative of the scalar field is coupled to the Einstein tensor through a generalized coupling function. Yeah, but now due to Einstein equation, hmm. it is equivalent. Capital G mu nu huh. is equivalent to uh, 16 uh, pi G by C4 into T mu nu. Mm -hmm. We can feed in already. Yes. So okay. what happens is because now by instant equation, capital G mu nu, if you have, if you, are, are you taking lambda non zero? No, we are uh, uh, lambda, you are talking about the cosmology. cosmology, cosmology. cosmology. So these are just during the inflation. So this is just, uh, we are not uh, worrying about the, we are no, no. If there is a cosmology, huh. there is a course, cosmology. Capital G menu is mm -hmm. minus lambda small g menu mm -hmm. plus 8 pi g by c4 into t menu. Yes. And t menu means all the uh, contribution, yes. including your phi itself. Yes, yes. So this whole theory, mm -hmm. so not only theta of phi, mm -hmm. which is a parameter coming yes. in, but capital G menu has feedback from all possible matter, yes. including the phi. Exactly. So uh, but uh, uh, the choice of this function is such that whatever um, is happening is happening during inflation. By the end of the inflation, we are again going back to the canonical because the strength. So the <laughs> coupling uh, this choice of this theta function is such that this term, the contribution from this term, decay by the end of inflation. So by the end of inflation, you are again back to the canonical single field setup. It is by choice. By choice. By choice. It would be nice if it comes yeah. to solution itself. So. Yeah, yeah. That that would be an interesting. Is it an additional geometric term? Yeah, uh, logically, yeah, it's an addition. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we'll start uh, with the second session. So, first talk is by Sonic Mitra. He will be talking about global structure of general relativistic magneto hydrodynamic energy flows around black holes. <laughs> You have 12 minutes. Hello, we will give you Okay, it's fine.
Hello. Am I audible? Okay. So good good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Shomik, and uh, today I will be presenting my talk on global structure of general relativistic magneto hydrodynamic equation flows around black holes. So okay. So this is a brief outline of my talk, and particularly I hope all of you have been have seen this right hand side image. So. For me, this everything started back in 1918 when Heber Curtis actually observed in one of the night sky this curious narrow straight ray coming out of this uh, luminous object. And finally, we know that this object is the M87. And now at 2021, by the help of EHT and with the development of this advancement of computational techniques and all, we actually received this say, actually image, which actually represents the central heart of this M87. And which represents that there can be a possibility of the black hole setting here. Now, the primary motivation that our work is to observe black holes. Now, how to observe them? So, in order to observe black holes, we know that black holes are black and they do not emit photons, right? So, it makes them more challenging to observe. So, we will only use the indirect detection, which is due to the accretion or the infalling matter. Now, one can ask how this matter is infalling. That dynamics is governed by the gravity of the compact object, the magnetic fields around it. And as well as the radiation pressure. Now, this image, I think most of you have already been seen by EHT. They have been taken. Now, let us imagine that there is two differentially rotating layers which are rubbing against each other, generating frictional force. And when they generate frictional force, there can be a possibility of developing a viscous torque in it. And when a viscous torque is there, it actually leads at instability or turbulence, which can transport the angular momentum outwards, and accretion happens. Now, what is the source for this viscosity? Then? So, Sakura Sona pointed out there can be a constant alpha parameter, but there is a lot of debate that what could be the possible alpha is. Now, they have also raised a point that MLT turbulence could be a possible source for it. Now, this actually gets confirmed when Balbas Hawley showed that even a weakly magnetic field, if it is present within the differentially rotating disk, it can actually tap the energy of the differentially rotating motion and actually develop some kind of instability, which leads to a turbulence known as the magnetorotational instability. But not always black hole engulfs matter. Sometimes black hole can throw matter out in form of ultra relativistic jets. So this makes the understanding of accretion in a better way. So uh, my understanding is the accretion and ejection are the integral part of the system. So magnetic field can be a missing link, which can actually explain these answers. Also, we should think about that what could be the possible structure of the magnetic fields around these black hole sources. Do we really know it? We actually do not. So, we, I actually want to understand these two questions. Now, interestingly, last year we also uh, got the image from the EHT in the same M87 with the help of this polarization technique that this could be the possible structure of the magnetic fields, these imprints that you have seen. So, we just directly jump onto the problem in two different ways. One is the theory, another one is the simulation. Now, global geodimensional simulation nowadays, everything, it is very much popular. Why it is popular? Because they have a very wide library where they can actually access the hot turbulent plasma for a wide range of spin variations for any black hole sources. And they have so, shown that this image that the EHT group or EHT telescope, radio telescope has been observed, it has been fitted very well with their simulated images. But since we all are doing, most of us are doing or familiar with the simulations, we know that the simulations are dependent on these initial seed solutions, what kind of conditions you are putting. Now, if you change the condition, the final outcome will be changed. So definitely there, we have a significant scope to contribute as no steady state solutions were available for the GRMLD case. So what we are planning or what we did in our paper is that we developed a steady state accretion solution for this GRMLD flow for the first time. And we want to use our result to start a more realistic 2D, 3D GRMLD simulations with our initial condition. So this is a theoretical formalism for our work. So we have considered a axisymmetric accretion disk. It's a crude diagram that I have plotted here. So this is an axisymmetric disk. And mostly you, are, you can understand that this is in the equatorial plane only. So no theta motion. And at every radial coordinate, the, there is the particle equilibrium. So the disk is in particle equilibrium in both the directions, and there is no theta motion. And we are considering the ideal GRMHD approximation, which is actually suggesting that the magnetic fields are frozen within the plasma. So we are only considering the two independent components, that is the radial and the toroidal magnetic fields. And this is the general card metric we are solving for. And this is the governing equation, three governing equation that you can see. Now, the interesting part is only within this 
energy momentum tensor, which is actually showing, uh, telling us about the uh, general relativity or the matter part, as well as the Maxwell's part, which is actually contributing for the image. So these combine for the GRMHD case. Now, when we use all these simplified equations and all the uh, approximations, we come up with the six highly nonlinear differential equation, which we solve simultaneously. And we finally obtain the very first result, which is the velocity and sound speed profile. Now, you know that whenever you are far, from, far away from the black hole, matter has to be subsonic in nature. But when it comes close to the event horizon, it has to reach the supersonic. So definitely the flow is actually changing its sonic state somewhere here at the dotted point where it actually crosses the sound speed. Now for this particular case, I have plotted the global structure of this accretion solution, which is represented by the Mach number, which is actually the ratio of velocity and sound speed. So this uh, red solid line is actually the accretion solution, which is actually marked by this arrowed line. And the dotted line is actually the wind solution, which we are not interested in. And, uh, okay, fast mark, fast wave. So, yes, uh, so here then there is the density profile and the temperature profile. And from the temperature and density, you can see that the close to the black hole, if you go, you can see that the effects are much more stronger. And the temperature is almost of the order of the virial temperature, even it is crossing that. Now, the interesting point comes when it, you can see this aspect ratio. It is actually satisfying the particle equilibrium condition at every radius by satisfying that h by r is less than 1. Now, the interesting thing that comes here about the uh, equation of state. Here, we are actually using the equation of state developed by Inorin Sir and Ryu back in 2019. So, what it suggests that the adiabatic index is actually a function of radial coordinate. Now, why it should be? So, when the flow is far away from the black hole, the flow is non relativistic. So, gamma has to approach 5 by 3. Now, when the flow is very close to the black hole, it has to be ultra relativistic. That means it has to be 4 by 3. So, here you can clearly see that it is not ultra relativistic, neither it is uh, non relativistic, but it is somewhere no, uh, trans relativistic in nature for our flow. Now, also we have plotted this optical depth and it is showing that the disk is optically thin. And mostly, whatever photons we have, it is mostly uh, the radiation is almost getting away, it is not getting trapped. And these are all the magnetic field profiles, which I will be talking in the next. Week. So, yeah. So the interesting thing that we need to understand is what is the effect of magnetic fields when we change the magnetic field and what will be the effect on the on the solutions. So if you look into the first plot, the S1 curve, we have fixed the outer edge magnetic field as 3.55 and the solution passes with the near critical point. Now, as we change the magnetic field state, you can clearly see that the solution topology changes. And after a certain critical value of the magnetic field, the solution no longer passes to the inner critical point. It skips to pass through the outer critical point something. And this kind of inner outer critical point solutions remain largely unexplored in case of GRM. Now, people are mostly interested in the solutions which are passing through the inner critical point, which are known as the adapt kind of solutions. So, I am mostly explaining this magnetofluid variables. So, the first is actually the net magnetic field that is developed within the disk equatorial plane. And you can clearly understand the close to the black hole for a 10 solar mass black hole case. The magnetic field is very high, almost reaching 10 to the 6 gauss close to the horizon. Now, the similar quantification can be done if you just plot the plasma beta, which is the ratio of gas to magnetic pressure. And it actually shows that these, uh, throughout the domain, the uh, flow is gas pressure dominated only. Now, here, the similar results has always already been observed by the simulation domain for their 3D or as well as the 2D, 2D runs. So, here you can see that this is clearly showing the similar kind of patterns here. And also, now the question is, we have two components of magnetic field, uh, BR and B5, so which will be the dominating one. So we have plotted the pressure terms and we have seen clearly in the equatorial plane, the phi component of the magnetic field is much more dominated in nature. Now the major question comes whether the magnetic field, even with the, within the, with the absence of any internal st stress or any alpha profile, we have not put any kind of stress profile in our calculations, but whether we can see the angular momentum transport or not. So this E panel is actually showing the angular momentum profile. And here you can clearly see it is not very much, but it is in the subcapillarian domain, but still it is transporting. This value and this value is different. So that means it is increasing in summer. So how to quantify that how much angular momentum is getting transported? That has been done by taking the ratio of Maxwell stress divided by the gas pressure. So that will be effectively giving you what kind of viscosity will be developed within the this system. And interestingly, we have observed that it is coming as radially varying quantity. It is not constant. It is showing some the radial variation is there. And we have uh, done the literature survey and from there we have seen that several numerical results are available by Holly Crawley and even Avara in their GRMHD model and MHD models. They have shown these kind of profiles that exist. Okay. Now, 
why this magnetic, I mean, viscosity is developed. It is mostly due to the magnetic viscosity, right? So definitely there has to be a correlation between the alpha, which is the viscosity, as well as the plasma beta. And we have observed that for 5 to 50, or sorry, 8 to 50 uh, gravitational radii, the um, uh, power law index for alpha, this beta is this around uh, 2, 4, 2 by 5, which closely fits with the local sharing of simulation results. But when we are very close to the black hole, when the effects of gravity dominates much more, we have seen that the power law fit, uh, power law index is 7 by 5. That is quite new, which we report, and we feel that there is some hidden physics is there. It might be due to the transonicity of the flow. So, which we will look into later. So, these are some kind of power law profiles that we have also obtained for the analytical solutions, and we have just uh, seen that what could be the differences that we have get to. Okay. Now, the interesting part is earlier I have done the solutions fixing the outer edge of the disk. Now, if we start uh, from the inner critical point and changing the magnetic fields, so we have seen that the solution topology initially was open, but now it becomes closed. Now, what do I mean by closed? That means it is not connecting to the event horizon to the outer edge of the disk. Now, these kind of solutions are actually unphysical in nature because it is not getting connected. So, these kind of solutions are interested when you have a certain outer critical point passing branch, which is actually a, another transonic solution, but the flow cannot pass after a certain radius because the centrifugal force is coming to the picture and it actually puts a barrier there. So, there a shock transition can happen. And due to the shock transition, your flow can look like this. Suppose you have a cold matter which is coming from the outer side and it is getting actually a barrier and accumulation is there. There is a uh, density is getting higher, even the temperature and there is a jump in the shock or the shock is forming and the topology is looking like this. The inner region is getting hot and dense. So, this can be a source for the swarm of hot electrons, which you can call also a Compton cloud or, or a corona. So, for that, for the analytical case, you actually need to solve all these necessary shock conditions there. And we already have solved it for the GMHD case, for even for the rotating case. So, which we will be working on. And this is a particular toy model that we think that this should be there. And it is already there in literature. Remember, even Raj also work on this kind of thing. So, interestingly, there is a recent paper that our group wrote is that what is the importance of shock? So we have seen that if we have different spin of the black holes, the shock can actually extract some amount of energy wow. if the shock is actually dissipative in nature. So we have seen that for spin zero case, it is 1%. For highly spinning black hole, it is actually 4.4%. So we are estimating since we are getting shock for the magnetohydrodynamic case also, we can extract much more energy from this kind of shock. So we will be working on this also. So finally, this is my summary. And finally, I will end up by saying that the steady state solutions might not be very useful in explaining the turbulence or the dynamics of the disk, but it can be very useful in understanding or giving the potential source for the switch solutions. And we have seen that several results are actually matching with the simulation existing simulation results with our exact solutions. So definitely, this kind of steady state solutions could provide more realistic 2D, 3D geometry results uh, in near future. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You can look into here actually for the details of the work and you can find me here. We will take questions. And just a good thing, uh, like in all your conditions, is the jet production uh, possible? Uh, here we are not looking into the jets. We are only confining us within the equatorial plane. But yes, I mean, if we have this outflow kind of uh, thing, I mean, let's say, particularly if you see this kind of shock kind of behavior, if you have now with this shock, I mean, this is this work is actually in a very preliminary stage. This is the very first set of the work. So we are only confined the every set of equation and all that in the equatorial plane only and observing the inflows. Now we will try to input the outflow conditions because you have a possibility that from the coronal region where the shock is forming, from there, the matter can be extracted. So you can see, I mean, you can also see this cartoon diagram. So there is a possibility that the outflow can be generated there. Yes, we can do it, but we need to work it on. I haven't done it yet. Okay. Right, nice talk. So I, I, this is far away from my field, but uh, I, I would like to ask uh, if there is a, a shock uh, mm -hmm. in the places and vibration. So do we expect any uh, non-thermal emission from there? Uh, 
of the regime? So usually I am not very sure, but uh, from we these have a magnetic field also. Yeah, yeah, we have magnetic field. will compress the magnetic field. Magnetic yeah. Field, so there'll be synchrotron non thermal yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, synchrotron kind of thing. I have, I'm just working on it actually. I have implemented the synchrotron part now. So I, I mean, unless I know the results, I cannot tell you. But usually, if you have a magnetic field, there is a chance that you have synchrotron, obviously. And other than that, you have branch lung. So branch lung is anyway there, free free emission. But synchrotron emission, you can always have. In general, we see that accretion disk uh, like emissions are in, like represented by thermal models only. No, no, no. So, yeah. Yeah. So I haven't seen anyone talking about non thermal. I emission. think so, uh, synchrotron emissions are have been reported. Uh, um, not. Power law, power yeah, there is a power law tail actually. I mean, like new to the power minus alpha. Okay, this okay. kind of power law tail is there, right? Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, good talk. Uh, several issues. First of all, uh, first of all, you have a shock, right? Yeah. But you have not quantified what kind of a shock it is. Is it right. a fast shock? Right. Is it an intermediate shock or is it a slow shock? Unlikely it will be a slow shock, but it, it might be fast or intermediate. Okay. If it's a fast shock, then fast shock has this uh, this uh, property of generating transverse magnetic field. So now if you have you are coming with Br and V5, at the fast shock, you will be able to see some Vz as well. I mean yeah. so V theta. You should be able to measure what is the V theta there if you have shock. Okay. And once you have the V theta, then your production of jet is not much of a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, you could have just checked whether it is a fast shock or not. Okay. I mean, usually the kind of Mach number profile that I have taken, it is uh, the definition so from the quantify it. Yeah, yeah. Can't I understand. Yeah. Thing, right. Okay. Because the moment you say it's a fast shock, there will be ranges, right? Yes. There will be this something called the switch and shock. Okay, so you will have a fast switch and shock. So where you don't see and I mean sorry, sort of a bipolar magnetic field. Suddenly you will see if there is a shock, there is a bipolar magnetic. In in solar MHD, people always see, see this kind of fast, slow. If it is slow shock, then it's a problem. It will just switch off the magnetic. Field. Okay. Okay. So these kind of things are there. So in MHD is extremely complicated. Yes. So you know that mm. so that's number one. Number two is the issue that's the reason I did not pursue MHD uh, MHD uh, around black holes. I shifted to uh, MHD around white dwarfs and neutron stars because of the inner boundary field. I see that you all your magnetic field, the BR actually, yes, it is increasing near the horizon. Yes. My third student, yes. Kuldi, who started it and we, we stopped it and we were shifted to neutron star because you see the magnetic fields are approaching, are increasing towards the horizon. Right. Of course, you have a car metric, so there is a coordinate singularity, you cannot reach up to the horizon. Hmm. Okay. But so that we don't know per se what's going on. But uh, looking at the trend, it is increasing. Hmm. So that means magnetic field is entering the black. If it enters, then D right. is zero. Okay, so there's something has to come up. Yes. If that is the case, then you are questioning the no hair theorem. Okay, that's profound. You must understand that, right? Yes. So therefore, if uh, no hair theorem is correct, then the magnetic field has to die near the black near the black. So ideal MHD is actually not very proper yes. way of doing it. It has to be resistive by yes. but then again, what kind of magnetic field you start to also determine what kind of, I mean, you know, magnetosphere you will have. There are two issues. Mm -hmm. okay. One is in this particular case, you can definitely look at for the jets. That is definitely there. Okay. The second case is very, very complicated. Okay. Uh, you'll see, I mean, you, I, I think you have heard about it, about Blanco's night, yeah. right? Blanford knew about this problem. So what he assumed is that the horizon is behaving like a conductor. So all the magnetic fields are coming and sort of, you know, skirting yeah, the yeah. horizon and not actually entering. Mm -hmm. 
So he had this this argo sphere to generate whatever he gener wants to generate. There are some other problems with Blanford's max mechanism. That's a different matter. Okay, but what I'm trying to say is that the horizon issue is very, very complicated in the case of Blanford. The third issue is the measurement. So okay, we can discuss it because we are running out of time. No, I mean, I can just tell you, I'll just think about it. Okay. It's, it's around 30 gauss they have measured, right? Yeah. 30 gauss they have measured around uh, 7 or 5 social radius. Yeah. Okay, 30 gauss. So, how much 30 gauss is supposed to be dynamically measured when the matter is actually entering with a lot of, you know, kinetic energy? Okay. Um, but I feel, um, yes, uh, but that is for 10 to the power 9 uh, uh, solar okay. mass. But for we discuss it on lunch, we are running out of time. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. So, next talk is by Stacey Priya. She will be talking about impact of instability driven shocks on the multi wavelength nature of the alien jets. Hello. Um, I, uh, I have one <laughs> So uh, I'm Shriya from IIT Indore. So I'll be talking about the multi wavelength nature of uh, aging jets through numerical simulations. Now, in the previous talk, uh, given yesterday also, we have heard a lot about uh, what is this AGN and the different uh, properties of the AGN. So in the background, I have Okay, so in the background, we have uh, sorry, which one is the back one? The background, we have an artistic image of an AGN, uh, so I'll not go much to the details of it. So at the center, we have a supermassive black hole, then surrounding it, uh, surrounding to it, we have this accretion base, PLR region, and etc. Then from the center, uh, center of this uh, uh, galaxy. So as we as I was talking about the AGN, so it stands for the active galactic nuclei, and it has a jet which is uh, almost like lying uh, perpendicular to the underlying accretion disk. Now a class of the AGN where we have this uh, jet which lies along our uh, line of sight that is known as blazers. Now there are several properties and there are several questions about these blazers that we are still uh, like we are we are working to answer to it. So like, like the formation, the matter composition, the multi-time scale variability, the uh, multi-wavelength emission that we are seeing, sometimes we are seeing the correlated emission, anti -correlated. So there are lots of lots of questions that we still have. And we are, we in the sense, the AGN and the Blazer community, they are working on it to answer, answer to those questions. Now, but uh, like in my work, what is my, my main aim is to study the impact of the MHD instabilities on the jet dynamics and the emission property. So these jets, when they pass through the intergalactic medium, it suffers to multiple MHD instabilities. So what MHD instabilities, such as kink instability, sausage, or Kelvin much instabilities, depending on the uh, surrounding, depending on the jet properties, etc. So my goal is to understand how these in, uh, instabilities are affecting the jet dynamics and the observed emission features, such as the uh, variability or the multivariate emissions, etc. Now, in this case, here I have shown a uh, uh, model, like a uh, kind of a model for this uh, blazer emission. So, where I am mainly focusing on uh, this region, uh, basically the propagation region, because this jet has like the launching region, the propagation region, and then we have the turbulence part. So, I think Shamik, what uh, he talked about, it's more of a close to the launching region. I will be focusing on mostly the propagation region and the termination region that includes this uh, lobes and everything. So what I aim to study is uh, there is this, uh, because of the presence of the MHD instabilities in the jets, there is the generation of the shocks and how these so shocks are affecting the multi wavelength observation. That, that, that was the title of my talk. Now, since I was uh, also that include that, I will be talking about this through the numerical simulation. So what what we meant by that, so first we need to set up our model. So we need to have our data so that we can understand from those by analyzing the data, we can understand whatever we aim to study. So what we used for, uh, for our simulation, we have used the relativistic module tool of the Pluto code, 
which would help us to simulate the, our uh, dynamical system. Then we use the hybrid framework of PIL, which has uh, basically where we incorporate the particles. So particles are uh, basically, you can think of like a representative of electrons uh, uh, and where we estimate the different kind of emission which are relevant for the blazer study. Then what we did, so we cannot simulate from like the, from the launching to the termination point. So what we did, we basically focus on a particular section of the jet. So we simulate that particular section of the jet and we try to understand the observed emission problem. So in the right hand, uh, so how we simulate is that we have to initialize our run with the different problem, with the different jet properties. Like we initialize with the magnetic field, the pressure, the density, and all the uh, properties of the jet that we have to put it in, in our simulation so that we have a realistic, kind of realistic jet in front of us. So what we did, we simulate a particular plasma color. So where we gave a velocity in the z direction, that uh, these are all the initial conditions. That is, at t equal to zero, we gave all this initial. Now we can see that. So after like uh, giving all the magnetic fields, density, pressure, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so we have this our simulation. We have this plasma column where we have the velocity in the z direction. So initially we do not have the velocity in the x or y direction. So what we did, since we were interested to study the impact of the instabilities, so what we do is basically we put up the system with a radial kind of perturbation. We like provide a, the system with a radial perturbation. So we yeah. have provided a kink mode perturbation. So what it does, so when, um, like for the plasma column, when we provide the perturbation, what it does is that it will uh, displace the plasma column from its initial axis. So with evolution in the right hand side, I have shown the, it's a movie of the evolution of the jet density with the magnetic field lines. So what we are seeing that also positrons. No, we have currently mm -hmm. considered only electrons. This no, is the, the to compose. It should be electrically neutral. Uh, net, okay. Uh, charge of the jet uh -huh. should be neutral. And consensus is that the jets are electron positron, not electron proton, okay. but electron positron. There so that's the last I knew of. Okay. The, the matter composition of the jet is still yet. Uh, I mean, we are not very sure about it. But most of the dominant emission mechanism, when we uh, when we estimate the emission, it's mostly considered to be the electronic. I mean, electronic has been given a very much uh, uh, what I say. It's like a positive uh, reply to say that we can have the electronic composition. Yeah, the positrons are also electrons, right? Yes, it, those are. But mostly we are calculating the emissions due to the electrons. And in this case, we have. I mean, the dynamical simulations that you are saying here, we are considering only the plasma. I mean, the ions. Yeah. Positrons, if they are there, huh. they'll do annihilation with the background IGM. That might affect the dynamics. That's why I asked. Yes. Okay. So that might affect the dynamics. In this case, what we have considered the dynamics as like, we are mostly focusing on only the uh, only to the jet. Uh, but th that will affect it in the case of when we are estimating the emission, right? Or will it affect it when we are considering the plasma uh, evolution also? It should also... Uh, because the density, net density is changing, right? Okay. Net density is changing because of the animation. Okay. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll just think about it and uh, can give you an answer if uh, how it is affecting the run. Okay. So as I was saying that uh, after applying the skin mode perturbation, so we have, this is like the evolution of the plasma column that we are seeing. Now we can see that with evolution of the instability, the plasma column is getting distorted and the plasma that we have inside this that is also kind of getting distorted and somewhere it is getting turbulent along with the magnetic field line. And those turbulent region can give rise to the production of the shocks and how these shocks are affecting the emission that I'll be discussing further. Now, since we have, this is like we did the simulation, we have our data. Now we aim to understand uh, the emission that we are getting. Now, since we are interested in the emission, so first we need to calculate our, uh, this is like the setup where how we are calculating our synthetic emission from the plasma column. So in this work, we are mainly con uh, like uh, concerned about the electronic processes like the synchrotron and the external counter because these are like the one of uh, these are the most uh, relevant emission mechanisms that we see in the blazer case. Now, one thing one I need to mention, I want to mention over here is that when I talk about the hybrid hybrid framework of this uh, Pluto code, it, uh, it it already had the synchrotron and the ICCMB push uh, ICCMB emission. So in my work, we have incorporated the external counter mechanism where we consider that in the right hand side, I have shown some cartoon representation of this. 
where we consider that our external photon field is lies beneath the uh, emitting region of the blazer. So we consider, and along with some other uh, assumption also, I'll not go to the details of it. And uh, what other our synthetic uh, modeling includes is like the multi-zone approach. So which, what I can say that uh, multi-zone approach in the sense, we have this in our simulation box, different grid cells. So each grid cell has a different magnetic field, has a different pressure, has a different density and et cetera. So for us, each grid cell is, is acting as a single emitting region. Along with that, we have also considered the relativistic and the geometric effects such that we estimated the emission in the observed frame. And we have taken into account the light travel effect while calculating these emissions. And these are like some sort of uh, details when we are estimating the emission. I don't think I have much time, so I'll just go faster. Now, what? Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'll go to you more fast. Okay, so this is where I'm showing the multivalent light curve. So what we have done, we have estimated the synchrotron and the external Compton emission uh, from this uh, particular plasma column by considering an observer making a five degree angle with respect to the axis of the column. So in short, if I want to explain, so here this uh, yellow shaded region that we are showing here, uh, it's basically to indicate a region we are where we are seeing uh, some sort of activity in the different uh, frequency band. Now you can see that in the upper to like 1.443 and in the 10 to the 20 hertz, we do not see much of like interesting feature. Whereas we can see in the R band and 10 to the 17 hertz, we see some sort of kind of uh, outburst kind of activity in the at, at some point at some time of the simulation. Now, when we estimate, as I was saying that we will see the effect of the shocks on the observed property. So what we can uh, when we estimate what is the size of the emitting region for this energy band where where we are seeing this outburst kind of activity we see that the size of the emitting region that is like a few tens of grid cells okay out of the total number of grid cells that we consider in our simulation box that means this kind of activity that we are seeing uh, seeing over here is due to the localized uh, shocks the, those are produced because of the turbulent nature of the plasma column which is due to the presence of the mh3 instability now such impact of this you know, uh, the pr production of the shocks, we also see when we estimated the uh, the uh, spectral uh, energy distribution. So what we are seeing that, we can see that wherever we are seeing this outburst kind of activity, during that time, we are seeing a flattening of the spectra. And that flattening of the spectra is because of the production of the shocks. Now, because those shocks will generate highly energetic electron, and those highly energetic electrons are responsible for the flattening of the uh, spectra that we are seeing over here. And similar kind of uh, results we have also like uh, observed uh, previously from different kind of numerical simulations and observed uh, observational uh, signatures also. Now for the, uh, what we are seeing that uh, whenever we are seeing this transient activity, the emission where we are getting this outburst, those are, those are coming uh, like prior to the emission when we are getting the, in the lower radio bands or the X-ray band. That means the highly energetic uh, electrons, which are produced due to the shocks, they emit in the X-ray and the optical band. Then they lose their energy, and then they fall. Uh, like following it, they they are like emitting the synchrotron radiation in the radio band. And further, those lower energetic particles can get upscattered to the high energy and give emission in the gamma ray band, which is typically that we are getting from our uh, from this work. Now, the last uh, important uh, thing that I want to convey over here when we are talking about the production of the shocks is that what we see, um, okay, so you just forget about this plot. Uh, so what we see over here is that whenever there is production of the shocks and there is this transient kind of activity that we are seeing, in the typical SED of the blazer, one of the main question is that the X-ray emission, where the X-ray emission is coming from. So what we see that when there is an outburst or when there is the production of the shock, the X-ray emission is mainly dominated by the synchrotron one. But when the shock is getting, I mean, the uh, the uh, shock is uh, going and the particles are like, the, the particles energies are getting decayed. And we can see that the external Compton emission is the one which is dominating, uh, which is the most uh, one which is contributing to the uh, X-ray emission. And similar kind of results we will, also see in the further uh, uh, presentation by Sushmita where, but uh, in that case, she was mainly focusing on the short term case. And for me, it was mainly uh, to focus on a very broad or a long term scale or the long uh, long scale of the aging. Now with this, 
I okay, skip that. So the summary was that uh, when we focus on a very long term scale of the jet or a long term uh, long time scale, we can see that this uh, shocks that are produced due to the evolution of the MHD instability, they could give rise to the outburst or a flaring kind of activity in the uh, life curve. And that will also get impact in the spectral SED when we are seeing a flattening. Uh, we can also see the SED when we see the flattening of the uh, spectra in the X-ray or the optical band. So with this, I, yeah, I would like to say that this work is done in collaboration with uh, the paper and currently it's under review. And definitely the youngest organizers of this conference for conducting it in Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I have just a quick yeah. question coming. Yeah, so it's a very significant work because you are correlating with the multi wave band uh, observation. So, the reason I pointed out over positrons mm -hmm. is that if you don't take positrons into account, just electron jet, apart from the magnetic field, you have to also include the electric field. Yes. Because you have only negatively charged particle outflow. And then you can't use MHD because MHD approximation is the net electric field must be zero. Yes. So probably what you might not have stated it, including positrons is not a problem because as far as, except for the annihilation part, all other properties of the positrons is same as the properties of the electrons, except that positrons would be annihilating with the IGM. But the IGM density might not be very large, annihilation rate might not be very large. So, but for the consistency, you need to include positrons so that your plasma is neutral, electrically neutral. Otherwise, you'll produce electric. So I, I would like to like add one comment to that when we are talking about the electric field. So we actually, when we did the setup, uh, so the first, like the system has to be in the equilibrium initially when we are starting with it, right? So we tried like, we uh, like indirectly, we wanted to see is there any effect like in the radial profile of this electric field, if we are like changing the equilibrium conditions or anything. So there was like quantitatively, we were not seeing much difference for the, right now the equilibrium conditions that we have taken. So with that, uh, we were not seeing much difference in the, like even if we have this electric field or any impact of the electric field in the oh, dynamics. Yeah. No. Dynamic field. Okay. That's, not, uh, that's not the point. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably you have taken a, uh, is it a relativistic point? It's got a relativistic yeah. So probably you have taken an equation of the yeah. rho squared plus gamma p by gamma. Yes, yes. It does not contain, so it uh, assumes yeah. it's charge neutral. Okay. Yeah. Either it's okay. by protons or by electrons. It's by electrons. Okay. But I have a just clarification, one okay. clarification. Okay. Clarification is in the simulation, I did not see any shock forming. Where are oh, the shocks forming? Uh, those uh, that is because I have shown it's a 3D random, uh, basically a 3D rendering one. So if I if I can see that the pressure pressure plot or the density, we will see most of the uh, we will see so, so it's uh, mostly in the region where we are where where we are having this kink instability. It's uh, the curved cases there where there we are seeing the shocks. I mean I have not shown the plot over here. If I can like show you later on the pressure plot or something, it is more over where we are having the maximum magnetic pressure. Or the B5 is the strong one, mostly the pink region, we are getting the shocks there. Good question. Very quick. Hi, Chair. Nice talk. I'm saying uh, yeah, we can also see in your uh, plot that uh, in uh, low frequencies, also there are some uh, like variability, right? What is the time scale of that? Oh, okay. I couldn't uh, follow the, the, the time scale of variability over there. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, I don't remember much, but it's definitely the time scale is getting increased when we go to the radio to the far one, uh, because uh, maybe the exact time if you want, I can just see the paper and tell you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. But here we are, uh, the each data point is correspond to like in, in our simulation is four months in data. So whatever the time scale we have. So that's why I was saying that it's a very long term, uh, long time scale thing. Thank you. Okay, so next talk is by Subhar Ripori. He will be talking about bounce on the ultralight bosons from the event horizon telescope observation of Sagittarius A. Right. Okay.
the way of the So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, if anyone is feeling sleepy, then good night. Okay. So, yeah. I'm Subhadeep Bhavi. I'm a second year PhD student from IIT Bangalore. And my the topic of my talk is bounds on ultralight bosons from the event horizon telescope observation of Sagittarius A star. So this work is based on this uh, preprint, which is currently under review. So this is the basic outline of my talk. Firstly, I will be talking about GHT observation and super radiance. And then I will show you how to use those to put bounds on non-interacting ultralight boson masses and how to put bounds on exion decay constant. And then I will conclude. So uh, this is the in May. I mean, in May this year, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration revealed the first image of the Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. So here in this dark region, uh, yeah. So this dark region is encircled by this uh, yellow ring. So this dark region is called the black hole shadow. So how does this shadow form? So when lights uh, passing uh, near the black hole, they get deflected by the gravitational strong, strong gravitational field of the black hole. So what we see here in the left picture is the 2D projection of the lights, deflected lights coming towards that. So there is a direct correlation of the size and shape with the mass and the angular momentum of the black hole. So from the HD uh, observations, we know that the mass of the Sagittarius Easter is nearly 4 million times of the solar mass, and it is a rapidly rotating black hole. And also the car parameter, which is defined as the ratio of the black hole angular momentum and the mass of the black hole square multiplied with this gravitational constant. So this car parameter has, uh, I mean, the car parameters uh, 0.5 and 0.94 have passed all the HD constants. So what they have done, they have taken various simulation models and they have matched with the data. So these two values actually pass all the HD constants. So we, we will use these values for our further discussion. Okay. So now the question is, can we use this Sagittarius A star as a natural cell laboratory to search for ultralight particles that can be created by the vacuum fluctuations around the black hole? So the answer is actually yes. So it can, in principle, rotating black hole uh, can source clouds of weakly coupled bosons through super radiance. So I will be talking about super radiance. And it is possible to search these particles only using their gravitational interaction. So what is super radiance? So let's suppose an uh, electromagnetic wave is incident on a conducting rotating object which is rotating at an angular uh, which is axisymmetric and which is rotating at a con constant angular velocity so in principle if the uh, incident wave has the angular velocity less than this uh, rotating object's angular velocity then after scattering it can extract energy and angular momentum as a result the spin of the i mean the angular momentum of this rotating object will decrease so same thing happen can same thing uh, can happen for a black hole rotating black hole so if there is a uh, wave so the thing is that if there are particles around the wave, uh, around the black hole, so we can associate a field for every particle. So now uh, we are taking a uh, classical field equation of these particles, and we know this field equation is like a wave equation. So it turns out that the, if the mass of these uh, particles is less than the uh, uh, angular momentum of uh, angular velocity of this event horizon, then it can extract energy and angular momentum from this black hole, and as a result, the uh, spin of this black hole will be depleted. So now the thing is that uh, we can uh, talk about these particles. So let's take a uh, simpler case. We will be talking about these particles with a spin of zero. So and, and these are not interacting. So how to find the general equation of motion of these particles? We have to solve the klein gordon equation in the background of carbon. Okay. So after the solution, we can found this is the remarkably uh, this is remarkably similar to the hydrogen atom solution. You can see here. So here MLM are the uh, as usual principal quantum number, orbital angular momentum quantum number, and azimuthal angular momentum quantum number. But the thing is that the here the eigenfrequency we can find uh, we can find here. So it, it, in principle it can be complex. So if the imaginary part here, if it is positive, then it can rise to exponential growth of this eigenfunction, right? So uh, this is the uh, difference. And one important thing is that. This, uh, if the particles have mass, it can source the gravitational potential barrier. So what happens? It will act like a mirror. So it can reflect back the already amplified wave back to the black hole, and it will trigger the super radiant system. So as a result, the amplitude of the will of the wave will increase, and the spin of the wave will further decrease. 
but it cannot happen for an infinite long time, right? So there are certain conditions which have to be satisfied. And we, we, we can exploit these conditions to put bounds on mass of this particle. So how to do that? Uh, let's see. So we have seen that uh, that the if the eigenfrequent uh, if the angular uh, velocity of this particle is less than the uh, angular velocity of the uh, event horizon, then there is a super radiance happening. So here the aim is the uh, dominant aim is the as a usual quantum number we have seen here. So what happens that NLM has the uh, this NLM has the value two one one for the uh, dominant growing mode. Okay. So here, uh, if m equals to one, then actually uh, it's simply omega less than this uh, this angular velocity of the event horizon. So uh, a detailed analysis shows us that this uh, omega is approximately equal to the mass of this scalar, and this uh, capital omega h we can found using this e equation. So this a star is the cast parameter, and we the g n is the uh, gravitational constant, constant, and m b h is the mass of the planet. So from the event horizon uh, telescope observations, we know this the mass of this black hole of the Sagittarius A star, and we can take A star equals to 0 0.95 for, for our first case. So we have seen here that for satisfying this condition, we have found this mass range. So here the actually is electron volt. So we have found this in the allowed mass range. Okay, so there is a second condition also. <laughs> so what happens that uh, when uh, matters are accreting into the black hole, it forms a disk, right? So this super radiance is the energy extraction process, and this accretion is the energy injection process. So the rate, the rate of the super radiance would be higher than this accretion uh, energy energy injection mechanism. So this relation actually this is the instability time scale of super radiance will be less than the characteristic time scale of black hole. So what does it physically mean? Physically means that when the super radiance is happening, the growth rate I mean the growth will happen if the black hole is not evolving as well. I mean the black hole is nearly constant. I mean, it is not accreting that much. So this relation tells us about that. So we can found that uh, this using some analysis that this tau is related to this uh, equation where gamma is the instability growth rate. And here this uh, mu is, is the mass of the scalar. And delta S is the spin depletion from 1 to A star. Okay. The S star can be the magnitude, uh, magnitude of the S star is always between 0 and 1. And the tau BH, if we calculate analytically, we, we find that it is 10 to the power 14 years. That cannot happen because it will exist in the, before the birth of our universe. So for a conservative choice, we have taken tau BH as 5 into 10 to the power 19 years, uh, 9 years. And using this relation, if we put this equation, we can find like a this equation, the, the mass of the scalar. Okay. So now the thing is, we have found this. And the mass of the black hole is 4 into 10 to the power 6 solar mass. And A star equals to 0 0.95. So this is the allowed mass range here. The axis is in electron force. So from the first condition, we have seen that uh, this is the allowed mass range. From the second condition, we have found this is the allowed mass range. So if there is super radiance, this is the common region, right? So now the tricky thing is that there is no smoking and signature of the super radiance of Sagittarius A star. So we are assuming that the spin is not depleted by a super radiance because we don't know the history of the uh, black hole evolution, right? So if there is uh, no spin depletion, via super radiance, then this is the excluded mass ratio. Now we can repeat this analysis for a, another raster 0 0.5, and we have found this, this precision is actually narrower. So, and we have repeated this same process for another particles for vector and tensor particles. So here A star is the 0 0.5 and uh, dark shade is 0 0.5 and the light, light side here is A star equals to 0 0.94. So to keep the long story long, so if there are particles around the black hole which are created uh, for the vacuum fluctuations, so the their mass range cannot be in this uh, in this region. Okay. So this is a this blue region is uh, found by Unal et al. So they have found uh, using different techniques by different black holes. So this is a kind of complementary chain. Okay. So these are the numerical values of this bound. So you can see here. So mu 19 here is the uh, mass of these particles divided by 10 to the power minus 19, 19 electron volt. And here it is a star equals to 0, 0 0.94 and 0 0.5. So we have talked about the uh, non-interacting particles, but uh, due to the lack of the time, I am telling about this uh, in a very short for the self-interacting particles. So if there is self-interacting particles, we have uh, done this analysis for axion-like particles. So this is a promising dark matter candidate, which is a pseudo, uh, pseudo scalar, you know. So we have found that uh, if the, if there is if there is 
epsilon in this mass range so their self interaction cannot uh, fall into this range so y axis is the self interaction uh, strain so that is equals to 1 by their decay constant f here is the decay constant and x is x axis is the mass range so we have found that uh, if, if if there are axions they cannot be in this region so we have found a little parameter space which is very little but we have found something new right so yeah so to conclude it using the lightest observation of Sagittarius system by event horizon telescope we constrain the ultralight boson masses assuming that the black hole spin has not been depleted by super radiance and for ultralight light axions which is a self interacting gas we prove a new region of its decay mass so thank you Thank you for being on time. We have time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not into this business, so I'm, I cannot uh, tell you anything uh, conclusively. But why did you take a Klein Gordon equation and not a Dirac equation? Because, because uh, we are take, uh, we are considering here the bosons actually. So this is a scalar particle. So case of the Fermion is that the D, uh, the Pauli fusion principle comes into the picture. So for the degeneracy principle, you need a large number of uh, large number of different fermions, which are like uh, mass degenerate cases. So that is quite complicated. But they, people have done it actually. So uh, since you're talking about those pseudo scalars which are being produced spontaneously due to vacuum fluctuation, yep. so they'll be produced in pairs. If they're because a single pseudo scalar cannot come out of that, yes. it has to be yes. produced in pairs. One pair will go into the black hole, the other pair will contribute to the super radiance. So the, the, one of the pairs which is going into the particle, it will do exactly opposite of what is the other. Uh, so have you taken into account that one of the partners is actually going into the black hole? Uh, the, the, the other, mm -hmm. which is escaping, that would contribute to the super radiance. Yes, yes. But what about yes. the one? To the black hole. Uh, that that I have to think about it. I will not make any comment. I can discuss with you. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Now we'll move on to the last talk of the session. Thank you. 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 Should I share my screen? Yeah, yes, share my screen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello. Oh, come on. Can you just come point to put it on? Mm -hmm. I have to change slides with this. No, no, you can use with this one. Oh, well. okay. Oh. Okay. Good, good. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sushweta Agarwal, and to my team, board, and the, the talk for my today's talk is going to be on pairing activity to magnetic reconnection in BLRJ. So I have slightly modified my title uh, because of the progress in work since the submission of the abstract. And we have submitted this work in MNRS letter, and it is presently under review. So, uh, so before diving into uh, talk, I'll first like to give you a brief intro as to what are BLRJs. A lot of people have already covered that thing uh, since morning. Uh, but let's start with a normal galaxy. This is a normal galaxy which has most of its emission coming from stars. Uh, it is NGC 1376 as observed by Hubble telescope. This is an active galaxy which has very large luminous emission coming from a very small region of the sky um, and this is also an optical band. Now if we look into uh, this very small region where the luminosity, where this large luminosity is coming from, we see that there is a supermassive black hole at the center uh, surrounding which there is an accretion disk and it is believed that, uh, well this is the proposed model, uh, we do not exactly know what is there but according to the uh, studies, uh, we believe that there are relativistic outflows of plasmas which are taking place perpendicular to these accretion disks for this entire arrangement. 
Now, when when we are, when we are directly looking into these jets, we see a point-like emission, and these objects are characterized as blades are. However, when we change our line of sight, for instance, if I'm looking from this direction, they'll appear to have these very beautiful jets coming perpendicular to the disk. These are called radio galaxy or the seafood galaxy. Now, depending upon the angle of orientation of these jets to a line of sight, uh, we, we characterize our agents. So the one which has jets aligned in our direction, we call it a blazer. Uh, when the jets are precisely aligned in our direction, we see Doppler enhancement or there is a this is not working. Well, so there is an increase in intensity. Uh, so there is an increase in intensity by a factor of delta Q. And this result in a this result in a boosted emission such that the emission coming from the jet it gets drastically overpowered from, um, in comparison to the emission coming from the rest of the galaxy. So a typical blizzard emission, it extends from the radio band to the gamma ray band, and it is mostly dominated by non-thermal emission. If you look at its spectrum, it will have very distinct two clear humps. The first hump, which extends from the radio to X-ray band, it is believed that the emission process responsible for emission in this energy range, it's usually synchrotron radiation. Uh, the second hump, which extends from the X-ray to TV range, we do not exactly know what is the process responsible for emission of photon in this energy range. So to understand how the particles are emitted in this energy range, we will we have carried out this work. The uh, so blizzards can specifically be classified into FSRQs and DL arc objects, depending upon the presence of the optical emission line. If the emission lines are absent, we see uh, two humps. But if the, um, uh, if the most of the synchrotron emission is coming from a lower uh, energy range that is less than 10 to the power 14 hertz, we call it a low peak DL arc. However, if this peak is extended to higher energies, we call it a high peak DL arc. So in this work, I am studying a DL arc object, which is an eponymous blizzard named after the category which it belongs to. Uh, this source has shown a transition from an LPL to HPL category. And although it is a BLR, but it has still shown some signs of BLR region. The source has also shown some terra electron volt emission. And interesting thing about the source is that this terra electron volt emission has a variability time scale of 13 minutes. And these 13 minutes variability time scale tells us where the emission is coming from. So 13 minutes means that the variability is smaller than the size of the black hole for this particular source. And during this activity, which was uh, which was uh, submitted by Arlen et al. in 2012, uh, they noticed that along with the terra electron volt emission, there was also radio observation at part six scale. So how can such a small emission region be located at part six scale? We don't understand this. So to uh, understand uh, this discrepancy in the data, we have looked at the long-term light curve of the BLR, and we find out that during 2020 to 2021, the source has shown some increased flaring activity. So we try to understand what is the physical process responsible for this increased activity in the source during this particular region. So we try to do a comparative analysis of the state file with the rest of the states and we find out that during state file, the spectrum is shifted to the right. This is also uh, noticeable by the values of alpha, but during state five, we see that there are more number of high energy photons in comparison to the state one. So it means that there is some influx of fresh accelerated particles, or maybe there are more number of particles or high energy photons which are suddenly emitting during state five. So to further understand the state five, we are zooming into it and we have looked for four activity region. The first is the region of brightest X-ray activity. We next look into the region of brightest gamma ray activity and we have chosen two other bright gamma ray periods, depending upon the availability of densely, uh, densely X-ray data. Uh, then we developed a multi-wavelength SADs for the four activity regions and we find out that 
Specifically, whenever the flux is increasing, let's say for October 5 and 6, I hope that the text is visible. For October 5 and 6, <laughs> for October 5 and 6, uh, when the, it's not working actually. It's not working. You have to press it long enough. What? Press it long enough and keep it pressed. Okay. So uh, during October 5, I, it's better if I do it that way. Don't hit it. Cause an outburst. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, just <laughs> <laughs> so during October 5 and 6, you know that when the flux has increased, uh, the X-ray spectrum during October 5 and 6, it is lying in the falling part of the first half. However, when the flux decays, let's say for October 15 and 16, uh, we see the blue color, uh, the X-ray spectrum it is hardened. So there, it is lying in the rising part of the second half. If you remember my SED plot, uh, so there is a sudden transition of the X-ray state from the first term to the second half. Simultaneously, for the same periods, we noted that for October 5 and 6, in the Fermi van, the spectrum is shifted to the right. And during October 15 and 16, it is peaking at the lower energies. We see a hint of similar behavior for state 2 and 3. And for 4, this behavior was very obvious. I will further highlight this behavior in the future slide for state four. Oh, so there was also an extension of synchrotron spectrum up to 7.5 kV. Uh, okay, so this was the region of brightest X-ray activity in the source so far. So for this period, we noted that there is a variability of eight minutes, which is smaller than the smallest variability in the flow. Uh, this is the region of the brightest gamma ray activity, and this had a variability of 46 minutes, which is consistent with the tera electron volt variability observed in this, you know, in the source. Uh, so we noted that there is an extension of synchrotron photons, synchrotron spectrum up to 7.5 kV, and during that time there was a variability of 8 minutes. From our calculation, we find out that the electrons are possibly getting accelerated to uh, 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 5. Also, the magnetic energies uh, are within the range of 0 0.3 to 2.2 gauss. Okay, so this slide is a little important because this explains our model. Uh, we propose that a possible way to explain all of these observations is that there are productions of plasmoids or small plasmoids outside the BLR because of some kink instabilities which have been observed by George Street et al. in 2022, and these instabilities are resulting in production of sites of magnetic reconnections where small plasmoids are formed, and these plasmoids, they are like moving randomly. And when one of the plasmoids get aligned in the direction of the observer, we see an enhanced emission along with a shift of SED to the right. So every time a mini jet is getting aligned in my direction, I am seeing a shift in SED and also an increased activity. So this is a small representation of the same. And this is the activity for region four, which I mentioned previously, in which during July 29, we noted that it is lying in the rising part of the first hump, of the second hump. And during August 1 and 3, when the flux has increased, uh, it is X-ray spectrum is lying in the falling part of the first hump. Also, the Fermi spectrum, that is the high energy spectrum, it is shifted to the right during the period of high activity. Okay. From our calculation, we also find out that shock and recollimation shock cannot explain the high Lorentzian factor required for the observed luminosities in the source. Also, the magnetic reconnection, that is our jet inject scenario proposed by Gionis, uh, eases the constraint on the Doppler factor and Okay, so in a bigger picture, I think this work can help us uh, to predict 
when tera electron hole variabilities can be observed in the source uh, um, showing similar behavior. So whenever the source is showing increased activity, there is a shift in the spectrum because of which we predict that there will be increased emission in the tera electron hole bands. So these are the takeaway messages. Uh, I like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Amit Shukla, and my collaborators for discussion. These are my collaborators. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for very nice one. Any questions from the participants? Yeah. So, uh, since you are trying to explain PV photons mm -hmm. from magnetic reconnection, but in magnetic reconnection, essentially, it is the when two opposing magnetic fields come in, you have huge current sheet. So uh -huh. The curl, curl cross B is 4 pi by C J. Mm -hmm. So, and it is the current sheet mm -hmm. leading to high energy particles, okay. which will eventually lead to photons. Steve, but EV photons, you know, to produce that, the Lorentz gamma factor you need mm -hmm. is at least 10 to the 6. Okay. Because TeV can just have 12 EV mm -hmm. divided by rest mass of the electron, 1 MeV. Mm -hmm. So you need Lorentz factor of 10 to the 6. How does it ease the Lorentz factor? So I didn't understand that. Okay, so uh, as of now, we don't have PV data. We have done, done uh, we have taken observations from the X-ray band and the Fermi band, and we are predicting that maybe TeV photons can be emitted in, in such scenarios. Then we are seeing increased activity in X-ray and gamma ray band. Yeah, but TV photons mm -hmm. can be produced only by even higher energy charged particles, right? Yes, yeah. So therefore, the current sheet, when magnetic reconnection takes place, the current sheet has to have outflow of charged particles mm -hmm. having Doppler factor more than 10 to the 6. Okay. Mm -hmm. The other possibility that is related to the positron, mm -hmm. why not if you have plasmoid formulation formation randomly, then E minus and E plus, which is present the jet, the positrons simply get annihilated with the plasmoid and produce the boosted mm -hmm. annihilation photons. Mm -hmm. Of course, there also you need Doppler factor, MeV, but mm -hmm. MeV has to be again boosted to 10 to 6 so that you reduce so for, uh, for our brightest X-ray activity, we noted that there is uh, a Lorentz factor of electrons is 10 to the power 4 to 5. For uh, X-ray. Huh? For X-ray. For, for X-ray observations, but for yes. TV, you would need but more. From the cooling time scales, we have evaluated, evaluated that. Uh, but yeah, I, I can check maybe there has been detection of TV photons in this source. So maybe I can check what are the Lorentz factors they are reporting. Okay, thanks. okay thank you. So just a clarification. Mm -hmm. from so when you are talking about jet in jet models, so mm -hmm. like you have a kind of episodic outflows, right? Mm -hmm. So they are, that is because of the magnetic reconnection or the change in the accretion properties. Itself. Can you repeat that? Like you have a jet in jet model, right? Mm -hmm. So you have an episodic outflow. Yeah. So that is because of the magnetic reconnection or the change in the accretion properties itself. Ah, so, uh, I don't know if it, ha it, ha it is related to accretionness because it is taking this uh, at 0 0.1 parsec or beyond the BLR. I think accretion will play a role when we are talking about magnetic reconnection close to the um, base of the jet, maybe. Yeah. So, in the jet itself, uh, the change in this magnetic field configuration is causing these mini jets. Okay. So, the mini jets are caused by the change in the magnetic field configuration in the jet itself. Okay. So, we are proposing that there is maybe. Um, Kink instabilities here, which are resulting in some perturbations, resulting in the, there is a possibility that magnetic field lines they can come opposite to each other, resulting in magnetic reconnection. And because of the plasmoids forming this process, they can. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, where from are we getting the X rays? Uh huh. Where from? Where are we getting the X rays? I mean, so. yeah, from where are these X rays emitted? Where are the X-rays emitted? Okay, so in typical AGMs, you are okay. yeah for your source. I'm asking. We are asking you where in the jet, like precisely at what location the emission is taking place. Oh, I did that calculation in the paper, but okay, we can evaluate it from the time variabilities that we have found. Uh, okay, 
So I have found that there is a variability time scales of eight minutes. If if we take shocking jet model according to which the emission region is covering the entire cross section of the jet, then in that case it should lie very close to the base of the jet. But we are proposing that this is magnetic deconnection happening because which are, because of which there are small it's like just a minute. Okay, so we are proposing that there are very small, tiny blobs, like lots of small emission regions outside the VLR, and those small emission regions are emitting it. So you are asking me where the emission region is located for X-rays, then it is located beyond the VLR. Do you understand what VLR is? It is broad line region in AG. Okay, thank you. So I think we will start next session at 250. Yeah, so 250. Yes, we'll stay for lunch. Thank you. Thank you. So those who have presentation, next please come 10 minutes before so that we can upload your presentation here. So anywhere Sir, you don't have to take a photo of Blur. Hey, brother, take a photo of Blur. It doesn't come to anything. Keep it on auto. First, press it. Press it and focus it. Do
So I welcome you all uh, to the third session. <laughs> the third session of the third day. So first speaker is Shivangi Pandey. We'll be talking about the broadline region and black hole mass of Vedas, PKS0736 plus 017. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shivangi and I work with Dr. Shivendu Rakshat from Aries. Uh, my work is based on um, estimation of masses of black holes uh, using reverberation mapping technique. And uh, for this, I have chosen this source, uh, which is an FSRQ PKS0736. Uh, so previous speakers already spoke about AGN and uh, its peculiar properties and everything. So I'll just briefly uh, discuss the uh, basic components. So suppose you see an active galaxy, which is stretched up to 40 kiloparsec. And then when you zoom in more, uh, you will see a narrow line region. Uh, gas clouds could go up to 100 uh, parsec, depend on the galaxy scale. Then you zoom in more further, you will see a dusty torus. Then 
then uh, when uh, for the zoom in you will see a rotating gas cloud which is uh, basically a broad line region uh, rotating about a supermassive black hole that it accretes matter in the form of an accretion disk uh, so uh, i think these things are already been said so i'll just move forward to my objective which is the uh, estimating estimating the uh, black hole masses uh so that we can study the growth and evolution history of host galaxies with respect to its uh, supermassive black holes that is sitting right at the core of it uh however it is difficult because the central engine is highly compact and uh, it is unresolved even for low redshift agents uh and the majority of agents are at high redshift uh also that is why the core outer is the host making the host uh, galaxy difficult to observe so we cannot use our regular stellar dynamics approach to calculate the black hole uh, mass so we have reverberation mapping technique to our say uh, which uses um, which actually substitutes the space resolution uh, to time resolution and what we do here is uh, we count, uh, we monitor the response of emission lines to the continuum variations uh, that could eventually give us the size and structure of the uh, broad line region uh, blr so suppose uh, you have this where is the pointer okay uh, so suppose all right uh so suppose you have con continuum pulses uh, giving out from the core at uh, regular in uh, instance uh so for the observer if the continuum pulse do not encounter any hindrance uh, the observer will observe the continuum light curve but if there is a gas cloud uh, which is coming from the nearby broad line region uh, the continuum pulse if it hits the uh, gas clouds uh, the it photoionizes them and becomes a uh, and uh, it creates a emission line so to the observer uh there will be a continuum light curve and the uh emission line light curve with some delay and that delay is actually the light traveling time from the uh, center to the nearby gas cloud so this delay we estimate by using various methods and this could eventually give the blr size just multiplied with by c uh okay so so then uh, from the vl theorem we can estimate the black hole mass by using all these uh, three parameters uh which is the blr size coming from the lag then the line width estimation uh coming from the spectrum and then uh the scale factor which is actually dependent upon the kinetics and structure of the blr uh then and also another thing is uh the another objective of mine is actually to calibrate the size luminosity relation uh so what it is is actually uh, this is uh, the plot taken from benz et al and they have gathered around uh, hundreds of agn uh, on which the reverberation mapping has been done uh, so their blr size and continuum luminosity has been plotted and you can see it is uh, very well following this uh, particular uh, relation with the slope of 0.5 now this is the uh, why is it not okay so this is the current scenario where you can see that a lot number of more sources have been added up and a few of them are deviating from this relation they are narrow line cfit ones and uh, they are said to believe that uh, they have a uh, high uh, fe2 emission so maybe the uh, this fe2 emission could also be inc incorporated in this particular relation so overall so to say i want to uh, calibrate this particular relation for, uh, with more number of agents and uh, so that i can estimate the black hole mass by just uh, so that uh by just using a single epoch spectra so for that i have chosen this source which is uh which is an fsrq located at the redshift of 0.189 hosted by a giant elliptical galaxy uh why i have chosen this source is because its black hole mass uh, its uh, broad line region size is geometry is unknown till now and uh, the source shows strong emission lines and also the availability of long term monitoring data is very ideal for reverberation mapping studies so uh so i've taken this uh, um uh, the data from steward observatory it's basically a uh, optical v band photometry and spectroscopic data and also the uh, weekly bend reduced gamma ray light curve from lat on board for me uh so what i want to do is i want to estimate the blr size for this object i want to know that whether the B uh, size luminosity relation uh, it, it follows the size luminosity uh, relation or not and also how massive is the black hole in this uh, galaxy uh so this is one such example spectrum uh 
uh, taken from uh, uh, from the uh, from the data that we have taken from Stewart Observatory. You can see uh, the emission lines are very strong. And uh, what I have done is um, to calculate the emission line flux, I have locally fitted the um, <clears throat> power law, and then I've subtracted that power law from the entire spectrum. And then I have only uh, and and then uh, as a final product, I have only got these uh, emission line uh, region. So I've just directly integrated them and calculated the emission line fluxes. Uh, so uh, the similar thing I've done with all the data that I had, and then I have uh, constructed an emission line light curve. Speaking about light curve, uh, so at the top panel, uh, you can see that this is a gamma ray light curve. Uh, this is a photometric uh, V band continuum. Uh, and then this is spectroscopic uh, uh, flux at 5100 angstrom uh, light curve, and then uh, edge beta and edge gamma uh, line uh, line light curves. And uh, at last, this is the non-thermal dominance parameter that I will talk about in my later slides. Uh, so I would like to um, infer from this um, uh, light curve is that uh, from these light curves is basically like you can see. Uh, 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 the, this region is having a, a flaring thing and the rest of part is a quiescent state. Uh, and the same thing is reflected in the V-band and the spectroscopic uh, uh, flux continuum, but not in the line emissions. So uh, we say that uh, this non-thermal uh, contribution that is coming from the jet is not, affect, is not affecting the broad line region uh, emission lines. Uh, that, that is why what I have done is uh, for a better estimation, I have just used the uh, quiescent state for my study. And I have calculated this uh, various parameters for the light curve also that I will not go through much. Then for uh, time lag estimation, um, I have used several methods. First is the inter interpolated cross correlation method. Uh, then there is a uh, javelin, and I have uh, used other two methods also. That is uh, one Newman and Bartle estimator. Uh, so first is the cross correlation method. Uh, what cross, cross correlation method is? It actually uh, compares the degree of similarity between the two light curves. So suppose you have two light curves. One is stable, and another is uh, sh uh, is shifted with some time. Then you will calculate the cross correlation coefficient, and you will do the same thing uh, continuously. So you will uh, so eventually you will create a distribution uh, of the cross correlation coefficient with respect to the shifted time. So the peak of it will be the uh, time lag. So I'm interested in the maximum cross correlation coefficient and also the eighty percent of the peak of that distribution. That is the centroid time lag. Uh, so these are the results. Uh, this is the autocorrelation uh, between the continuum V band and the continuum flux at 5100 angstrom. Obviously, it will give a zero time lag. Uh, then uh, on the left, this is the CCF between V band versus H beta, CCF between uh, V band versus H uh, gamma. And obviously, the H gamma region will be closer to the central engine, so uh, its lag is lesser than that. Uh, then uh, then another method is javelin. I will not go through it in more detail. Uh, it's just that the um, results uh, from uh, from these methods also are consistent with the ICCF uh, time lag measurement. Uh, now, uh, for the line width measurement, I have constructed mean and RMS spectra. And I'm con uh, concerned in this edge beta region. So I will uh, calculate the line, uh, line width of it. By use uh, by FWHM calculation and the standard deviation calculation, and then finally by gathering all uh, the time lag estimation and the line width, uh, I've used uh, the F scale factor by Wu et al. for um, uh, for which the F is four point four five seven if I'm using line width as standard deviation, and it is one point one two if the line width uh, I'm using as uh, FWHM. So uh, I have like around four choices. Uh, from the mean spectrum and the RMS spectrum. And out of these four, uh, the, uh, the more accurate one is the RMS is from the RMS spectrum and uh, sigma line. So the mass is around 7.32 to 10 to the power 7 times the solar mass. Okay. 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 Uh, so I will skip it. Uh, you can see that my source is very well following this uh, particular relation, the size and uh, luminosity relation. 
and there's another thing called uh, non thermal dominance parameter which is actually the ratio between the observed continuum uh, luminosity versus the predicted disk luminosity so the observed continuum luminosity will be the mixture of the disk and jet contribution and the predicted luminosity is uh, i've calculated by using this empirical relation which just uses this uh, luminosity of uh, edge beta line and then uh, so if mtd is equal to 1 there is no jet contribution no non thermal contribution but if it is greater than two, then it means that it is a uh, that uh, the source is having a very significant non-thermal contribution that is coming from the jet, uh, maybe. So uh, for our source, uh, this uh, you can see that beyond this point, uh, all these data points are uh, are having entity more than two. That means it it shows a very significant uh, non-thermal contribution. Uh, I will skip this also. So finally, the summary. So the BLR size that I have estimated is around uh, 80 light days. Uh, the black hole mass is 7.32 into 10 to the power 7 times the solar mass. Uh, then the continuum at 5100 angstrom is 6.13 into 10 to the power 44 arcs per second. Uh, the major continuum luminosity is actually affected by the non-thermal emission, even though I have only used the QCIN state. Uh, the non-thermal dominance parameter is the uh, in the equation state can be used as an estimator for removing the non-thermal contribution from the observed continuum luminosity, and the reverse uh, value is one point four four into. So yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, so this paper, uh, so this work has been now published, and uh, for more information, you can go through this. Thank you. Uh, hi. So, uh, this non-thermal dominance parameter that you showed. Hmm. So, I have missed it. There was uh, one thing that you were calculating the luminosity of the disk, and then luminosity of the disk region. Uh, like okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's the differentiate between red and then just get the flux or the. Yeah, like uh, whatever we are observing, it will be a, a mixture of uh, the disk and the jet, right? And the uh, predicted disk luminosity, I'm saying that, uh, so the I've shown earlier in the light curve that uh, the broad emission lines are not affected by the non-thermal contribution. So whatever the contribution that is coming from the broad emission lines, that is actually uh, dependent upon the disk, right? So whatever the disk is giving to broad line region, the emission line will be there. So I have the luminosity for edge beta, so I'm directly uh, calculating the uh, disk luminosity from it. That is your predicted disk. Yeah, that is the predicted disk luminosity. And with that, you are you have the, of course, the yeah. absorbed luminosity. Yes. yes. Okay. I have a small question. The BLR region, if the BLR is continuous or discrete? It's not continuous. <laughs> it's discrete. It's it's uh, like uh, the gas clouds. Uh, discrete gas clouds and they are revolving around. Any other questions? So let's thank the speaker. So the next talk uh, is by Pavan Kumar, who will be talking about the super criticality of the dynamo limits or the memory of the polar field to one second. Uh, Hello, everyone. I am Pavan Kumar, a senior research fellow at Department of Physics, IIT BHU. So I will talk about the effect of super criticality uh, of the dynamo and the memory of the polar field. So memory of the polar field will use uh, in the uh, prediction of the solar cycle activity. So uh, this is the solar cycle, uh, which shows the periodically uh, variation about 11 year periodicity. And uh, uh, in this plot, uh, we can see that uh, 
the amplitude of all the cycles are not same and uh, this is the sunspot uh, which uh, gives the measure of the activity of the uh, sun and the activity of the sun affects our space weather and uh, also earth and our space communication based uh, instruments uh, and also the uh, space with the, the activity of the sun also has actually uh, impact up, uh, our uh, space based uh, society. So uh, my motivation is that uh, it is believed that uh, sun has uh, two types of the magnetic field. One, one has uh, toroidal field and another is the colloidal field. So for the prediction of the uh, solar activity, uh, people use the polar precursor method, uh, which is very widely known uh, and used by scientific community. Uh, this is the plot which shows the variation of the polar field of the sun and solar activity. Black curve shows the variation of the uh, polar field with time and uh, red curve shows the solar activity. So uh, sun, uh, sun uh, reverse uh, its polarity uh, within 11 years. So this is the time of the polar field reversal. And uh, uh, this is the time of the solar cycle minima. We consider uh, this uh, the time of the solar activity maximum. So in polar precursor method, uh, people use the uh, polar field at solar cycle minimum as a seed and uh, predict the next cycle amplitude next cycle amplitude uh, which is uh, uh, 5 to 6 year before from, from the solar activity, activity maximum so uh, from this method we can predict uh, the upcoming solar activity uh, before 5 to 6 year before so our question is so uh, uh, can uh, do we need only one previous cycle polar field for reliable prediction or we need uh, other previous many cycle polar field for reliable prediction? And how much earlier we can predict the upcoming solar activities? So we use the dynamo model for this. So we define supercriticality of the dynamo. So super, uh, supercriticality defined by dynamo numbers. So dynamo number defined by uh, d is equal to alpha 0 delta omega r cube by uh, eta square, where alpha 0 is the polar. r is the solar radius and eta is the turbulent diffusivity in solar convection zone. Uh, this is the plot which shows the variation of the toroidal field flux uh, through uh, with a dynamo number. Uh, we can see from this plot as dynamo number increases, the toroidal flux increases. And uh, when uh, toroidal flux uh, weak, uh, when toroidal flux weak, so that field called the, uh, that region of the dynamo, called the critical region of the dynamo. And when toroidal flux, uh, toroidal flux is strong and dynamo, and dynamo number high, so that uh, region called the supercritical region of the dynamo. So we use the, our simulation is surface flux at, surface plus transport dynamo model and uh, uh, we solve the uh, induction equation in that model and we uh, got the result. So if dynamo works in critical region, so we saw the linear correlation between uh, previous cycle polaridal field and upcoming cycles toroidal field. So uh, we uh, we see the correlation in, in cycle polaridal field and n2 n plus 3 cycle polaridal field uh, toroidal field so we uh, see the strong correlation for all these cycles and uh, if uh, we this result we sign super critical region of the dynamo so in uh, in, in this region we only saw the correlation high for n2 n plus 1 cycle and for other cycle correlation is vanished so we can conclude that uh, in critical region dynamo, the uh, polaridal field can uh, used as a 
measure of the upcoming upcoming three pre, uh, upcoming cycles for prediction. And if Dynamo works in super critical region, so we can only predict uh, next cycle of the uh, upcoming cycle. And also uh, for the same result, we produced uh, using a try model, which is called delay Dynamo model. And in that model also, we got same result. Uh, from this figure, uh, we can see that when uh, as Dynamo number uh, Dynamo number increases, because Dynamo number related to alpha and eta, uh, so as Dynamo number increases, so only one plus one cycle gives the strong correlation with previous cycle polyhedral field and other cycle uh, correlation continuously decreases. So uh, what is the physics behind going on? So this is the simple cartoon representation of the solar dynamo. So if you consider the uh, NS cycle of collateral field, uh, which, uh, which uh, goes towards, uh, towards the convection zone due to magnetic circulation and due to differential rotation of the sun, it gives the NS, uh, next cycle to radial field. So, and uh, this NS N plus one cycle to radial field uh, comes on the solar surface in the form of sunspot and bipolar magnetic regions. And uh, this uh, sunspot and bipolar magnetic region due to tilt in the sunspot and, uh, uh, and decay. So there are a, a special mechanism works, which is called a, a babcock clayton mechanism, in, which includes randomness and non-linearity. So uh, this, uh, uh, this collateral field converts in, into the collateral field for the next cycle. And this process continuously happening and goes on. So solar cycle, solar cycle continuously uh, go, goes on and uh, about 11 year periodicity. So uh, if we uh, if the dynamo works in uh, critical region, so for NH, uh, NH polyadal field, NH cycle polyadal field, the differential rotation is deterministic. So uh, it gives a highly correlation with N plus one cycle and uh, in uh, in critical region, uh, uh, the nonlinearity in the BL process is very weak, so uh, the memory of the NS cycle uh, will not decay uh, due to uh, BL mechanism, and it trans uh, uh, it transfer into n plus one cycle polar polar field. So it uh, continuously uh, goes like, but due to randomness uh, in every cycle, some uh, memory losses of the polar field. But if Dynamo works in the super critical region. So at that time, the nonlinearity uh, uh, will be very high. So due to randomness and nonlinearity, uh, the n, n plus one uh, cycle polyadal n cycle memory uh, of the polyadal field due to large randomness and nonlinearity will vanish completely uh, and again not give any uh, high correlation with next cycle. So in supercritical uh, regime of the dynamo, we only get n n to n plus one highly correlation, but not for others cycle. Uh, also, uh, this is the time series plot of the uh, two uh, regime of the dynamo. One is the super critical regime and one for the critical regime. So in critical regime, we can see that minimum uh, weak magnetic events, but in super critical re regime, we uh, do not see any weak magnetic events. So, and these uh, weak magnetic events, defined as the grand minima uh, in the sun. So we can here uh, comment that uh, uh, our sun uh, uh, working in the region of the uh, critical region of the dynamo. So my conclusion is that a dynamo uh, working in critical region, so uh, we can use the for reliable prediction. We need a three, uh, three previous cycle of polar field and if uh, 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 our, uh, if dynamo works in super critical region, so the polar field at cycle minimum can only determine the strength of the next cycle and the super criticality of the dynamo uh, uh, define the memory only for one cycle. And also as the super criticality of the dynamo increases, uh, we see that the grand minimum like events happening in the uh, sun uh, uh, in the model uh, we, uh, also decreases. And also, 
from uh, uh, this, uh, uh, we can also conclude that uh, our sun is uh, weakly supercritical. So uh, uh, this work, uh, the polar, polar, the generation of the polar field uh, in the sun, uh, uh, do not completely understood now, but it is a very challenging process uh, to gen the generation of the collateral field. So uh, uh, it helps uh, to understand the heliophysics uh, also to understand the heliophysics study. Thank you. As you talk about the prediction for the solar cycle, mm -hmm. uh, what uh, your model suggests what will be the uh, sunspot number for the next cycle for solar and next one? It is previously defined. Right, it's not predicting. You are predicting, huh? Uh, I'm not predicting. I'm using polar field at previous cycle, okay, minimum, you can predict the next cycle amplitude. <coughs> it, it is well established. Okay. So ask, so uh, in certainly 1978, uh, 1978 and Chaudhary, uh, 2007, it, this work already happened. Have you applied this uh, model to the, the cycle that we now do, 24 or 23rd cycle? Uh, this, this model uh, has already, uh, this, pro this method already applies for cycle 24 by Chaudhary, they are Chaudhary in 2007. So prediction is very close to. Okay, I think we'll discuss. Okay. Yeah. So, when, so my question is like you have to, you are using the polar field uh, from the very top solar of it, right? No, this part representation. Uh, I do simulation. So you are doing simulation, but yeah. you are comparing it with the, the existing model. Like you have mentioned that you need, if sun is working in the supercritical limit, you need three cycles of data. No, no. If sun is working in critical regime, so. Can you go to your last slide? Last. Last slide. Just uh, one second, I can go. One? Conclusions like conclusions. Yeah. So you have mentioned that if the dynamo is working in the critical regime, huh. then you need three cycles at least to predict huh. the next cycle. Huh. Level prediction. We, level. Uh, huh. we can use we, we, we can use only previous cycle polar field, but if you want to good correlation and good result, so we can use uh, up to three previous cycle polar field. That means sun has a memory. Huh. Has sun has memory. Up to three cycles. Huh. But sun is not working in that regime, right? No, sun is now sun is critical. No, sun is in weekly. Uh, sun is working super, uh, weekly supercritical regime. Yes, in case of the sun, huh. we don't need three cycle of it. No, we need. But uh, listen, uh, we uh, you uh, in supercritical regime, you can predict only using previous cycle polar field, but for a good correlation, uh, you uh, should have up to three previous cycle polar field. Then hmm. my point, question is that like, if you are using the Wilcox, we have only three cycles of data. Huh. So you can only predict one cycle. Yeah. So instead of Wilcox observatory polar field, why are you not going for some other proxies? So uh, for some other proxies like uh, AT index. Yeah, like uh, uh, scattered in the tilt angle, that is one of the important proxy. Uh, but uh, we have object, uh, we have only few uh, HMI data and uh, uh, how much cycle? Only two to two, 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 three cycles. Around 10 years, even if we look at the Mount Wilson data, we uh, more than 10 cycles, around 10 cycles. Uh, 
and if you look for the calcium key class in depth, hmm. that is also one of the reliable proxy for ha. polar field measurement. So, so we can use only one, one cycle, uh, one, one previous cycle polar field, na? Yes. Be, uh, be, uh, I, uh, we have 400 years of sun solar activity data. Okay, so in sun, uh, we have only uh, saw one grand, uh, grand minimal like events and one Dalton minimal like events. Okay. So we can discuss. Yeah. Really. Yeah. So one small question like in the angular number you have mentioned delta omega. Huh. Ah. Angular variation. Angular variation. Huh. Ah. What is the value of that in case of the sun? So based on observation, that value is zero. I don't remember. You don't observe any change in the solar differential rotation. No, but slightly solar. change. That's why I'm asking the number. Because uh, the statistically, it is not established. The sun rotation is not changing. Uh, not changing, but, but uh, it is very small. But I, I don't remember. So let's bring the speaker. Um, next. <laughs> Hello. Yes, I think checking the pointer. Oh, I am audible. Okay. So our next speaker is Vikram K. Sripatra. So he'll be talking about F-mod oscillation in neutron stars, role of interior composition and impact of on gravity, gravitational waves. Hi, okay. so we have to experience yours. You have to, uh, 15, uh, 12 minutes and I'll remind you to 10. Okay. Hi, uh, I am Vikram Pradhan. I'm working uh, PhD student Ayuka under uh, Professor Devadi Chatterjee. I, I know. <laughs> okay. Okay, I will basically talk on the F-mode oscillation of Newton's chart, or the role of composition and how the impact on gravitational waves. Yeah, so as of introduction, uh, the Newton stars like basically the stellar remnant of a uh, when a massive star dies up, up to of a star with mass greater than eight solar mass. They have typical mass of two solar mass on radius of 10 kilometers. Uh, the special about Newton star you can see from the QCD diagram. Sorry. Yeah. So if we look at the QCD diagram, basically the Newton star spans uh, almost every region of the QCD diagram, starting from the like a nuclear density to the high density. In the like the plane, as uh, this is like this asymmetry plane. So, like if, if you start from the crust, uh, like as of the composition, so the star is crust is basically you have a decent electron emitted in lattice of the nuclear nuclei. Then you increase the density. Now, Newton is down deeper from the uh, nuclei. Then you have a region of uh, nuclei, like the mixture of electron, nuclear, uh, nuclei, and everything. Then you go to much higher density. Now, you have a, you have a homogeneous core, like outer core with a uh, lepton. Uh, uh, Proton, neutron, everything. Then, if you go to much higher density, basically this region of the classic QCD, this diagram, you don't know. Basically, nobody knows. Okay, so that like people come up with different theory. They could be hyperons. Hyperons is basically what you see in the standard. This particle is like apart from neutral point, there are heavy variants. There could be quarks, like uh, I think Silent or like talk, talk, talk about it. So, so now this thing we don't know. So now, and the neutron stars are observable through this. Uh, uh, EM counter, they have like uh, EM observations, and uh, but that's though we have a better understanding from the binaries, but we don't have a that's not enough for uh, like uh, constraining the composition. So you need some another information. That's where the gravitational wave comes. So we are most familiar with this uh, first data detection 0, 017, 0, 27. So basically, uh, the first thing to open uh, like a uh, landmark to like uh, do this multi message astronomy. Uh, apart from this, uh, if you go to this, so if you look at the isolated stars, or like uh, I think in the morning we discussed already in the binary also. So, what happens? Uh, this stellar oscillation modes there will get excited. So, like to normal theory, you will have the this fundamental more pressure, more gravity modes. I just in addition to that, in neutral star, you can have this uh, space time mode also. So, it's like basically the idea is to similar to the Helios cosmology. Okay, yeah, so for the isolated case. Uh, so the idea is basically the helios which i don't know but the idea is basically if you detect uh, the, the this mode basically when you have a gravitational radiation due to this unstable of these modes 
So this compo this uh, most properties like the frequency damping time they are related to the composition or like or the we'll see in a sec in few slides. And you can like do like do this similar thing to astrosystem is what we call and you can calculate this uh, you can infer the universal composition or the stellar properties basically. Yeah. So my uh, this from, from now on I will focus on the cold neutral. When I mention cold, it means that the Fermi energy of the composition is much higher than the temperature of the medium, and the non-rotating case. And I will focus on the F modes because simulation shows the F modes are the like the modes which are going to be excited during the binary as well as in the case of isolated stars. Okay. Yeah. So how do you describe the composition? So here it comes. Basically, the equation state. So, if you want to solve the fundamental mass radius, it's basically the hydrostatic, hydrostatic equations. So, these are the uh, mostly the Talman, Oppenheimer, Volkov equations, but you are more familiar with the two of equations. So, you have the GR uh, hydrostatic equation. So, the key integrated for any hydrostatic equation, you know the equation of state. It's basically a precedence relationship. So, here comes basically, as I have shown already, you the density we don't know the region. So, here comes different model. So, there are basically two different family, uh, basically literature community like divided. So one is the ab initio method. So basically, you calculate the equation state based upon the nuclear nuclear interaction, or the two body theory interaction. Others are the phenomenological. Phenomenological, you do what you do is basically pretty theory. You have some parameter in your model. You feed the parameter to the nuclear or the nuclear uh, the property of the nucleus. What you have observed, observed from the ground terrestrial experiments. Then you extrapolate your theory to the high density where you don't have anything. Yeah, so depend on, uh, so it's basically that can be relativistic, non relativistic, that could be anything. It depends what you believe. If you don't want any complication in your life, you can work with polytrop as well. So here, is, if it's visible, I don't know if it's visible or not. So if you look, so basically there are different models. You can, how uh, is basically also MID bag model for the core, everything you, if you are familiar with. So there are difficult, different models. And then you solve the TOB, then you have this uh, MR first, basically, uh, corresponding to that equation. Sir. The immediate consequence you can took is like uh, if you have like the what do you call stiffness, uh, how varies the pressure varies rapidly with the equation, uh, energy density. You can see the steeps, for example, uh, steep this equation is You can have a large maximum mass. And if you are claiming this is my neutral star equation state and it is fails to explain it to solar mass, like what observed we have observed electron from the like the data. Uh, and if it fails, then your equation is basically fails. It's not acceptable. Yeah. So yeah, the, for the F4 thing, so this is the, that part is for the equation state. Then for the F4 thing, okay. So uh, basically, the neutral star you cannot ignore gravity. Okay. So then you have the, for the part, the basic idea is like you have the metric perturbation, and inside the neutral star you have the fluid perturbation as well, including that. If you want more simplification, you can ignore the metric perturbation. You can go to the relativistic uh, hydrodynamics equation, perturbation equation, that more familiar known as the cowling approximation. Yeah, but if you go to GR, basically in the, inside the neutral star you have the uh, fluid perturbation equation, as well as the metric perturbation equation, you evolve them. At the surface, you set the fluid to zero. Then you, uh, then you solve the gravitational wave radius, like the OEV equation for the infinity. Then you search for a complex frequency, uh, which basically will give you like only outgoing gravitational wave. So that's basically the idea. If you don't get it, okay, it's fine. Uh, but it's basically so the idea is how you find the uh, frequency and damping time. Okay. So yeah, so for the equation model discussion, what I am using is basically uh, the relativistic phenomenological model, which is basically mean field model. So I don't, if you like, uh, don't like the Lagrangian, don't look at it. Okay, so, but the thing is, uh, the idea is like this. So all the variance you have, the size represents the, the field, so this is the size of the variant fields. Then you have the major and sigma, major and omega, major. This basically idea is all the variants are interacting with the extensive of major, major, but uh, to make this simplified, we ignore the variation of the measurement field. We took a mean measurement field. So it's basically all the nuclear and variance, whatever composition we're taking, then the bath of a mean measurement field. And in the model, if you look at this, uh, there's some this coupling constant, G sigma, G omega, G rho, then the self-interaction like among the measurements, G lambda. So this is not the only Lagrangian they are for the relativity mean model. You can have different model as well. I am using this model. So then to reproduce this thing, the, so the, this calibrate, so this G sigma, they are fixed by are reproducing the order we have from the nuclear experiment, nuclear experiments like the saturation energy, compressibility, the slope of the symmetry energy, uh, all these things. And for the hyperons, uh, uh, okay. So uh, for, uh, though my side title says role of composition, I will mostly focus on the hyperons only because every composition like uh, it will be take very long. So for the hyperons, you have the uh, different experiments coming from the, the, the potential basically. What is the potential of the hyperon if it is in the like these systems? 
Oh, okay, so these are all experimental data. They come up with the uncertainties. The uncertainty brand has a given here. So basically, the ranges are given. So once you do that, uh, okay, the first step is like basically you uh, whatever the equation model, equation state you have, you constrain your space by imposing all the observation you have. Okay, so this is a typical typical mass radius, the equation state on the mass radius we have. Uh, I will just focus this. Uh, yeah. Okay, so you can look at this. Uh, M is basically mostly controlling parameter in the, this model particularly. So now you have the equation state. Uh, you have the basically the distribution of the fluid. Now you have to go for the solve for the frequency. So if you solve for the frequency, okay. So as I already mentioned, you can uh, use the complicated GR, solve, GR things to solve, or you can work in the relativistic region, neglect the zero. If you neglect the zero, this is what error you will get. It's basically, depending upon the equation state, you will get basically 10 to 30 percent error. Our result is two minutes. Okay. okay, so it's basically our result is also consistent with the recent papers also. So, and for the composition, if you look at this particular this point, so the moment, uh, for example, if you look at this uh, graph, so it's basically the red ones are like, uh, the red ones like basically hyper plots. So, if you look at this plot, so the moment you have the hyper, specifically the dashed lines are the uh, only nuclear matter equation set, then you assume then hypons are appear. The moment hypon appears, the hypon frequency increases. Okay. So if you have a universal equation set, let's, let's say this is my equation of state, this is my universal equation set, this is my universal theory. Now hypons are there. You see an increase in the frequency. You, you can say it's the observational signature. I can find all this, but it's not the truth because the your universal equation is you don't know. Okay. So the appearance of hypon like the increase the more frequency, or the same that increase the damping time. But it's not like you cannot say anything observational. Like uh, if I get a, uh, for example, let's say I get uh, frequency for a pulsar or like uh, from a binary, uh, for example, this region. I cannot say it's a hyperbolic unless a Bayesian study, of course. You, you can do and you can compare the base factor, but someone will come with a different model and say this is not a hyperbolic or, or maybe this is not a nuclear. So this is uh, the uh, error basically calling a precision. So as I already mentioned previously, the astro okay, two minutes. Okay. Okay. So for the astro seismology relations, is basically you know the fundamental frequency it will go as the square root of density. You know this relation. So it's basically you different models you fit the relation. Suppose in the future you get the f mode frequency and mapping time, you can calculate the R and M. So this is this, these are basically more useful when you have the isolated case where you don't have any mass and radius observation. So this, this is the this, this technique can are like the result to this. So what do you see in the we see in the literature. Uh, not density is not a good fit. It very is at the last pair. You can go with compactness. That is more uh, effective for this associational resiliency. Yeah, I, I will talk about. So this is also for binary. As already discussed in the morning, so in the binary related is for this. Uh, if you are the several lessons can be excited. So this lessons will be new, useful for that. Yeah. So for the correlation mode correlations, uh, if you go from nuclear to hyper hyper stars, uh, then hyper so parameters so they don't say any significant correlation with the f mode parameters. Uh, only thing happens is the, the radius and the nuclear parameter. Some nuclear parameter have the some sense. So yeah. So detectability case. So it's basically they are very uh, the damping time is too short. So you can model them as like this basically damping sinusoidal. If you assume this model and uh, and then you keep the sensitivity band of the current on different ATA plus and disturbance like you know? then you can estimate like a two a center two be ten then how much uh, if you assume to basically typical tunnel the star unit then how much energy you need so then this much energy can be satisfied from VHS, supernova explosion all these things and the, as the Salander also talked about the phase transition effect but uh, this assumes if all the energy goes to the gravitational wave which is not true so yeah I'll skip this part okay for the gravitational wave part. So now when your orbital energy is like basically the resonance of us, so now there will be a phase shift in their wave form. So in the frequency domain, uh, is basically you can express the gravitational wave like this, and the phase is basically have this post-Newtonian correction. It's not clear, complete GR, complete Newtonian. So then in that case, uh, this is typically if your F mode excitation happens, so how much phase shift can run? So this is basically depend on a different equation state model, different parameters, source parameters, source properties like uh, mass and all this. So this is basically shows uh, you would randomly question, like sample from a M1, M2 bath and took the lambda tilde. The, the lambda is basically a parameter which goes to the wave form, uh, have some combination with the M1, M2, lambda, and lambda. Two. Okay. So if you do that, uh, so now the side dynamic has a, comp like you can see the phase can go up to minus 50, minus 17, or minus 20, depending upon your parameters. So what do we do? So we reanalyze the binary event. This, uh, this is the last item. So the binary event 0, 17, 0, 8, 1, 7, is, uh, is basically the scenario is quite high. So this F mode frequency, as you, you have seen uh, this plot, 
is basically yeah, this like the frequency is basically in the range of two kilohertz like that range. So at that range, like current detectors are not sensitive that much. But uh, so it's basically I cannot we cannot clearly say the if it favors the excitation of the motion. But if you can include because the base factor is very comparable. But if you include the base factor, this F mode dynamical type, what will how do we find is basically uh, the lambda tilde is basically the standard parameter. It the upper bound decreases by up to 15 percent under the radius estimation. This basically upper bound decreases 500 meter. Okay, so this is what we found this recent paper. It's done with uh, Aditya Vijay Kumar from ICDS. Most of people know maybe. Uh, so this is the thing. Then you uh, okay. So I am skipping this. Basically, this is the injection study for the future observation. We also find like a, you can see like this. Like maybe this side. Okay. So the true the mock data is basically assumes uh, you have the F mode in the oscillation. In the excited, F modes are excited in the waveform. You correct the dynamic data, but when you recover, you do two different thing. Like uh, you ignore the excitation and you keep the keep the excitation. Then you see that like uh, these are the injection. So when you ignore the F mode excitation the recovery fails to explain. Basically, these are these, these models, this this sign colors are showing if you ignore F mode. So it seems like if you ignore F mode, it's like overestimates the lambda delta also fails to recover. This. These, are, uh, these are the conclusions. Thank you. Questions? Why you are giving like uh, use the F mode calculations or F mode basically? Yeah, that's I always stated. So basically, if you look at the simulations, if you look at the first thing, so, okay. So the G modes are also significant uh, because in so sun people are working mostly in the G mode. But the thing is, the G mode, uh, the impact they have in the like the waveform or in case of like the energy. Well, basically, you need to detect something. Okay, so the G mode has very this is like insignificant. It's basically the what the impact you will get is very insignificant. The second thing is the higher P modes are the very good, very high energy, and the frequency is too high. Our gravitational wave, if you look at this uh, this uh, spectrum, they will basically if I don't know if I have this. Okay, I, yeah. So for example, like if you look at this thing, the frequencies are basically like basically even in two three kilohertz range, the sensitivity is too bad. Okay, you cannot have the P modes. They will not have any like uh, you, you cannot predict that any signals in the P modes. And if you look at the simulation possibility, the first thing is F modes are basically is a simulation shows that F modes are excited. F modes, F modes are being excited in different phenomena. So basically, the phase transition, if you are in a binary. Uh, the thing is that uh, the detective that you talked about detecting the detector, uh, the strength of the detective signal would uh, like LIGO or other uh, like other you can detect. And what uh, okay. if you have any experience like? Okay, so the recent understand the signals. Yeah, so I have mentioned what is the energy required basically. If you look at this, uh, I didn't mention told you the energy required is basically this. If you it's a basically typical, you can do all the parameter space, but with technical typical canonical neutron star and place it or like in the 10 kilo per per sec or per 15 kilo per 15 mega per sec. So how much energy required? Then these are like the situations. Assuming all the gravitational wave and all the energy goes to our solar, but this is not true. But the channel, for example, so this glitch event as well as explosion event. So, if actually how much fraction is go is still a matter of question. The modeling is still going on. We don't have a clear model uh, how much fraction is still going energy. But uh, there's a archive paper recently. So, for the O3 catalog, they search the magnetars like oh, for the F modes, they don't find anything in between. Okay, till now. Okay, so actually we are running late, so I would request you to please discuss the part of the talk. So then let's thank this speaker again. And I think my approach. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. It's more audible. Start. So our next speaker is Koshik Paul, and he'll be talking about the spin effect and essentially higher modes from the spiraling compact binaries. So Koshik Paul, you have the speaker with us. I'll remind you one time. Yeah. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Koshik from IIT Madras. 
So I'll be talking about spin effects in eccentric hiromorphs from inspiring compact binaries up to 2 in order. And this talk is based on the paper, which is uh, appeared on archive, and I have already listed the archive identifier. Yeah, so this is the outline of my talk. I'll just uh, give you the brief overview and then go into the technical details of my talk and then show my results and conclude with uh, some key points. Yeah, so according to GR, we know that uh, any non spherical motion of mass creates a disturbance in the fabric of the space time. And these, uh, these are referred to as gravitational shows, right? And uh, these GWs are, uh, can be uh, categorized by in four types. Uh, first two are the CBC and burst sources. These are the short-lived uh, sources. And the next two are the continuous waves and stochastic waves. Now, now to give an example for each uh, uh, category, so CBC source, uh, uh, if you have two compact objects, uh, they are inspiring towards each other. They are emitting GWs, hence losing energy and momentum. They are orbit shrinks and they eventually merge and form a single black hole or, or a compact uh, object. The burst signal, uh, the prime example is uh, the non spherical supernova explosion. Not all supernova explosion will give you GWs. There should be a non spherical thing attached to it. Continuous waves, uh, rapidly rotating Newton star, it will uh, emit uh, continuous waves. And stochastic waves, of, of course, uh, uh, at the time of uh, Big Bang, uh, like there is a cosmic background uh, created by the primordial gravitational waves, uh, which is a nat natural possible uh, uh, example. Okay, and now uh, one might ask uh, why we uh, need to model uh, the gravitational wave uh, source, right? Uh, it is simply because uh, LIGO detectors give us the data which is noisy. So the event and the noise are embedded uh, in it, right? So we need some technique to extract out the uh, event from the noisy data. So we rely on some uh, technique called match filtering uh, in which we cross correlate the data with the bank of templates uh, or wafer models. Now, uh, these uh, cross correlation when they are significant, so typically the match between the data and the uh, template should be 99% or greater than 99%. Then we get a uh, peak in the SNR time series. So this is a typical uh, stain and SNR time series plot from one of the uh, one, one of the event of the Hanford detector. And as you can see, so the solid line is the template, and the red thing is the uh, noise noisy data. Now, when the match is significant, we get a peak uh, in the SNR time series. So yeah, such uh, stringent uh, requirements. Uh, regarding the match between the two uh, has motivated the GW modeling community to model uh, different sources and include di different physical elements. Yeah, so um, our prime aim is to co compute these spin effects of compact objects in eccentric higher modes from inspiring compact binaries up to 2 p n order. Now, uh, by modes, I mean uh, spherical harmonic modes. Why spherical harmonic modes? Uh, it is simply because uh, numerical simulations uh, use these uh, expressions, use these, uh, they can be extracted in from the inner simulations exactly in this form. And also uh, we can get, uh, we can combine usual spherical harmonic basis with, with these uh, spherical harmonic modes to get the polarization amplitudes, like two polarization amplitudes we have from uh, GR, H plus and H cross, and which, which are eventually used in data analysis purposes, right? So yeah, and uh, why we need to model the spins, higher modes and eccentricity? Uh, sim spins because simply uh, spins of the individual compact objects are one of the most significant physical effects that largely modify the gravitational wave form. And if we do not incorporate those physical effects in 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 in, in our uh, model, then we'll be losing significant amount of signal, and hence uh, it will uh, it will uh, eventually uh, lead us to uh, lead us to uh, lower SNR and uh, low detection efficiency. SNR by I mean uh, signal to noise ratio. Now, by higher modes, uh, well, uh, for binaries of equal mass systems, it is totally fine to include the higher modes only. Uh, sorry, uh, dominant mode only. That is a two-two mode. But when we talk about, uh, say, the uh, systems with uh, unequal or asymmetric masses, right? Then the higher modes uh, get turned on. And if we do not incorporate these effects for arising from higher modes, then again, will uh, will be uh, will be th this will result in uh, re result into uh, uh, lower SNR and 
we will lose a significant amount of signal. And of course, eccentricity. So this is the hot topic for O4, upcoming O4 run, which will start from March next year. So eccentricity eventually uh, corrects all the uh, all the part of gravitational wave form. So be it uh, amplitude uh, phase. So if we do not incorporate those uh, uh, corrections, then our model will not uh, detect any eccentric systems. It will still say uh, eccentric system is uh, surpluses. So that's that is wrong, right? And uh, also looking at the value of the eccentricity, we can say that uh, what are the formation channels of the binaries, whether it, whether uh, it has formed from high electric mergers or then metal uh, star clusters and so on. Now this is a, a typical uh, figure which nicely summarizes three distinct phases of uh, compact binary coalescence. So eventually, uh, so first of all, when the two compact objects are uh, largely separated and they can be treated as point particles, uh, they uh, eventually uh, inspire towards each other and emit gravitational waves and hence uh, lose energy and momentum and eventually they merge and form a single compact object. Right? And mm -hmm. these three distinct phases in spiral, merger and ring down can be, uh, can be accurately modeled by three uh, different uh, tools. The inspiral region is modeled with post-Newtonian techniques the merger uh, regime is uh, modeled using numerical relativity, which is to solve uh, Einstein's uh, equation using supercomputer. And ring down, of course, uh, using cell force approaches like black hole perturbation theory. So our whole focus will be in this region, uh, the inspiral region. And to model the inspiral regime, we rely on some uh, something called post-Newtonian approximation, which is, of course, the flagship uh, approximation to model the inspiral uh, regime. And post-Newtonian approximation is just a power series expansion in parameter V by C, uh, where V is the relative velocity between the two compact objects and C is the speed of light. And it has a validity. It is only valid for slowly moving and weakly cell gravitating system. And by slowly moving, I only mean that the velocities between the two compact objects will be of the order of 0.3 or 0.4 uh, times the speed of light. So it is mildly relativistic. And uh, yeah, uh, and in PN terminology, uh, any term which is of the order of epsilon to the power n, which is relative to the Newtonian term, which is zero PN term, is termed as n by two PN term. So for so for instance, if we have a if you have a term which is of the order of epsilon square, then uh, it is termed as one PN term. Okay. Yeah. Now let me move on to the technical part of it. Uh, and uh, so these are the spherical harmonic modes H lengths which are uh, related to their uh, radiative multiple moments of the radiation that the compact object is radiating. Uh, and sorry. And, uh, and yes, uh, this UVLMs and VLMs are the non-STF uh, radiative source and uh, current and mass multiple moments. Now, yeah, okay. Now these ULMs uh, are related to the ST, uh, STF counterparts uh, like these two equations, where by STF I mean symmetric and test-free part of the tensor quantity. Okay. Now, an interesting th thing here to note that for non-spinning systems, as well as spinning systems, uh, as long as you have static spins, not processing spins, you can identify these modes uh, like these uh, characteristics. Like if you have an even mode, say for uh, two-two mode, you can only u two-two will contribute to h two-two, so uh, v two-two will be zero. It doesn't have any contribution. For odd modes, L plus M odd modes, suppose you have two one, you are talking about two one mode, only V21 will contribute to H21, and you, you do not have any contribution from uh, U21. And these radiative multiple moments, ULs and VLs, which are of course tensor quantities, are related to the actual source properties, uh, like ILs and VLs in, in leading order in this equation, according to, to this equation. And uh, the term in the parenthesis. Uh, is denotes the order of time derivative of the particular quantity. Now, spins can uh, have corrections in the source multiple moments. So these IAs and JLs are called source multiple moments, mass and current multiple moments, and these characterize the source properties. And spins can have corrections at particular PN orders, and the introductions of spins are categorized in two, uh, two ways. One is the spin orbit, SO, uh, which is the coupling between spins of individual compact objects and the orbit of the orbital angular, angular momentum vector. And the spin spin uh, coupling is the individual uh, coupling between individual spins of the compact objects. And NS is the non spinning part. 
So yeah, so these are uh, the structural form. Of course, I, I haven't given the explicit form uh, here. And similar to uh, source multiple moments, acceleration also will have uh, spin corrections appearing at particular PN order. So at 1.5 PN order, we'll, we'll be having a spin orbit term. And at 2 PN order, we'll be having a spin spin term. Okay. Now, uh, so, so these two are my inputs. Okay. Uh, so these two uh, are my inputs, source multiple moments and acceleration. And we use these inputs and we differentiate source multiple moments. And since, since source multiple moments are functions of position, velocity, masses, and spins, hence we, when we take the time derivative of it, the position uh, will be shifted to velocity, velocity will shift to uh, acceleration. And we use that acceleration equation and uh, put the value of acceleration and collect all our terms at particular PN orders. And we uh, we get the uh, general orbit uh, expressions. So these are the structural form. This equation, along with this equation, uh, yeah, this equation gives us the structural form of uh, spin corrections in spherical harmonic modes. And uh, I have only listed the two two mode here. Uh, so as you can see, uh, two two so two two s gives you the spin, spin spinning part, and uh, one over c cube and one upon uh, c four means the one point five pn and two pn uh, terms. So yeah, these are the spin variables, uh, and uh, uh, since we have computed uh, the spin corrections to other other modes as well, that is appearing up to two pn order. Um, we only list the two two model. Now we go a step forward. We uh, use uh, these general orbit expressions, and we use quasi Keplerian representation to write all our general orbit ex uh, expressions to valid for elliptical orbits. And how do we do that? We uh, write our dynamical variables like r r dot phi phi dot in terms of uh, orbital variables like same as axis, eccentric anomaly, mean anomaly, and eccentricity of the orbit. And uh, we get the uh, get the uh, mode similar mode expressions valid for elliptical orbit case. Now uh, again, th this equation along with this equation gives us the structural form of it. And here only we list the two two mode here. And these chi's, uh, chi a and chi's are the symmetric and anti-symmetric combinations of individual dimensional spins of the compact object. Uh, again, uh, I, I would like to mention, I have we have computed all the other modes as well, since uh, they run over several few pages. Uh, I have listed that in the main text of the paper. If you any anybody is interested, they can look into the paper. Yeah, so to summarize, so these three points has already been explained. Now, what are the uses of uh, these analytical expressions? Uh, so we currently do not, do not have any eccentric spinning uh, waveform. Uh, so data analysis guys like tells the waveform modeling community to give us some waveforms, right? Otherwise, how we can detect uh, eccentric spinning uh, event if they, they exist. Any. So these analytical expressions can be used to uh, develop one uh, model like Enigma, which is another project of mine I'm involved in. Enigma is currently an eccentric non-spinning waveform. Uh, and uh, we are developing that waveform and we are upgrading that waveform for eccentric spinning case. So, and it is a time domain, domain IMR waveform. So yeah, uh, hopefully it will, it will be developed by the end of March next year. Thanks. So, uh, because I'm not from this field, so yeah. if you are uh, seeing this effect irrespective of the component of this binary, I mean, neutron, neutron, star. Yeah, if these results are valid for all the uh, compact objects. Like, uh, I don't know what happened. It's not changing the slides. Next, uh, can you go to the results slide? Uh, one step further. No, no. Uh, can you go to the quasi Kepler representation? Yeah. No, 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 no. Later slides. Uh, yeah. Uh, next slide. Yeah. This one. Uh, this kappas. These uh, kappa a and kappa s are the spin induced quadruple moment. So they take values of one to twenty four newton stars, depending upon the equation of states, as uh, Bikram mentioned. Uh, and for black holes, these kappas has values of one. So you can uh, use this analytical expression for any compact object, be it black hole, black hole merger, be it neutral star black hole, be it neutral star uh, or white dwarf star. Yes. So let's take the speaker again. Now we have going have. Uh...
Shall I start? Yeah, so you have 90 seconds. Uh, okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Deepika from Cochin University of Science and Technology. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee of uh, YAM 2022 for giving me this opportunity. Uh, this poster is a, a work uh, which is published in EPJC, and this is uh, done under the supervision of uh, Dr. Titus K. Matthew. Uh, here we have uh, investigating the evolution of a flat FLRW universe uh, with the Sally's holographic dark energy and uh, dark matter as entities. Here we consider Sally's holographic dark energy as a dynamical vacuum. Uh, we consider the Sally's entropy, which is given in this equation two, as the horizon entropy. And then using the uh, holographic principle, we have evaluated the dark energy density as given in the equation three. Here we also consider the interaction between the Sally's holographic dark energy and the dark matter and the resulting interacting holographic dark energy model solution is given in equation six. And that shows that this uh, model shows an uh, decelerator expansion during the asymptot uh, in the asymptotic limit, A tends to zero, and uh, it shows an accelerator expansion in the asymptotic limit, A tends to infinity. We have also evaluated uh, the model parameters uh, by constraining the uh, model with the observational data, including the supernovae IA data, OHD data, CMB, and BAO data. Further analysis also shows that here in the figure one, uh, the Hubble parameter, we can see a uh, decreasing nature of Hubble parameter with the cosmic time, and that is consistent with the observational data. We also study the deceleration uh, evolution of the deceleration, uh, deceleration parameter that is shown in the figure two. We can see a transition from the uh, matter dominated uh, epoch to a accelerating epoch and the transition takes place at a redshift of around 0.8 we have also evaluated the uh, expansion profile of the hol salis holographic dark energy and the matter density and that is shown in the figure three the figure four is a state finder evolutionary trajectory and that shows that in the early uh, stage uh, it is showing a matter dominated evolution and then uh, it uh, reaches of uh, in future it is showing a lambda cdm approach and figure five is the phase space uh, evolution of the phase space tra trajectory hello yeah, so your time is over. Uh, okay, uh, I was just conclude. Uh, the phase space trajectory, trajectories, it the figure five, it shows that uh, the uh, model is uh, evolving towards a stable equilibrium. And we have also done the uh, thermodynamical analysis that is shown in figure six. So in uh, as a conclusion, I would like to say that this model just shows the late time acceleration. Thank you. Seva? Are you there? Seva? Yes, yes, yes. So you can unmute yourself. Yes, yes. We cannot hear you, Seva. Are you Yeah, so we'll come back to you later. Or we can't hear you. Shantan, you can unmute yourself. Shantan. Hello. Yeah, Shantan. Yeah. Good afternoon. This is Shantan Pal from SESI Isar, Kolkata. I will talk about radiation reaction effects. It is essential to look into the effects of gravitational radiation reaction as they become very important effects in the system of EMRIs, which are extremal mass ratio 
in spirals we start with the consideration of electromagnetic radiation reaction and attempt to build up from here to gravitational radiation reaction the equation of motion for a charged particle is given by the lad equation also known as lorentz abraham dirac equation this equation includes radiation reaction effects which can be seen in the second part of the equation of motion uh, this leads us to uh, this is a third third order differential equation and this leads to a few difficulties so we attempt to solve this using a uh, fresnel formalism to uh, obtain different parameters of motion um we use reduced order led equation also known as ll equation um using this we obtain approximate results of fresnel parameters such as the uh, thomas precession correction and all uh, now the uh, attempt uh, that we tried was to obtain exact solutions of led equation using fresnel formalism we obtain a force that is required to get the particle in circular motion and uh, we see that um, uh, a central force cannot keep the particle in central in in circular motion we need an additional additional uh, force to um, consider the radiation reaction effects then we move on to um, okay then then we try to numerically solve the uh, uh, solve the led equation we use psi phi solve ivp we prepare a electromagnetic electrostatic external field and the particle is allowed to move in a circular motion we we obtain the relativistic corrections which is visible by the red red line in the first plot and we also obtain the radiative correction which is uh, given by the uh, uh, blue plot blue line yeah. yeah yeah i will conclude also we obtain that the force required to uh, continue a circular motion cannot be a central force and uh, um uh, we are developing a formalism to study the addition reaction effects using planetary tetrad and future works will expand on different space times thank you Pallavi, unmute yourself. Pallavi. Yes, sir. So we'll get back to you later. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. Shweta. अभिषेक कुमार श्रीवास्तव एंड डॉक्टर जीवन पांडे माइ वर्क इज बेस्ड ऑन दिस ऑफ सुपर फ्लेयर्स ऑन यंग to star a bit more uh, using xmm newton's data super flares are the flares having energy greater than 10 to the power 33 earth and um, in case of a bit of we have found an energy greater than 10 to the power 35 earth so our main objective here is to find out the coronal properties of the star such as do length peak temperature luminosity density or even magnetic field uh, and for obtaining these parameters we have used the time result spectroscopy method in which we have developed smaller time segments and created the spectra for spectra using the apec and bapec models modeling the flare we have found the length of the order of 10 to the power 10 cm uh, and a maximum flare temperature around uh, 50 to 80 million kelvin we also found that the ebido shows the inverse fip effect during the quiescent and even uh, during the flare phase in which the elements with lower fip are under abundant as compared to elements with higher fip as shown in the figure um yeah thanks next hello indrajit hello can you hear me yes yes go ahead yeah so good afternoon everyone i am indrajit paul uh, currently doing my phd in nizer bhubneshwar this poster is regarding my work on the instrumental characterization of wallop for passive survey 
Specific survey is an optopolarimetric survey that aims to create a three-dimensional tomographic map of magnetic field over the galactic polar region. For that, we need to measure the polarization of millions of stars. To do that, wide area linear optical polarimeter that is WALO is used as polarimeter. To get the polarization, we need to perform photometry very accurately. Now, what is for photometry? Photometry is the method of measuring flux for any source. There are mainly two kinds of photometry, aperture photometry and point spread function PSF photometry. PSF photometry is more efficient than aperture photometry for stars with a low signal to noise ratio. So for our case, we will choose uh, PSF, photometry, uh, PSF photometry. In PSF photometry, we must know the PSF. So uh, for polarimeter, polarimeter with a small field of view, the PSFs are mainly uh, ideally Gauss, Gaussian, but for wall -up, due to the large field of view the shape of the psf varies significantly across the whole field of view so first we need to model the psf here in this poster we present a method of uh, psf modeling using principal component analysis pca technique which is a very popular method for reducing dimensionality in large data set we have also shown that uh, model psf uh, we have also shown that uh, we can reconstruct the distorted uh, uh, shape of the PSF using five principal components and also this model PSF uh, performs very accurately in photometry with the accuracy proposed in in this survey for detailed in information you can take a look uh, at my poster thanks Thank you. hello Sheikh. hello Yes, go ahead. Hello everyone, I am Saif and I am presenting my work on prototype antenna feed for observations at decimeter and meter wavelength. The objective of this work is to develop a prototype tracking broadband antenna for solar and other astronomical object observations in 200 to 600 megahertz range. For this work, we have designed a log periodic dipole antenna with reasonable gain and attached to a tracking setup. The tracking setup can be seen in figure one and figure two. We have used commercially available dissect motors and controllers. These motors uh, generate very minimum RFA, less than minus 100 dBm, which is an important criteria for radio observations. The purpose of having such an antenna and a tracking system instead of a traditional reflector dish with some broadband feed is, dish antennas would not have uniform gain throughout the operating bandwidth, and also they have high return loss. In figure four and figure five, an example is shown such that the the present system has an uniform gain compared to a dish antenna and has very less return loss. With this antenna setup, we have designed a two element cross correlation spectrograph. As a digital backend, we have used Snapboard, which is an FPGA board developed by Casper. We have used polyphase filter banking for, observe, for obtaining a spectrum. Here are the uh, observed fringes at 458 MHz with non tracking stationary mode. Uh, it is in figure 9 and with the tracking mode in figure 10. With the tracking mode, you can observe that the observational time has increased along with the uniform gain. Below last image uh, uh, is the detection of a solar burst at 458, 458 megahertz, which is possible because of this tracking system. For more information, you can refer this poster. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. So uh, there's the information the uh, remaining uh, posters, e-poster of this session will be uh, listening in the next session. We are actually running out of time and there's a value talk at 4 p.m. Yes, okay, so guys, let's split for tea now. So at 4, we'll have two invited talks. One is by the ASI PVC. So um, uh, Devendra Nandi will be I mean, joining us online. So we expect all of you to be here. And at 4.30, we'll have a talk by persistent technology. So we expect you all to be here. To be excited. But different from our usual meeting. See you at 4. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> 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 
Hello, anybody there? Yeah, Dibindu, we can hear you. Okay, all right. Um, and uh, you can see me as well? Yes, we can. Yes, can someone from the auditorium confirm this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can okay. see you and we can. Yeah. Double, double, double. All right, Virendra, how are you? I am fine, down with a bit of cold. That's all. Okay, it must have been quite hectic for you. Uh, yeah, a bit. <laughs> but never mind. It was a good experience. All right. Uh, so uh, I hope you all can hear me. So, uh, so as I told you today, this ESCM, we are having some outreach activities going on. So as you saw in the pictures, so we have already sent teams to seven schools. And today we have Professor Devendu Nandi from SESI. And he will be highlighting the activities of PUNC. So before I uh, let them hand on the stage, let me introduce you. So Professor Devendu Nandi is from Kolkata. He graduated in physics from St. Xavier's College and then moved to ISC where he received his Master of Science and PhD degrees in 1997 and 2003 respectively. Subsequently, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at Montana State University in the US. He was the 2012 recipient of the Karen Harvey Prize for the, of the AAS. And this is the first time a space scientist from Asia Pacific has received that prize. Currently, he is the principal investigator and the head of the Center for Excellence in Space Sciences, SESI, at Isar Kolkata, and leads a vibrant solar research group there. More relevant to this session, so he has the Public Outreach and Education Committee, the POEC, working under the ambit of the Astronomical Society of India. He is working with the aim of increasing public interest, awareness, and understanding of astronomy in India. So please welcome Professor Devendu Nandi. Thank you. Um, so I actually have not prepared any slides, so I want to just impromptu talk. Um, so should I just go ahead and begin? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, so just a couple of days back on uh, 9th December, uh, no, sorry, 9th November, uh, there was the birthday of Carl Sagan, who to many of us uh, symbolizes the heights of astronomy, outreach, and education. And I want to quote him uh, before I sort of begin this uh, discussion on the Astronomy Society of India's Public Outreach Committee. Uh, so begin quote, uh, it has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we have ever known. This was uh, in reference to the famous image, which is known as the pale blue dot, uh, which was taken by the Voyager spacecraft when its cameras were turned around for one last time looking towards Earth, um, which was something that Carl Sagan had convinced NASA to do, in fact. Um, I begin with that quote because it also underscores to us the importance of uh, connecting to the public while we live in this only planet that we know to harbor life and to also highlight the science that we do while we are searching for life in other worlds. Um, so what I would like to do is to begin with a brief overview of the Astronomical Society of India's Public Outreach and Education Committee and the current committee members and its terms of reference and what is his vision for the next three, four years that we have worked out. So what I'd like to do is share my screen uh, to share that um, vision with you. So I hope that you can see my screen now. Can we just confirm that you're seeing my screen? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, um, yes. let me begin with the, with the committee members and the terms of reference. Um, so we have core committee. Core committee is led by, by me. Virendra Jadav, whom many of you have met and whose act is, is the co-chair of uh, this committee. And we have members from various institutions, uh, starting from ISERS, Indian Institute of Astrophysics, IUCA, uh, Thapar Institute of Engineering and Technology, Institute of Mathematical Sciences. Uh, we have members from planetaria, such as the Calicut Planetarium, uh, as well as HBSE TIFR, which is a center for, for education. We also have a member from Vigyan Prasar. Now this is the core membership, but we also have associate members and associate members represent uh, institutions which are either not featured in the core membership 
or which uh, are from institutions who would like to get involved in astronomy outreach. Now, this associate membership list is something that is open um, uh, for us to edit and evolve and involve more members, particularly from non-traditional university setups where astronomy is being pursued. So if there are people here um, attending this conference who are from the university setup, if you have a vibrant astronomy group and you would like it to be represented in the Astronomical Society of India's Public Outreach and Education Committee, please get in touch with me and drop me an email or just get in touch with Virendra, who's going to be there tomorrow. So what is our terms of reference? So the terms of reference as provided by, by the Astronomical Society of India's uh, Executive Committee is to plan campaigns and create resource materials uh, for different outreach events and for the public awareness about astronomy in India through various forums like talks, competitions, and events. To popularize and highlight latest research results from India, um, in particular uh, from the annual and other scientific meetings of the ASI, through social media, news articles, uh, press reports, and blogs. And I'll talk about this in greater detail at the end of my talk and tell you how you can get involved in this process. Uh, to maintain a web page of resource materials and other events being conducted online and offline, and to utilize the budgetary allocation of uh, the ASI uh, to, to our committee um, for uh, public events in association with the Executive Council of the ASI. Um, I want to give you a sense of, um, of what activities we have been involved in the past and what is being planned in the future. Now we maintain a web page, and what we are seeing here is, um, is the Astronomy Society of India's outreach web page, which is maintained by us. And if you follow up this web page, you'll get various details regarding how to get in touch with us, what activities have we performed in the past, and what activities are being planned in the near future. For example, if you go to this activities page, you will find details of our recent engagements. Um, let me highlight, for example, our engagement at the International Astronomical Union General Assembly. So if you click this, it will take you to a research page where there is a list of posters that were made, which are on display at uh, the booth of the Astronomical Society of India. This was the first ever booth of the Astronomical Society of India at the IU General Assembly which we're very proud to host. And this was my first assignment as the POEC chair. Uh, this, was, this was a huge success. We had uh, a couple of special events. There was an India day where people turned up in traditional Indian clothing, um, where we had a formal inauguration by the president and the executive um, uh, secretary of the IU. We also had a raffle, a quiz competition, um, where we asked various questions regarding you know, inter, India, Indian astronomy facilities, regarding their locations, regarding important contributions to astronomy made by Indian scientists, based on which various prizes were distributed uh, to the attendees at our booth. Um, if I go back now, uh, you will find our recent engagements, for example, partial solar eclipse that occurred uh, just last month uh, was, uh, was streamed live in association with various organizations from around um, the, the country, uh, including Institute of Astrophysics, ARIES, and other places. And we created various resource materials that is here um, regarding the path of, of the eclipse, the timings, the visibility, and links to the live stream. We followed this up more recently with uh, the lunar eclipse uh, that was also visible well, mostly in the eastern, eastern part of the country, but um, uh, partially across India. And you'll will, you know, you will find resources that we created in association with various astronomical institutes um, highlighted here. Um, we have an ongoing activity, which is the name and exoplanet activity, um, which is being conducted by the IU Office of Education at IUCA in association with, um, with the ASI. And this is an ongoing activity and get to hear about it as we, as we, as we, as we progress um, in, the, in, the, you know, in, the, in the near future. 
Okay, so what is the vision that we have for astronomy, education and outreach in the country? Let me talk a little bit about this. Um, okay, so this is the vision document that we came up with, the current uh, committee came up. This is to popularize activities of the Astronomical Society of India, of course, which we have been doing and which we want to continue to do with a crucial difference. Earlier, the outreach committee would work in isolation and would tend to do everything on its own as a separate independent body. However, um, we have realized that every institution, at least the big institutions have their own outreach committees and are now required to do outreach uh, from, from their own domains. So the ASI outreach committee from now on will be working closely with all these existing setups within the astronomy institutions in, in popularizing astronomy activities in India. Um, we will be highlighting research results um, from, from various academic organizations. Um, and I want to highlight here that by various academic organizations, I also imply non-traditional astronomy institutions like ISERTs, IITs, and the universities. Many of the astronomy institutions also have their own media cells. For example, IUCA is pretty evolved uh, in this matter. The University of Astrophysics is following up. However, many institutions like ISERTs, IITs, and universities do not have any media cells or um, outreach centers which can, which can highlight their research. This is where the POEC wants to step in and ensures that there is equitable and inclusive dissemination of the science that is going on, particularly astronomical sciences that is going on in institutions that have not been highlighted in the past in the national stage. Uh, so you're pretty serious about this. So if the, again, I repeat, if there are people from university setups, from IITs, ISERs, and other institutes which do not have evolved astronomy education, education and outreach cells, please get in touch with us. Talk to Virendra. Give us your contact. We'll be happy to give, you know, get you on board uh, into the SIPOC committees and make sure that any important results in astronomy that is coming out from groups all across India is adequately highlighted. Um, well, so we also want to, along the same lines, create short nuggets of important astronomy results emanating from India. And in this sense, um, I don't know how many of you follow, but NASA and various US organizations actually bring up such nuggets. ASI POEC already brings out uh, a astronomy picture of the month from AstroSat mission, but we want to really uh, do this more regularly where pretty much on a weekly basis, we would like to bring out a short nugget um, with uh, nice graphics and something to do with a recent result that has been published uh, from anywhere in, in, in India, which you deem important to be highlighted. And this is where, again, I would invite all of you to get in touch with us if you think that you have done a piece of work which requires to be highlighted, which is of general broad relevance to the public, we'd be happy to highlight this. Um, we would also like to assist organizations without outreach offices to draft press releases. Uh, this is a problem that is faced by, again, institutions which do not have press offices or media sets. Um, there is an institution such as Cosmic Varta, which is already doing it. This is a nice student-led activity which highlights astronomy initiatives around the country. And um, we invite the students, not just Cosmic Varta, but any others, to become associated with us in helping us write these nuggets and draft this press release. Um, there are a couple of things here which doesn't really concern you, so that we'll, I'll not go into details um, uh, of that. Um, but uh, there is also something about inclusivity that I want to highlight. So the Astronomical Society of India also has a group called uh, the Group on Gender Equity. Uh, this working group on gender equity looks at inclusiveness um, to strive towards a balance across genders and uh, various representative groups in astronomy to look at the problems uh, that they are facing. So we are also going to liaison with this group uh, to highlight 
women astronomers in the country. And by women astronomers in the country, I don't really mean only women faculty or women scientists. Um, we also mean women students, female students who are involved in, in the pursuit of astronomy in India. So we, are, we would like to initiate a series of talks, uh, which is called Women in Astronomy Talks, um, after we you know, get rid of some, some stuff that is right in front of us. Uh, this activity will start in earnest um, early next year. And uh, you know, we'd love to have volunteers who step up and volunteer to give talks uh, in this uh, Women in Astronomy. Um, again, uh, this spot is relevant for you. Uh, so we, we have been also, of course, working with the EC to rejuvenate YAM and to figure out ways in which uh, you could, we could bring in the early career astronomers, the students, into the fold of public outreach and communication of astronomy to the nation. I want to spend a few moments here to highlight why is this fundamentally important for you? I mean, ASI has a duty to do this. Various astronomy organizations have a duty to do this because we are funded by the public. Now, your research, your scholarship is also coming from public funds, from public taxpayers' money. So each of us have a responsibility to highlight the work that you're doing in a way that is accessible to the public who's funding your science. So you might think of that as a responsibility, but is this in any way helping you? How could this help you? Well, you see, and this most people don't talk about, you can write fantastic research papers, you can have a lovely CV, but someday you'll be standing in front of an interview committee, you'll be standing in front of a huge audience where you'll be portraying your research or you'll be selling yourself in, in the sense that you're selling your expertise, your experience, and your abilities in a, you know, in a faculty application or a postdoctoral fellowship application, right? Okay, so therein, if you are not a good communicator, irrespective of the quality of your work that you have done, you are not going to have a big impact. Or alternatively, if, the, if you have serious competition and there are people with almost equal CVs, the person who has the best presentation, who can connect with the crowd, who's sitting on the other side of the table, is going to be the person who's favored by the committee. So, so practicing science communication, both in writing press releases, in writing science nuggets, in trying to portray the technical science that you're doing, in a simple way that is accessible to a broader, broader audience, being able to speak about the work in a way that connects you and your life and your work with the audience is fundamentally important, right from giving a talk in a conference, writing a research paper, or appearing in front of an interview committee. And I would like you to keep this in mind that this is a quality and ability of being able to just stand up there and being able to communicate is something that you should really inculcate from a young age and at a stage where you are still sort of learning the tricks of the trade in terms of doing a PhD. Um, so I would really like you folks to help us get to do good science outreach and communication and in the process also build your abilities to be a good communicator. Um, well, many of you who are here are probably, most of you are PhD students. Most of you will soon become postdoctoral fellows and the best of you will most likely leave the country uh, to pursue postdoc summer, right? Now, as a community of astrophysicists and astronomers, we're always on the lookout for the best amongst you. And often what happens that this happens in a somewhat somewhat random way where various institutions um, bring out advertisements, people apply, some people apply to some places, other people apply, apply to other places, and there is no really coherence in, in, in the community in understanding what is the base expertise that is available out there. 
Now, a beautiful sort of um, um, process through which the 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 biologist and the Indian Biotechnology Society does this is through the DBT India Alliance Young Investigators Meet, where what they do is they have a symposium where they invite only postdoctoral fellows and senior members of the community from various institutions in India and some from abroad to a conference which toggles sometimes in India, sometimes in US or elsewhere. And this is really a headhunting or a talent searching mechanism where you put all the talent that's available all throughout the world, including India, in, in sort of you know one physical space and time and you have them give talks, you interact with them, and you identify the best talent and you encourage them to apply at your places. Um, so we also would like to initiate this process within the astronomy community. Um, and this is something that is really to help help impact your career and to, and to identify the best amongst you. Uh, finally, also, I already did talk about the associate membership. Um, as I said, that we would really like this uh, committee now to be blown out and not to remain a specific small committee that has been fixed by the EC, uh, but to encourage associate, mem associate memberships from, from underrepresented uh, universities which have astronomy groups. And, and therefore, we also welcome your participation. Um, uh, either you know, communicate those interests to us in writing with a copy to a faculty member at your organization with whom we will continue this conversation forward or alternatively talk to Virendra Yadav, who's going to be present tomorrow physically, um, uh, who, will, who will get your contact and talk to you about how to get involved. I do not know if Cosmic Vartha representatives are there, um, but if you are there, I think you are there because I think tomorrow you have a talk. Um, I will not be able to participate tomorrow, but again, uh, talk to Virendra. We would like to get you on board and expand our, our sort of suit of astronomy communicators and writers around the country and involve students in our activities. Um, so with that, I will sort of stop sharing my screen and end and talk, you know, take questions from, from you if there is any on, you know, on how you perceive our role to be. What would you think that we should be doing that we are not doing very effectively? Um, and if you have any suggestions in terms of your involvement, uh, I'm happy to sort of take the suggestions. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the talk. <clears throat> so now, um, uh, yeah. So now we'll have some questions. So, audience. Any questions about the audience activities? The chair is here, so. Uh, Virendra is also here. I don't know if Virendra wants to add something that I have missed, but Virendra, you're welcome to add in a few comments. Yeah, uh, thank you, Devendu. Uh, so pretty much uh, all the activities and everything, uh, these have been, uh, you know, already mentioned by Devendu and uh, some of you already, you know, participated in uh, some of the outreach activities today. In fact, we visited, uh, uh, I think, uh, four schools uh, today, one school yesterday. Uh, at some places we did, you know, multiple outreach sessions. We had uh, kids as young as kindergarten to write up to 12th grade. We had, uh, uh, you know, uh, a small group of say just 40 to 50 uh, students in a small school and write um, at a place where it was just one grade, but nearly 200 students. So they want us to have more and more such sessions. And uh, so I, I uh, presume that uh, whoever participated in these activities, it was a fun learning experience to you also, for you also. and. Uh, uh, we'll be also sharing some of the feedback uh, from the schools on uh, PUAC uh, social media channels. So you can, uh, you are welcome to have a look at that, what they had to say about uh, the experience. So uh, Dibindu has already highlighted the importance of, you know, sort of uh, selling yourself or communicating uh, your ideas clearly. And uh, it is, I mean, it is a win-win situation. It helps you also. You know, one day you will be standing in front of uh, people who are from different background, sometimes not even from science background, and you will be demanding funds from them. So if you can effectively communicate, it will be really helpful. At the same time, you're also going to, you know, uh, 
help prepare the next generation of scientists you are young scientists today 20 30 years down the line these cool kids will be the young scientists and young astronomers meet uh, in the young astronomers meet so it's really important to you know encourage the next generation and uh, you know inculcate uh, scientific temper in the society as well as generate curiosity among their minds and that's the uh, the most basic idea uh, behind uh, whatever activities we are doing okay so tomorrow when i'm there uh, i'll be able to interact more uh, with you all uh, during the breaks i'll also highlight some of the activities that have been done um, at aries because tomorrow's session is institute specific but <clears throat> i'll be also sharing some of the feedback and you can also talk to the people who visited the schools and i must really uh, thank all of you who agreed to participate in uh, at such a short notice and readily agreed with uh, you know uh, with all the lectures uh, preparing all the kits and i would also like to specially mention uh, atharva who brought all uh, you know uh, nice uh, science toys and helped us uh, you know to understand the demo and uh, helped us in giving those demos to the school kids so yeah that's all um so let me just uh, add that that two events which are upcoming which are heavily invested in um pretty soon the first one is the national space science exhibition that's happening in science city calcutta from 6 to 11 uh, december which many astronomy institutes isro centers are involved in um so if there are folks from 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 the city of calcutta who are here would like to get involved uh, in the outreach activities that are planned again get in touch with virendra or me we are looking for volunteers we expect footfalls of something in the order of 10000 um in the science city during this event uh, the multiple schools uh, were coming the rural outreach events being planned events are being planned at colleges like presidency san xavier's calcutta university iser uh, and in science city Uh, so if any of you who are from the city and would like to volunteer please get in touch with me or or virendra the next big event that is coming up of course is the astronomical society of india's annual meeting uh, which is going to be held in indore um, where asi poc will also be heavily invested in doing outreach activities and if any of you wish to to sign up for volunteering uh, for lecturing in schools for helping helping us um, reach out to local schools and colleges in indoor and set up you know various activities related to astronomy please do also again get in touch with us and of course if you have any questions feel free to ask any other questions correct word yes sir hi uh, so uh, over the past few years uh, i have seen the increase in outreach events quite uh, significantly so that's like uh, uh, something that i have uh, like really appreciate uh, from uh, that is happening from poc uh, the one thing uh, that i uh, felt was uh, sort of not uh, centralized yet which is uh, uh, the research that is done by uh, uh, students and uh, as well as all, all the astronomy uh, institutes in the country uh, basically how to uh, reach how to uh, make our research reach uh, the public which is something that we can see quite uh, easily or uh, quite more widely done uh, in the, uh, the western countries or uh, other places so are there any plans where uh, apart from the cosmic vata uh, thing that we uh, you obviously mentioned in your uh, uh, presentation uh, is it something that is planned where uh, any student can easily like uh, just by a single click of uh, an instagram uh, button we can just share you know, some interesting research that some person from uh, let's say some institute in the country is doing that okay i i understand your question and thank you for bringing this up i mean um the western nations uh, particularly the us nasa has been at the forefront of of uh, sort of selling the research that they do pretty well i mean if you look at some of our organizations including our space agencies we are not really very good at 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 outreach right we don't make fantastic posters i mean look at the talks that you yourself give right i mean if you have if you have to show a simulation or a cartoon of something more likely than not you are going to use use a cartoon or a simulation that has been created in the west right we indians have traditionally been uh, quite backwards in putting our foot forward and and selling ourselves and and this is why the narrative of science is also dominated by the west now let me be very clear on that right 
I mean, if you blame anybody, uh, it is us. I think the scientific community has really built a wall around ourselves, uh, uh, a wall which sort of you know believes that we are these high intellectuals uh, who should not really step out and try to sell our research or talk about our research in a public way to anybody. I think that is fundamentally flawed argument. I've seen my own supervisor give this argument uh, that it's not nice for an intellectual or a scientist to go out and highlight your own research. I think that's fundamentally flawed, particularly so if you are not generating your own money and you are depending on public funds for your research. Now, what is the easy solution to this? The easiest way to do this is to create your own social media account or a social media account for your department or institution which highlights your research and tag the ASI POEC Twitter account and Facebook accounts. Whenever we are tagged on something which is an interesting research result with a paper linked to a paper attached, a nice image, image that is attached, we will retweet it. We, we highlight this through our social media. So please be aware of the ASI POEC Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts. Virendra can tomorrow tell you the, you know, what the Twitter handle and Facebook handles are to tag us. That is the easiest way to ensure that we highlight you. We have a huge number of followers and we can highlight you in social media. Um, the not so easy process, and this is where I believe we need all your cooperation, is, is that you when you feel each of you feel that you have done a piece of work that has broad appeal. And how to test if your work has broad appeal? You go find somebody who is not from your field and try to explain to him or her in five minutes what you have done or write up one, one page, not more than that, 500 words, not more than that, of your own research in a way that is understandable to this person who is not from your own field. And ask this question, do you find this interesting? If the answer is yes, then send it to us. And we will go through this and we will try to figure out if there's ways to improve it and make it into a press release and, and send it out to our contacts in the press. But please be, you know, please use a filter. I mean, don't just send us anything that you are doing, but only send us those which are broadly appealing, which have something so intriguing or interesting that has an appeal to, to people beyond the, you know, beyond your own domain. That is very, very important. In this, of course, what this means is that we also need you to write. We need you to be able to, to portray your research in a way that is palatable to others. And once you get that to us, then we highlight it. So this is an organic relationship that we want to build with all students um, and scientists in the country. So, any further questions? Oh. I have a question. Sorry, did you even hear, hear me or was I muted? <laughs> no, no, we heard you, Dipendu. <laughs> Loud and clear. <laughs> I was muted. I saw that I was muted now. No, 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 no. We, we, heard we heard you. you. We heard you. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I could hear you. Don't worry. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Hello. I have a question. I want to know yes. that uh, you have been talking that by uh, communicating with the general public. Can you be a little louder? I can't hear you. Yeah. So like by communicating with the general public, we also intend to somehow find ways uh, to attract more funding to science. But I would like to ask, are there any activities planned that in which we reach out to the lawmakers or the people in decision and teach them about the science uh, with a perspective which might be more useful to them. Like, why should this be funded or future prospects? Like, how can you use it politically? Well, I don't know whether you have the you have the president of the is. I think he's there. I just heard him, right? <laughs> so okay. So this is this is something that is a very nice solution, uh, in the sense that uh, the the National Academy of Sciences. Um, NSF, uh, in coordination with uh, the American Astronomical Society, the American Geophysical Union, um, actually reach out to the senators. Um, they go to the offices of the senators. They have events in the Senate where they highlight their sciences. Um, 
you know, as a as a means to kind of attract attention to what they're doing. Um, this is, you know, this lobbying word is, is is not necessarily something that's a very palatable word because often lobbying can also be used to do things that are not so nice. But as far as science is concerned in India, this is something that has never been done. And therefore, I think this is a very novel suggestion, which uh, uh, I hope that the ASI president is also listening in. And I would be happy to have a show in the parliament. Let's go get them. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. Why not? Right? I love disruptive suggestions, right? So let's do it. Okay. So, I mean, if you can go all the way to Korea and have a wonderful show there, what the hell is preventing us from going to Delhi and having a show in the parliament? Let's declare an astronomy day and do this next year. Pankar. <laughs> Well, keep in mind. <laughs> See, he's not committing. <laughs> so, uh, uh, let's thank the speaker again. And um, continue with the office session tomorrow also. So, tomorrow we have a session from... Tomorrow, I will not be there. So, the, the stage will be managed by, by Virendra tomorrow. Yeah. So yeah. thank you very much for the opportunity. And um, we really are very open. I mean, I myself personally, I'm a very open person. Those who know me are aware of this. And I think as a committee now also, we are a very open and inclusive committee. And we really want to get, you know, get you all involved. So if you can help us, help you, get in touch. So let's thank the speaker again. And now it's time to move on to our next invited speaker. So our next invited speaker is Dr. Anand Deshpande. So Dr. Anand Deshpande is the founder, chairman, and managing director of Persistent Systems since its inception and is responsible for the overall leadership of the company. He finished his B.Tech with honors in computer sciences and engineering from IIT Kharagpur, and then he moved to U.S. to finish his master's and the PhD degrees. Prior to founding Persistent Systems, he worked at HP in California. He has served in numerous positions at various professional and non-profit organizations and is a part-time member of the Unique Identification Authority of India, UIDAI, the organization which provides us Aadhaar-based services. He is an honorary adjunct professor of practice at the Desai City School of Inter Entrepreneurship at IIT Bombay and the chairman of Board of Governors at IIT Patna and the interim chairman of the Board of Governors at Triple IT Allahabad. Additionally, he has established the DSRA Foundation. This non-profit uh, non entity, it focuses on creating self-employment at scale and thought through the second orbit program in collaboration with Dr. Ashok Korva, he has helped hundreds of entrepreneurs scale up their businesses. And he has been instrumental in providing support for this year's year. So let's invite our speaker, Dr. Anand. Maybe you can unmute yourself and... Yes, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, sir, we can hear you. Yes, I'm at an event outside today, so um, I'm going to try to make the best of uh, what we can do. So I know I have a short 10, 15 minutes here with you. So I want to spend most of that in listening to you and getting your questions. But as we get there, let me start with a few opening remarks. So first is, uh, you know, I'm uh, really impressed that all of you are doing a PhD in astronomy and science and all of those scientific areas. So I want to keep encouraging you to do more research. And as was, as was mentioned by the previous speaker as well, I think it's important that we do cutting edge, world-class, global, and also talk about it. So I'm highly supportive of some of the initiatives that you guys have been doing, and I'm delighted to have been part of it. Uh, the reason this thing got interesting uh, was that for the last several years, I've been working with astronomers, both at Ayuka and GMRT, uh, predominantly in trying to say that, you know, the, in some way or the other, uh, the kind of work you all do has very high data, data management and computing technology related requirements. And as a software business, that's something that we care about. So we have found this uh, relationship between the astronomers and computer scientists to be very fulfilling, interesting, and great opportunities for people in the company to contribute and participate. And that's what uh, I, I'm intrigued by, and I would like to continue to work on this even further. So that's one point I wanted to make. Uh, we had a session recently, and I have Kaustub also on the call who can really answer questions. He's an astronomer by training. He did his PhD from Ayuka. Uh, in general, what I have found is that the skill set you all acquire as part of data analysis and data management are quite relevant, not just in astronomy, but in other fields as well, including software and software development and all of these other areas. 
So I just wanted to leave you with that thought that in case you find that after completing a PhD in astronomy, you don't want to remain in astronomy, but want to take a break and do something different, then the software industry finds your skill very useful and valuable. So I just wanted to mention that as just another uh, thing that I wanted to share with you. And the last thing I want to mention is that for the last several years, I've been focused a lot on helping people become self-employed. So that's another area that I'm that I'm very passionate about. And I think the training that you have in building a doing a PhD actually is the best training for someone to become an entrepreneur. Because you are trying experiments, certain things work, some don't, you are you don't give up, you keep at it, and you have the ability to find the right problems that will give you the degree. So that whole process of how you get to get through your PhD is exactly what an entrepreneur needs to do when they want to do their own business. So I would like to encourage you finally to say that, you know, if you have uh, an inclination, don't let your PhD or your degree hold you back. If you feel like starting your own business, don't hesitate, just go for it. Uh, with this, I'm going to stop here and not really give you a much of a speech. This is a little awkward setting to talk on a video when every one of you is in person. So let me stop here. Uh, let me see if you guys have any questions. We can take those questions or anything else that you would like me to talk about. I'd be happy to share whatever I can for you. Uh, thanks, sir. Thanks. So we'll have some questions. Hold the mic closer to your Yeah. Okay. So uh, questions? Hello, sir. Uh, as persistent system works a lot with astronomers, and uh, there is a mutual this. So many of the companies have CSR initiatives or which are mandated by law. So are you planning something that gives back to the astro community in forms of fellowship or chair professorship or some other? Part okay. Um, no. So let me let me be very uh, let me explain this. Uh, at persistent systems, we believe that our CSR needs to focus on quote unquote below the pyramid or the uh, underprivileged and people of that kind. So we tend to not do anything uh, where you know it's uh, where it may seem elitist in some sense or looking at colleges and various other places like that as part of our CSR activity. That said, we have funded institutions, universities, and various other places because we think there is a business benefit in doing that. Okay, so I want to stress that, you know, investing in science, investing in education, and investing in advanced studies is not just philanthropy, it's actually good business as well. So we do it because it's good business, not because it's good philanthropy. So that's the, um, and we use philanthropy for mainly focusing on the underprivileged in some form or the other. So we might consider seats or whatever else you need, but that will need to make good business sense rather than just philanthropy sense is what my uh, statement here is. Um, other question? Yeah, uh, so, uh, sir, I have a question. I just said that our, uh, I mean, regimes overlap. I mean, we are also working with data and we're also working with data. So is there a way that you can maybe some task force employees here, maybe send them on short-term visits or maybe you can call us for short-term, a couple of months of visit there so we can get a feel of the kind of work you are doing. Or, I mean, they can also come here and maybe teach us something, how to handle big data and maybe it will be visual for both of us. No, absolutely. We would be very interested in exploring that. Let me check if Kaustub is in a position to comment on this topic. Uh, he is part of Persistent and he is part of the astronomy community. So I'm thinking if he is willing to share something that may be a good place to get this going. But absolutely, we would be very interested in uh, hosting you all on those kinds of things. And Nainital is a little far away. I would have loved to come myself, but uh, next year. <laughs> we'll wait for you. So any other questions? Okay, uh, Hi, sir. So, uh, my question is regarding like the the mutual understanding between these corporates and and the educational institute. Like, as you have been involved in both, in in your early career, you have been into this uh, PhD business, and then now you are moving on to these corporate life. So, uh, 
in in india and in uh, abroad you have also experienced both so um, what do you think like is preventing in india is to have like is a more stronger bond between these two uh, fields which is uh, i think is more accessible in the abroad as compared to india so what's stopping um, this this kind of bonding between the corporate and the the education institute in india itself? um so i think there are two three uh, points i would make uh, one is of course both sides need to take a step forward to make this collaboration happen uh, academics also need to look at the problems that the industry is trying to solve and work on some of those areas likewise the industry also needs to have a little bit of an open mind to say that how can we work together to make things happen which may be useful for both parties so there is a little bit of give and take that needs to happen uh, which uh, is something that uh, is not that obvious here in in india it's much more common in the us that people would look at that so um, that said i think we are moving in that direction i think science is also starting to get broader industries are also very keen to partner and one of the things that i'm i'm been i have been advocating is to get employees in companies to uh, attend courses and this can be done now with the nep and all of that so if employees in the company uh, want to uh, learn something new they should be able to take a class with the academics as part of their regular curriculum and get credits that can be banked so if that stuff starts to happen you will see more and more employees from the company starting to attend maybe some you know some kind of analysis class or data analysis class that is offered by astronomy institute because there is similarities in those then that will help in creating the collaboration to happen i have found that the best collaboration happens when two individuals want to collaborate rather than two organizations so getting two two individuals to come together and say hey let's work together is far more efficient and effective than saying two organizations should work together so getting people to people connect is the more important thing to get collaboration to happen so any other question Yeah. Thank you, Anand, for uh, joining in. I think it's been really a privilege for us to get your support also for this activity to be revived. Uh, I completely agree with your comments also. This is the punker here. Uh, yes, so, yes. Um, okay. So, you know, as you mentioned, that, you know, both sides have to be proactive. And I agree, being from the academics, uh, we have been, you know, very close to and in fact all these activities in terms of the yam or all the previous session we had in terms of the public outreach uh, we have realized this and i think it's high time that we open up ourselves and find out our uh, you know uh, our our place in the society our place in the industry as well and we are lucky to have uh, people like uh, you also in the industry side but as you said you know uh, it's it's best a one to one connect rather than two organizations so kosto is again a, a perfect example of this so probably you know as requested from some of the students if you can also assign person like kosto to come and attend some sessions uh, they will find a sort of you know connect there as well because often uh, you know students or faculty also do not know how to connect because of our uh, style of operation uh, so to say so these kind of open sessions uh, Uh, will help uh, to bridge this uh, gap. Uh, incidentally, I know you couldn't make it to uh, Narita, but I think in the mm -hmm. first week of March, you can mark your calendar. So that's our next uh, ASI uh, annual meet, and we'll have also the students out there, so we could even uh, have a session uh, similar to this, and even have a sort of specific session for uh, you know interaction with uh, some of you or people like uh, Kosto who can. assess you know the kind of uh, sentiments uh, the younger generation have here as well so that uh, was my you know, comment uh, yeah no thanks a lot i think indoor in march seems pretty attractive let me see how to work on that and you know just wanted to let you know one last thing in this context see, see kausav doesn't need my permission to come <laughs> he just has to do it himself okay? i'm not uh, we don't have an organization where you know they need to get my permission to do anything actually everyone is empowered to do their own thing so if kausav wants to come and he he wants to come he knows how to get it done and if he is telling you that 
I'm the reason why it's not there in English. My permission. No, 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 no. Definitely not. I think <laughs> we have to pull close. <laughs> uh, there is no such thing. Okay, there he is completely empowered, and he can. Yeah, he has a one boss that he may have to go to, but he can he can make these things happen. So I'll leave it to him to decide on that. I'm not the one who's going to send him, but if he wants to come, he should come anyway. <laughs> Yeah, but thank anyway, you. Let's not let's not worry about him. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> Lord, and it's been a pleasure working with you, Dipankar, and hope uh, we get the chance to work with you in the future as well. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Bye. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you for the So uh, the next thing is we have e-posters, right? Yeah. Okay. So the e-poster participants, I hope you are online. So we have some uh, remaining posters from the last session. So we'll just flash them and. Okay. So. Uh, so Teva, uh, you are there. Teva Singh. Uh, can, can you mute yourself? Uh, we can't hear you. We cannot hear you. Can you just uh, unmute yourself and? Okay. Uh, uh, Seva, can you just uh, rejoin the, the session? Maybe there is some problem with the mic. We cannot hear your voice. We can move on to the next poster now. Uh, we will come back to you. Sir. So next, uh, okay. Uh, okay. So uh, next poster is by Nidhi, and she has sent an audio. So maybe we can play that audio. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nithi Sabu from Christ University, Bangalore. Here I'll be presenting the study of Herbie Gaby stars lying towards the galactic anti-center direction using LAMOS DR5. Based on the presence of H alpha emission lines and IR axis, we identified 119 Herbie Gaby stars, among which 79 are new detections. In figure 1, uh, it represents the special distribution of stars with sun at the center. Herbie Gaby stars from this study is in cyan color, and the well-known Herbie Gaby stars from the literature is in orange color. All are all stars are lying towards the galactic anti-center direction. Since it is a less explored region for red and stars, we use the equivalent width of diffused interstellar bands or DIB to estimate the extinction. In order to validate this method, a comparison of correlation between AV estimated from DIB and Green's dust map is performed as shown in figure 2. We found a higher correlation of distance modulus with the extinction estimated from DIB than the extinction estimated from Green's dust map. Also, we performed a special spectral line analysis from which we found that the Fe2569 emission region could be in the inner disk with an overlap with the H alpha emission region due to which we find a moderate correlation between the emission strength as shown in figure 3. In conclusion, this work has opened up a new opportunity to study the broader aspects of emission lines of Herbie Gay Vistas. This work is submitted to MNRH journal and is under review and you can visit my poster in the Slack channel. Thank you. Thanks, Nidhi. So, uh, next poster is by Devita, she is in the middle. Hello everyone, I'm Devita Saraugi and I am presenting my work on localization of GRBs using AstroSat mass model. So gamma rays burst are the most energetic transient phenomena which astronomers have been studying for decades but haven't understood them fully yet. 
The prompt emission of GRBs which last for a few seconds to minutes give us insight into the emission mechanism of GRBs which we are hunting for and hence it is very important to quickly localize GRBs so that we can follow them up with other ground based and space based instruments for a multi wavelength study which will give us a deeper holistic view of GRBs. Astrosat CZTI is a hard X-ray instrument which has great success in detecting GRBs, but it wasn't designed for localizing GRBs. Hence, uh, what we are doing is, with the help of Astrosat mass model, which is a numerical modeling of the complex satellite structure and its interaction with incoming photons, we explored the possibility of localizing GRBs and found that GRBs coming from the upper hemisphere of the satellite can be localized within 5 degrees. We present our results in the poster and so please take a look. So, our next speaker is Alavi. Alavi, are you there? Yes, yes. Hello. Yeah, am we, I, are just, I... we are just flashing your poster. Uh, yeah, so yeah. You... yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello everyone, I am uh, Pallavi Sharaf from Indian Institute of Astrophysics. So today I will be giving uh, a talk about our recent work entitled Differential Abundance Analysis of the R Process Metal Poor Stars. So one of the major problem in the galactic archaeology is the formation of the heavy element. We know that the light element is produced by the fusion process, whereas the rapid neutral temperature process is responsible for the production of most of the heavy element in the periodic table. But the astrophysical site of the R process is not well known. So here we have plotted two plot magnetic by FP versus metallicity and europium by FP versus metallicity. We know that magnesium is the alpha element and produced by the core collapse supernova, whereas the europium is the R process element. As you can see that in the magnesium by FP plot in the low metallicity region, there is less dispersion, whereas in case of uh, europium by FP plot, there is very large dispersion. That means the site which is producing the alpha element is not producing the R process element. So some of the proposed site of the R process nucleosynthesis are collapses, neutrons are merger, etc. But none of the above sites are well constrained. So in this work, our focus is to constrain uh, the production site of uh, the R process using the differential abundance analysis technique. Usually, people use absolute abundance technique to analyze the stars. For the first time, we are implementing the differential abundance technique to the R process these stars because it allow us to give uh, a high precision abundance analysis. For that purpose, we have chosen one R1 and one R2 stars. So R1 and R2 stars are basically the classification of the R process D stars on the basis of the presence of the European abundance. So we are basically doing the line by line differential abundance, abundance analysis of the R1 star with respect to R2. So this technique permits us to get minimum error. So these are some of the basic information of the standard and the twin stars. So next we estimated the precise atmospheric parameter of the twin star with with respect to the standard star and what we found that our atmospheric parameter of the twin stars are very similar to the standard star so it is the which is the main requirement of the differential abundance analysis and the difference are quoted in the left side then we determined the differential abundances of the element and then plotted the abundance pattern and we found three interesting region as you can see in this plot so here the light element of the r process stars are showing nearly zero differential abundance indicating similar site which is the core collapse supernova and another feature you can notice is that that the first and second r process peak element are not showing the same differential pattern indicating two different sites are contributing to them previous studies basically say that neutron star merger produces the entire r process pattern but here we are confirming a single site cannot produce the observed abundance pattern that we obtained here so it will it requires more than one site to explain the observed abundance pattern of the r process element so these are some of the reference thank you uh, thanks, Pallavi. So, next speaker is Shitesh. Are you there, Shitesh? Hi, yeah, I'm audible. Yeah, you're audible. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Shitesh from Indian Institute of Astrophysics, and I'm doing my PhD project at the Gauri Bidnur Radio Observatory, where I'm developing the Gauri Bidnur Pulsar system. So, before starting, I would just like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't be there in person. Uh, but I remember three years ago, the YAM was conducted at Kodai Canal Observatory. And it was one of the most memorable conference I ever attended. 
and in that uh, we first presented the basic idea and concept of this work and after 3 years we have actually built the system and we have successfully detected some of the pulsars with it and yeah, we are presently in the state of upgrading the system so just to give an overview of this uh, gauri binod pulsar system uh, it's a radio telescope for observations of pulsars and other astrophysical transients at low radio frequencies especially below 100 megahertz and we are concentrating on this particular frequency range because uh, it is the least explored uh, territory when it comes to astrophysical transients so to, to give uh, so, so so this system basically consists of an antenna array of 16 log periodic dipole antenna the details of which can be seen here in figure 1 and the accompanying table and uh, the and at the back end we have an fpga based digital spectrometer which has a very high temporal and spectral resolution the details of which can be seen here in figure 2 and and the accompanying table so with this small prototype system we were able to detect four pulsars out of which one is shown here in figure number 4 and uh, the other uh, the and the results we have published recently in journal of astronomical telescope instrumentation and systems and so after this initial results uh, we were uh, we we are now upgrading the system to have a complete digital beam forming facility uh, as opposed to the previous analog cable based system the advantage of digital beam forming is that uh, simultaneous beams can be formed in the sky Uh, which can cover large area in the sky so which is which is really useful when you are surveying the sky for uh, transients like frbs frbs as we know the fast radio bursts are these mysterious transients which uh, origin of which is not known yet and uh, there have been no frbs detected below 100 megahertz yet so uh, so the upgraded system is under test now and hopefully by the next year maybe we will have some interesting uh, detections thank you thank you this so uh, next contributor is namita Yeah. So, uh, Namita, can you introduce yourself? Hi, hello everyone. I'm Namita Pal from Piral. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Please. Okay. Okay. So, most of the people have seen the bands in the night sky, like uh, the like the uh, photograph shown in the left side. So, this kind of band is uh, what we can see in the night sky is the Milky Way part of Milky Way galaxy, but we. cannot see the complete picture of our galaxy like 3d view of our galaxy because the first problem is that we are living inside our galaxy so we cannot see uh, the galaxy in the same way as we can see the external galaxy and the second thing is to if we want to map our galaxy in the same sense so we we need the position as well as the distance of all the stars present in the galaxy and which is very difficult to do so uh, so what can we do so uh, instead of uh, getting the distance of all the stars let us take sub population which are known as some distance indicator stars and they should be numerously present across the galaxy and these stars after selecting and uh, of, of course the extinction effect will also alter the uh, galaxy structure studies so uh, we should go to the longer wavelengths like uh, going to the near infrared regime will help us to find the numerous number of stars So in this work, we have selected the red clump stars and from the two mass data. So what the method to extract this red clump star is that we have uh, traced the red clump stars in the color magnitude diagram of uh, uh, color magnitude diagram of J uh, two mass uh, by binning in J magnitude and finding the peak in the histogram of uh, J minus K, thus producing a locus and finding the one sigma region. All the stars in this one sigma region are taken as the red clump stars. so this left side plot in the middle panel shows the uh, 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 the schematic what, what what we have used and right side plot represent the uh, uh, population model uh, which explain uh, that all the red red dot stars are in the red clump stars and finding the distance of these red clump stars will help us to uh, study the distribution of these red clump stars in the galaxy and for that we, firstly we have checked the uh, basic parameter of the galaxy like uh, scale length and the uh, red clump uh, solar density so for that we have used a simple uh, exponentially decreasing phase density model from that by using the best fitted parameter we obtained the scale length which are matching with the uh, already previous studies and apart from that we have also studied the uh, red clump stars above and below the galaxy plane now uh, if the uh, if the our galaxy is symmetric then the number of stars above and below the galaxy plane should should be same but uh, here in the last plot we can see a wave like asymmetry and this wave like asymmetry explain that our galaxy is not flat but it is warped upward in one direction and downward in other direction so for more details please contact me in the slack channel or in the email thank you
Okay, so uh, thanks, Namita. Uh, next day poster is Aru. So I think this is the last one. Hello, everyone. I am Arupna Maiti, pursuing this poster deals with the topic of the formation of massive stars. Firstly, massive stars need to for high energetic winds, high radiations, and supernovae. Their formation processes are understood. Studies have shown that mass accumulation through filaments in the half filament system and cloud cloud collision is more favorable in forming massive stars. In this context, our target site host two H2 regions driven by O-type stars. Those H2 regions are named as W31 North and W31 South. W31 South is one of the largest H2 regions in our galaxy. We have attempted a multi-wavelength study for the W31 complex. In VSS 1.4 GHz radio continuum emission is used to trace the ionized regions and the submillimeter data for dust emissions. After analyzing at large scale clumps, both the H2 regions are found at a distance of 3.55 kPa. The Herschel map shows extended dust emission surrounding both the H2 regions. Several filaments are detected to show half filament morphology for the target site based on the Herschel 250 micrometer image. Study of the Cedigism molecular data results in the detection of two cloud components based on the position velocity diagram toward W31 south with a connecting bridge feature. Those two components clearly show the complementary distribution and the radio peak resides exactly on the interface of two colliding clouds. In addition, we found that signatures of cloud-cloud collision are not so prominent toward W31 north. The feedback of the massive stars might have destroyed those signatures there. Therefore, based on our results, we conclude that cloud-cloud collision may be the driving mechanism behind massive star formation and the presence of half filament systems. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, say next, uh, I think we have. No, sir, uh, um, yes, sir. Yeah, so, Seva, we can hear you. Uh, can you see your poster now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can see yeah. my poster. Yeah. So, so good evening, right? everyone. Shall I continue, sir? Yeah, sure. Please go ahead. Shall I continue, sir? Yes, yes. Am please, I audible? Please, sir. Okay. Yes, you're okay. Okay, sir, okay, sir. Good evening, everyone. Myself, Seva Singh, and uh, I'm pursuing PhD from University of Allahabad under the supervision of Professor R. K. Anand. So my poster is on the effect of overtaking disturbances on the motion of strong cylindrical magnetohydrodynamic shock wave in a self-gravitating van der Waals gases. Here I have studied the effect uh, effect of overtaking disturbances on the flow variable that is uh, shock velocity, particle velocity, shock strength, pressure, and density, and have seen how the if, um, overtaking disturbances affect the shock strength in in comparison to the free propagation cases. I have expressed the uh, equations for the flow variables and. Uh, presented it in tabular as well as in graphical form. So from table, we can see how the shock strength changes uh, when, uh, it, when the overtaking disturbances are included. And in graph also, we can see how the particle velocity, shock strength, shock velocity, pressure, and um, these all changes when the overtaking disturbances are included. So the, and uh, the conclusion is that uh, how the uh, non-idealness parameter and the um, magnetic field affect the strength of the shock as well as the shock velocity, shock behavior, uh, particle velocity, and uh, the density. Here we can, from figure, we can see that the density remains constant because it depends on uh, rho, because rho equals to rho, rho dash r to the power, power minus w, and since r, w, and rho dash all are constant, so we can see that the density remains constant because it doesn't depend on any uh, changing variable. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Seva. So let's end this progress for this session again. So, uh, so I think we are done with the e-posters now. So we'll disperse and we'll meet tomorrow at 9.30. Okay, so I have an announcement to make. So today we are all going for data dinner. I think you are all you all know that. So the bus will be starting at 7 p.m. p.m. in front of the guest house. PM. <laughs> <laughs> it's p.m. So yeah.
Thank you. 